Herkese günaydın. İyi sabahlar. Good morning everyone. And welcome. We have an intense and joyful day. That is why we are here and, and we hope that's going to happen. Our beloved Sabri Ülker Foundation has its second edition of the International Nutrition, uh, Health Literacy and Training Conference. We are going through a challenging uh, pr pandemic period, but then we have all learned that health is important, but then two other things are of paramount uh, importance. That we learn it once again, the value of our routines and our families and life and family, and that refers to our children, it was very difficult for the children uh, what happened to them uh, we we have gone through it and, and then their education and then maintaining their health and nutrition were all huge challenges and we will be uh, discussing all of these uh, elements we have national and international experts and eminent professors with us to whom we will ask questions. But before further ado, I want to give the floor uh, the chairman of Sabrika Foundation, Dr. Talat Ichers. Uh, Talat, uh, good morning. How are you? Thank you. I am very well. You know, I, I just said, you know, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but what do you think? Well, your opening remarks were full of energy. Thank you, sir. Dear head of administration, dear guests, this is the second edition of Sabrukar Foundation's International Nutrition, Health Literacy and uh, Training Conference. The ongoing pandemic has reconfirmed the importance of science, scientific researches and studies and contributing to the future of the public health and giving reliable resources, uh, accurate and updated information to all levels of uh, the society in terms of nutrition and, and health. That is our mission. And as a foundation with sustainable uh, projects, we are enjoying the second edition of our conference. And it's an honor for us to have uh, experts from different corners of the world studying different aspects of this topic. We will discuss uh, the children and, and uh, during the pandemic and the destructive effects of pandemic on children. And we will be listening a number of uh, solution alternatives. Health literacy has become even more important and as part of uh, public health and lifelong learning, we are offering uh, and we have been observing the importance of the nutrition, health literacy and education. And as uh, the foundation, we have a number of projects to help children, uh, raise our children uh, better for the future. And this, this conference is another aspect of our mission. Uh, I, I wish that we have a great conference and I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you, Talat Bey. Let, us, let it be like that, that we, we enjoy today and let us have a, an efficient conference. Let me give the word now to the uh, CEO of uh, Begüm Mutuş, uh, uh, Sabri Ülker Foundation, Begüm Mutuş. Begüm, Begüm, good morning. Uh, good morning, thank you. Talat Bey uh, talked about, you know, uh, information, knowledge, science, accurate information, and children. I know you have a lot of projects. What do you want to say to us? Well, thank you very much, dear attendees and dear uh, head of administration. Welcome all. Sabri Care has been investing in the public health since 2009. As part of our foundation's mission, we are also supporting scientific literature. We are funding uh, researches 
and uh, educational projects. Last year, we had the first edition of the International uh, Nutrition, Health, uh, Literacy and Education Conference. And today is the second edition. We're very happy to have national and international speakers with us. You know, the pandemic has changed a lot of uh, routines, our the, the education, the social life and everything. And school kids were mostly affected and also their parents. The, the parents uh, needed support uh, in guiding their children. Last year, we had the first edition of the Nutrition, Health, Literacy and Education Conference. And we focused on how to learn and how to confirm the scientific, scientific background of any knowledge we get on the internet. The speakers joined our conference. Also underlined how to communicate science and what to include. And also what can we do at home and at school for children. Attendees uh, are very much interested in our conference. And this year we will we will focus more on the on main on the maintenance of well-being of children during pandemic. We have national and international speakers, uh, and we will also have a, a closing panel joined by three um, mothers. Well, before we start with the panelists, I want to talk about uh, science is talking this or science talks. You know, the people are more and more interested in science and nutrition and health, and people learn learn it from radio, newspapers, the internet, and social media. And, and the information given on, on, on these uh, media are very effective on the individuals. And we, we want to make sure that these, these, these pieces of information are correct, clear, and, and transparent. And we have identified that there is a lot of bad information and proliferation, and people are confused. You know... Uh, a community society in Turkey, uh, a community research in Turkey also confirms that 12% says they are they find science data suspicious, and 20% says media remarks are not to be trusted, and about 20% says written media is confusing, and about 40% says health news are not enough. That means. Uh, you know, the health literacy is very important uh, for, for the public health. According to a research, 24.5% of the society uh, do not have enough uh, health literacy and even more uh, have problems. I, I mean, in numbers like 35 million in Turkey, I would say, do not have enough health literacy. So to, to, to prevent bad information and proliferation and, and to develop a better information. We need evidence-based, clean, transparent, easy to access resources. And to address this need, our foundation is committed to deliver uh, correct and trusted information. And we launched uh, Science Talks platform. On our platform, if there, when there is a, there is a, you know, a suspicious, a questionable news piece, we forward it to a committee under Sabri Care Foundation. This committee has, uh, you know, trust trusted people on board, and then they compare the data in the news with the scientific data, and then we publish it uh, on on this website. Our platform analyzes different uh, issues and, and confusing matters also in video format. Also on the, on the Science Talks, uh, uh, articles are released as books. Until now, we published four books and all are freely available on our website. Another project is 
gathering uh, scientists with the, with the media professionals. We have the first uh, international certified uh, health and nutrition uh, communication uh, training after their graduation. Society and food uh, nutrition science uh, give them their internationally accredited certificate. Nutrition, health, correct and scientific information are the basis of Sabri Care Foundation. We are more than happy for having uh, having you with us and thank you so much. Well, we thank you, Begum Hanum, uh, as the CEO and Managing Director of Sabri Care Foundation. Well, you are most right. The, the people need to access health information the correct and up-to-date information and that is most needed let us continue well sabri ukar foundation contributes to the future of, of public health let us now watch a film to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the foundation Toplum sağlığının geleceği için bugünden üretmek, bugünden çalışmak ve farkındalık sağlamak, bilimselliğin önemini anlatmak, sağlıklı yaşam ve beslenme konularında güvenilir bilgilerin topluma ulaşması için çalışmak. Tam 10 yıldır işimiz bu, hedefimiz bu, varoluş nedenimiz bu. Gıda, beslenme ve sağlık alanındaki bilimsel bilgilerin topluma ulaşması için Alanında uzman bilim insanlarından oluşan bağımsız bir bilim kurulunun rehberliğinde başladık çalışmaya. Bundan tam 10 yıl önce. Ulusal ve uluslararası paydaşlarımızla, alanının referans kurumlarıyla işbirliği içinde yeterli, sağlıklı ve dengeli beslenmeyi bir yaşam biçimi olarak görüp, ona ulaşmanın tüm bilimsel yollarını toplumla paylaşmak için 10 yılda onlarca proje gerçekleştirdik. Gelecek sağlıklı nesillerin teminatı, bugünden bilinçlenen çocuklarımız dedik. Yemekte Denge Eğitim Projesi bugün 8. yılında, Türkiye'nin en kapsamlı ve sürdürülebilir dengeli beslenme eğitim projesi olarak fark yarattı. 7 milyona yakın çocuk, ebeveyn ve öğretmene ulaşan projemiz ilkokullarda, Türkiye'nin dört bir yanında çocuklarımıza ulaşıyor. Proje güne her gün fiziksel aktivite ile başlayan, Dengeli beslenmenin temellerini kavramış çocuklar kazandırıyor ülkemize. Genç bilim insanlarımızın, ülkemizin bilimsel ortamının yeşermesine katkı sunabilmesi için desteğe ihtiyacı var. Sabri Ülker Bilim Ödülü her yıl bu misyonla düzenleniyor, seçilen projelerin gelişmesine destek sağlıyor. Türkiye'nin ilk dijital bilimsel bilgi platformunu dünyanın dört bir yanından uzmanlarla kurduk, adına Bilim Bunu Konuşuyor platformu dedik. Platform, popüler sağlık konularında bilimin aslında ne söylediğini yazan tek kanal oldu. Türkiye'nin ilk uluslararası akredite beslenme ve sağlık iletişimi programı ile her biri alanında uzman bilim insanları ve iletişimcileri aynı masanın etrafında buluşturuyor. Her sene hem iletişim profesyonellerine hem de tıp öğrencilerine alanında tek olan bu eğitimi sunuyoruz. Harvard Üniversitesi bünyesinde kurulan Sabri Ülker Merkezi'nin bilim dünyasına sunduğu değerli buluş ve bilgileri dünyanın bilgisine taşıyoruz. İki yılda bir düzenlediğimiz Metabolizma ve Yaşam Sempozyumunu Nobel Bilim Ödülü sahibi konuşmacıların katılımıyla bir yıl Türkiye'de, bir yıl Harvard Üniversitesi'nde düzenliyoruz. Güncel sağlık konularının tartışıldığı, alanında uzman isimlerin katılımıyla gerçekleşen Beslenme ve Sağlıklı Yaşam Zirvesi, Düzenlediğimiz bir başka önemli etkinlik. Popüler bilim, akademik yayınlar ve çocuk kitaplarıyla, Türkiye ve dünyadan referans örnekleri okuyucularla buluşturan Sabri Ülker Vakfı yayınlarını kurduk, 7'den 70'e okura kitaplarımızla ulaşıyoruz. Kurucumuz merhum Sabri Ülker'in hayat felsefesinden beslenen misyonumuz ve dünya genelinde referans kabul edilen saygın kurumlarla işbirliği içerisinde yürüttüğümüz tüm bu çalışmalarımızın hepsi, 10 yıl boyunca önce emekledi, sonra gelişti. Şimdi de hepsi Türkiye'de bir ilk olan alanının tek vakıf çatısı altında meyvelerini veriyor. 
başardıklarımızdan aldığımız ilhamla çalışacağımız her değerli proje, daha sağlıklı bireylerle, daha sağlıklı bir toplum için. Çünkü yarınlar bizim. Sabri Ülker Vakfı 10 yaşında. 10. yıla özel hazırlanan Sabri Ülker Vakfı. That was a video for the 10th anniversary of Sabri Ülker Foundation. Let us continue now. You know, the pandemic was difficult for the children and they were away from the schools. But now that we are re-normalizing, they are back to the school campus. Now we have uh, the head, head of uh, student relations and social uh, activities from the uh, Minister of National Education and uh, Primary Education Department. Uh, welcome, Hassan. Thank you. So from an online remote training, we moved back to the uh, in-campus training. So what are you doing in that regard? And what is the feedback from the students? Well, the participants, I'm happy to be with you on the second edition of the International Nutrition, uh, Health, uh, Literacy and Education Conference. It's a great joy for me. And I want to thank uh, chairman of the foundation, Mr. Talat Ichos, other uh, executives, uh, scientists uh, presenting their papers, and everyone who made this happen. On behalf of our ministry, I salute you with regards. We all know that education is a long-term investment, and it is it secures our future and economic development. The success of our children guarantees uh, our uh, economic growth. And primary education is, of course, one of the pillars of this. Because in the primary education, we equip an individual with the fundamentals that, will, that are needed for the future. And uh, their uh, de development needs uh, are addressed. We also care for scientific differences. And we care for every student, uh, every, uh, uh, every kid in, in Turkey to get the education and solve their problems and practice what they learn in life. And as the Ministry of Education, we also provide our children happy and well-qualified campuses so that they can feel happy and express themselves freely. The participants, the pandemic has had, had characterized the last few years. And we were forced to take certain measures, very uh, different, unprecedented uh, measures. Although COVID-19 began just two years ago, it totally disrupted global education networks. It, it may be the, the biggest uh, disruption we have ever experienced. As Mr. Minister uh, Mahmoud Özdar said, we are doing our best to keep our schools open because schools are not only a place for academic uh, tutoring, but they are also a place for the personal growth uh, of children because they, they learn and assume healthy attitudes and behaviors. They also learn practi practical skills. According to UNICEF Foundation's uh, reports, and UNICEF, according to UNICEF reports, Globally, uh, billions of children could not attend uh, the schools, and and uh, more than 75 percent of uh, the lessons were missed. And and the more they are deprived from uh, learning, the, the more uh, they they I mean the the, le the less they learn. And we care for social, psychological and psychomotor uh, the development of children. And we also develop policies to address these needs. Uh, ministry also cares for increasing the social awareness 
uh, among kids and the youth, we have a, a number of activities, projects and studies growing, developing and building a stronger Turkey can only be done with our children and the young generation. We, we, uh, it's our duty to raise them as individuals committed to our nation. And, and education is the fundamental guarantee of our uh, country's future and will support uh, social growth. Pandemic was also an opportunity for innovation in education. And we have learned that we need to set common goals uh, and a healthy body and a healthy uh, psychology uh, are, are basis. We will work to do things better. I want to thank everyone who, who made this conference happen. And I hope that the results will be uh, beneficial to a greater community. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, Mr. Atalay. Your words were very precious. And as I understand, you know, show happiness to your children. Be an set an example because happiness is in the center of life. Thank you, Mr. Atalay. We will continue with a professor from Vienna University, Dr. Seda Subashi. He will, she will, she will talk about the challenges in maintaining uh, education for special needs. Well, pandemic set uh, challenges for education and it restricted social interaction and we were re and we have uh, doc Dr. Seyda Sobash Zing with us. Um, thank Please you. go ahead. My name is Sheila Bas Singh, and I'm working at the University of Vienna at the Department of Education, Inclusive Education Research Unit. Today, I would like to talk about the intersection of special education and the uh, pandemic. Uh, what does pandemic mean for the inclusiveness, and what does pandemic mean uh, for the people uh, with disabilities, and especially for students with special education needs? Um, the first response actually that we had for COVID-19, uh, it was trying to achieve um, social distancing. So what did we do actually? We tried to achieve social distancing through distance learning, but distance learning, it was proved to be a little bit problematic for several different stakeholders of the education system. And the first issue was the digital literacy. And here I'm not only talking about the digital literacy of the students, but also for several stakeholders in the, included in the education system. Um, 
parents, teachers, or even the policymakers. And digital literacy, it was not only the, uh, the challenge, but we had also lack of resources of time, for example. The, the teachers, they didn't even have enough time to prepare the uh, distance learning materials. Parents, they didn't have enough time to support their children. And uh, we also came to understand that space was a very big issue during uh, pandemic 19. Many children, unfortunately, they didn't have the fitting space, the suitable space in their homes to be a part of the distance learning because the system was unprepared. The teachers and the policymakers and the school directors, um, parents, but also the students, unfortunately, they were not prepared for this um, situation. So we can talk about um, a lack of competence uh, to prepare distance learning and also, of course, technical infrastructure. The challenges, they were not, uh, of course, only uh, for the students. Um, as I said, the teachers, they were really challenged during this process. It was really difficult for them uh, to come up with, um, you know, prompt solutions. And parents, they were not uh, also really ready uh, for this situation. They were also uh, challenged during that time, uh, but also the decision makers. So. There were um, several people included in the decision-making process. They had to come up uh, with different uh, decisions in a very um, short period of time. And it was a very big challenge for them as well. And on the other hand, school authorities, they had to apply. They had to uh, you know, implement these uh, rules and these decisions. But of course, they were also challenged um, during the implementation process. But today, I would like to talk about a little bit uh, especially uh, about the vulnerable students. So um, there is a group of students who are more vulnerable than the other students in the school system. So what does a pandemic mean for them? Um, COVID-19 and vulnerable groups, it's an important topic actually to keep in mind because uh, vulnerable groups, they're not uh, fixed groups. Vulnerable, vulnerable groups of people, they are uh, disproportionately exposed to risk, and uh, but the group who um, who are called as vulnerable, it can change. Uh, so pandemic created some new vulnerable groups, but on the other hand, uh, already vulnerable groups uh, they were also changed during the pandemic. And uh, so we can say that vulnerabilities can be both reinforced and also created in terms of crisis. And if you consider pandemic as a as a crisis situation. We can definitely say that new vulnerable groups merged, but also the groups who were already vulnerable, they got challenged more and more. Uh, inclusive education in the times of crisis was a really important topic for several um, countries as well, uh, because uh, we really uh, need education to continue, especially for these vulnerable groups, especially for students with special education needs or disabilities. Um, inclusive education deals with approaches to education, uh, attending to the rights of vulnerable and marginalized people. So they have to be participating. Um, although they have some uh, disabilities and although they have um, some limitations. But um, inclusive education, on the other hand, um, it is not only uh, encompassing the, um, you know, only disabilities, but also it is uh, including several uh, intersectional vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, poverty, ethnicity, uh, forced migration or only migration background, disability and also gender is a very important category to talk about inclusive education. Let's talk about these groups a little bit, uh, vulnerable groups. The first group are the people with disabilities. Uh, we know that people with disabilities, they're at greater risk during crisis situations. And especially during pandemic, uh, they suffered uh, from several uh, challenges. Uh, the first barrier, for example, uh, it was the implementing the hygiene rules. Um, several uh, people with disabilities, they had uh, to have assistance to be able to implement the hygiene rules or they couldn't manage at all. Uh, they had some difficulties in social distancing because they needed support. They needed uh, emotional support, but maybe also physical support. So they needed or they still need uh, people next to them. Uh, several people with disabilities, we know that they need to uh, touch things to understand uh, what they are. 
especially uh, people with visual impairments or people with uh, emotional disturbance. So it is really important that they touch things. And during pandemic, it was a high risk to touch the things. Uh, there were several barriers uh, in terms of accessing the public health information. Public health information, it was uh, unfortunately not barrier free for several different people. Several uh, different groups of uh, people with disabilities, they couldn't really reach um, information uh, provided by the government in terms of um, public health. Their daily routine was disrupted, uh, unfortunately, and it can be a really a big emotional and psychological burden for some people. And uh, another point was the professional support, uh, unfortunately, by social distancing and uh, making everything um, digital, the professional support and the, the, the, the physical support, it was not there. Uh, it was missing and also accessing some, some specific uh, specific equipment it was also really difficult because most of the specific equipment they disappeared from the market and it was really difficult to have um, access to them um, in the second group we can consider the girls as a vulnerable group uh, with or without disabilities uh, we saw several studies that girls during pandemic they were at greater risk uh, most in most of the country contexts, uh, girls they were forced to um, getting married at an early age, and they were the victims of home violence, and uh, they had to take over the burden of the household, and they had to take over actually the uh, the burden of taking care of their siblings or the family, and uh, we saw that several girls unfortunately they dropped out of the school during pandemic. And uh, the next group would be the refugee children. Refugee children, they were at great risk because they're also a very important vulnerable group in terms of um, educational context. Um, refugee children, unfortunately, they didn't have the access to social safety net. Uh, what does that mean? The school was missing. doesn't matter where the school is. It can be even in the city center. It can be in, the, in a camp, in a refugee camp. Once the schools are gone, a student may not be uh, feeling um, safe anymore because a school is a place where, um, you know, you can have the safety feeling. So the schools were missing. It was really difficult for students uh, who are living in the refugee camps. And um, it's another issue that the, the strategies, the coping strategies to mitigate the poverty in the refugee camps, uh, they were disrupted. So several NGOs, several governments, unfortunately, um, they fell behind and they are still falling behind of providing um, some mitigation strategies in terms of poverty at uh, refugee camps. And refugee camps, unfortunately, they were not the priority of several governments during the pandemic. Uh, so we can say that there is an increased depression uh, among the refugee community and they, they have to live in unsecure households. And uh, on the other hand, because there was no really um, access to public health or any kind of health facility during the pandemic, because the focus was mainly on uh, pandemic or the, or the virus. Uh, so the chronic disease in the family, they didn't get attended to. And uh, of course, it, uh, it increases the um, chronic family stress. And uh, we can also say that there were several broken families, many, uh, many children, many unaccompanied uh, children actually um, flee the refugee camps for a better life or the, for, for some hopes. And uh, we know that several children right now, uh, younger, than, they, younger than 18, they are missing. They are registered as missing in the European continent. And of course, the intersection of these vulnerabilities are, uh, is really important because the intersection is um, making a challenge group more challenged. So um, when uh, students from a low socioeconomic status um, have some disabilities, uh, we can imagine that how challenged their life uh, was during the pandemic. So children from low socioeconomic status families or victims of violence or dysfunctional households, they can all belong to the vulnerable groups. There were several um, actually implementation strategies that to, you know, to mitigate the situation. There were some food programs in the uh, refugee camps and then they were trying to you know, provide a safe environment or protected zone. But unfortunately, as I said before, uh, providing a safe environment for people with disabilities or providing safe environment for vulnerable groups uh, for many countries, 
uh, was not really the priority. And uh, another group, uh, maybe for some countries, it's not really relevant, but, but some other countries uh, definitely is, for example, for Germany, for France, for uh, UK or for Austria. So there is a, a big number of students who do not speak German as a mother tongue and their families, unfortunately, they do not really have the linguistic capacities to follow uh, what's happening in the country in terms of rules and regulations. So, uh, for example, in Austria, 26.8% of all uh, population in Austria, they do not speak German as a mother tongue. And especially if you look at the numbers in Vienna and the capital city, 52.7% um, of students, they do not speak German as a mother tongue. So it is uh, more than the half of the, uh, half of the students in the capital city. Uh, the problem is uh, not actually the students that they do not uh, speak German as a mother tongue because they definitely learn German in the school, but the issue is uh, the access to information and um, their parents because their parents, they fall behind of the linguistic capacities and competences to follow uh, the rules and regulations and the, you know, the news from the school in terms of uh, the cautions. But the problem is... Uh, the language. Unfortunately, Austria at the beginning uh, was providing only information in German. It took almost a year to start providing um, information to parents in some other languages, but, such as um, Turkish, Arabic, um, Bosnian, or Serbian. And let's look at the uh, special education needs. Um, students who are uh, diagnosed with special education needs, um, unfortunately, they had to uh, go over several different challenges than the other students. Um, distance learning, it was a sudden and unforeseen moment um, due to pandemic, and the schools were closed for a long time. So what happened uh, to students with disabilities or what happened to students with special education needs? Uh, the school closures, they created, uh, of course, some negative consequences for this group of people. Uh, the therapy, for example, the physical and cognitive therapy sessions, they were not there. They were missing, unfortunately. The hands-on instruction, uh, students couldn't get access to these uh, facilities or the services. Uh, online learning platforms, they were not really accessible for, a student with, uh, for students with a range of disabilities, different disabilities. Uh, because several students, they didn't actually uh, have the competencies to be able to uh, follow the school from an online learning platform. Professional coaching was not there. Due to social distancing, the professionals who are working in this area, they were not really available. And the leisure activities um, for students, they were also uh, missing. Uh, that's why the chronic stress, it was uh, increased. Uh, definitely. And uh, the chronic stress of the students, but also their parents, uh, it was increased. So uh, it was, we can say that it was an increased family stress experienced by the, by the people uh, who are um, diagnosed with special education needs and their families. The social support was not there. The personal assistance was not there, especially personal assistance. Uh, when, when, person, when a person with disability has a personal assistant, it's really impossible to achieve social distancing and isolation. And uh, of course, there were several uh, different intersecting uh, challenging measures and uh, the students, many students, they were highly absent from learning for a very long time. And um, normally special education offers uh, free, appropriate, progressive and custom-made solutions. And um, unfortunately, during pandemic, during school closures, uh, the individualized education plans, they were disrupted because the implementation was impossible. The monitoring of the development of the students failed because most of the teachers, they were really overhand with some other activities. They didn't have enough time and they didn't have the capacity to prepare uh, specific and individual materials for students. And another point was also uh, the, the overhand parents. Uh, the parents, they were really um, overhand during the pandemic because they had to take over, you know, some different uh, new responsibilities. So as there was, as there was no therapy, uh, physical or emotional or social therapy, so the parents, they had to take over the therapy 
um, service and they had to offer it to their children. On the other hand, uh, some specific tools, they had to uh, get some specific tools for their ch uh, children and they had to create uh, you know, an, an accessible environment for distance learning or for learning at their household. And of course, it brought some extra financial burden to families. So um, space was missing and time was missing. So we can say that the, um, the pandemic didn't introduce new challenges only to students, but also um, to parents. And uh, we can say that the education systems, they were not really taking into consideration the people with disabilities or students with disabilities or uh, who need special education needs. And um, definitely um, we can say that the process was a trial and it was an error process because there were several uh, rules and regulations that were tried, but then they, um, you know, um, they were proven to be not really fitting the situation of students with special education needs. And um, just briefly to talk about Austrian situation, um, what did we have here? Um, the students, they were uh, not really too much absent from the school, but students with disabilities or students with special education needs, yes. Yeah. So they were, they were given an open-ended right for absence from school. Uh, normally, it is not really um, possible, uh, like the days where students can be missing school um, are very limited in Austrian context, but the students with uh, special education needs, they were given this right, they were given this right that they cannot, you know, they don't have to come to school. And um, the rules said that people with disabilities or special needs who were unable to attend classes for reasons related to COVID-19 pandemic can be given permission to stay away from classes. At the beginning, it looked like a um, good solution and facility or as a service, but at the, uh, on the other hand, it, uh, it was understood that actually it was not really um, uh, that good planned, uh, but um, we also understood that the students with disabilities or students with special education needs, they were not the priority of the education system. Uh, to compensate for the missing school days, there was there were um, summer schools offered uh, during some time, but unfortunately, no summer school was offered to students with special education needs. So we can say that students with special education needs or students with disabilities, they were given upon first. And uh, the, the, there was a regulation to the Compulsory School Act. Students, they had to uh, get tested several times, uh, three times in a, in a week and um, they can get tested in the school facility, in the school building, um, and they, ha they have some rapid test kits and they get a ninja pass. So if they are three times negative, they can uh, go on the school. The moment that they are tested positive, they are sent back to home. Uh, but of course, it was not really possible for students with disabilities. And that's why there was another regulation for students with disabilities saying that if the test is not possible at school, uh, because the child or the adolescent uh, with disability reacts defensively, it is acknowledged that the test can be carried out at home. Of course, this solution created some new problems because carrying out a test um, at home, it was not really something parents were trained for. So parents, they had several difficulties in you know, applying the test to their children, especially to children with disabilities. Multiple <laughs> And we can say that the, the forced testing uh, introduced some traumatic uh, effect for students. For example, a teacher uh, told me that uh, the, the forced testing is problematic in several ways. On the one hand, because of the risk of an injury, but on the other hand, uh, with regard to long-term consequences in the socio-emotional development of the child. So uh, we can say that um, Forced testing, it could uh, lead to fear, uh, loss of trust to school, loss of trust to parents also, and also potential trauma is a, is a possible outcome for the forced testing. So forced testing was not really accepted and it was not really agreed upon by the teachers and also by the, by the parents because it was really challenging for uh, people. So the solution was uh, for students with disabilities or for students with special education needs that they don't have to get tested, but they can wear a mask, but all the time. So the rule said, if unable to take a test, other suitable protective measures should be taken in schools um, to reduce the likelihood of an infection. But um, 
this is of course uh, a solution, but on the other hand, a problem because for several students wearing a mask, uh, especially for students who have some hearing impairments, it was really difficult uh, to wear masks all the time. Or uh, students with some emotional burden or um, socio-emotional burden, it was really difficult for them to carry masks all the time. So the rule actually said, okay, then we have another solution for this problem. And then if the students are unable to wear masks, so they can switch back to distance learning. So as you see, the cycle was uh, actually completed. The cycle started with distance learning and then there were several solutions, but each solution created a new problem. And then the, the last solution of the gover government was the distance learning. So unfortunately, it was a, it was a vicious cycle for students with, uh, distance, uh, with disabilities or special education needs. And um, we also saw that the people with disabilities, they're not really represented in decision uh, making process. The political decision making is not really taking uh, people with disabilities into consideration. And we can say that these decisions, they are mainly top down decisions, not really attending to the needs of people with disabilities or to the ideas of people with disabilities. Uh, the same way students with uh, special education needs or their families, they're also not included in the decision making process. So there were several decision, uh, decisions um, you know, made during the pandemic about inclusive schooling, but we came to understand that actually there were not really solutions. Uh, they were creating much, uh, much more problems for the inclusive education system. So um, that's why we can say that the mechanisms that cause social disadvantage and discrimination for people with disabilities, they're not really identified and they're not really processed. So uh, during a crisis, we need to have uh, an inclusive response, but unfortunately the decision-making is not really um, taking this um, concept into consideration and the crisis management is not inclusive uh, for several uh, people. And uh, that's why we have to rethink the vulnerabilities in times of crisis. When we are coming with some solutions, we should definitely think uh, how the solutions, uh, you know, affect different groups of people, especially vulnerable groups. To offer an inclusive uh, crisis management in education, we need uh, to see what are the long-term uh, effects actually on educational support situation of children or adolescents or adults with disabilities. And we should also see that um, how the vulnerabilities are experienced and incorporated by people who are disadvantaged. And uh, definitely we should be asking them, we should give them active voice and we should uh, tell them uh, that they are uh, included in the decision-making process and what uh, decision-making process should take into consideration in terms of uh, planning uh, crisis management. So for an inclusive crisis management, we said that we should definitely uh, ask people who are vulnerable to be included in the decision-making process. So I would like to thank you for the opportunity and uh, for your time. Uh, it was all the time a pleasure to talk to you. ediyoruz. Ee, şimdi pandemi eğitimi, sosyal hayatı, psikoloji nasıl etkiledi? Hakikaten çok çarpıcı. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you have shared uh, some very interesting examples about how the pandemic has influenced different communities. Our conference uh, continues with Associate Professor uh, Gülşah Battal Karaduman. Her presentation will be dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and how it changed the education system in the United States and in Turkey, which will be a comparative presentation. Thank you.
İstanbul Üniversitesi Cerrahpaşa Temel Eğitim Bölümü Sınıf Eğitimi Ana Bilim um, İstanbul uh, University Cerrahpaşa University and Wyoming University Associate Professor Gülşah Battal Karaduman is with us. Welcome to our broadcast. Uh, welcome. How are you? Thank you for joining. So what happened? Uh, I mean, no one around the world was ready for such a process and such a crisis, uh, especially in the field of education that was rather challenging. But education had to continue. So what has it changed in Turkey? And you will compare this uh, process with the United States as well. So what can you say? Us? Well, let me uh, make a short introduction. Well, we wouldn't like to have such a process, uh, of course, the pandemic uh, has affected education both in Turkey and in other countries negatively. And there are many uh, differences around the world. And we have had negative consequences and the uh, education process of students have been affected. And it was not uh, positive in terms of psychological effect, both on students and on teachers and on other stakeholders of our students. So today my presentation will be about these uh, issues. So what things will be uh, changed and what steps can be taken for the future. So we will uh, discuss around suggestions as to what can be done. Yes, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So with your permission, uh, I'm starting with my presentation. As you said, the pandemic has uh, affected Turkey and the United States of America and uh, other uh, parts of the world. And my presentation will be uh, focusing on these areas. Together with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, in December 2019, uh, March, uh, the process has started and uh, it started to influence all the world, as you know. And with this process, uh, the education institutions had to be closed down and all around the world, uh, for about half percent of student population, 1.6 billion of students had to uh, stop their education processes. And unfortunately, in Turkey, the number of students uh, who have been affected by the pandemic was at around 19 million uh, and even up to 25 million students. In the United States, this number was 59 million uh, students. And in high education, uh, the number is even higher when we include high education students as well. So when we think about uh, the emergency remote education and uh, distance uh, education, we have new concepts uh, on our agenda. Let me uh, talk uh, about this. One of them is uh, the uh, emergency remote education and distance education. And these are different uh, from uh, one another. Emergency remote education is a necessity, but distance education is an option. And the emergency remote education, which started during the uh, pandemic, uh, tries to produce some uh, solutions for the interim period, but distance education is a mode of education. So there are differences between the two concepts uh, in terms of emergency uh, and its continuity. 
And the English definitions of these concepts also hint at such a difference and differentiation between the two concepts. So hence, uh, these two concepts are different from one another. And also, with this process, we have blended uh, education and hybrid uh, education or flexible education. We will be learning and uh, hearing about these concepts from now on, the blended learning and hybrid uh, flexible learning more frequently from now on. And together with these concepts, we will continue with our education uh, programs. So what are the uh, responsibilities, the roles and responsibilities? Uh, so from that perspective, of course, people had a lack of experience in terms of technology uh, and the quality of design and content is very important. The ability to manage uh, remote education processes uh, remotely, uh, that is critical. And the uh, support, uh, in what areas should we uh, show support? And again, the pandemic psychology, uh, data uh, security, because we are talking about digital technology, uh, the data uh, security is also very important. We will be talking about the general problems, independent uh, learning uh, skills, and also uh, the digital gap because there are differences between the members of the population in terms of reaching out those digital technologies. So we have observed a number of instances and problems in all these areas. And during the pandemic, one of the uh, most uh, serious questions was that the uh, offering of online education solutions, when education professionals are uh, here about um, learning technologies, they have usually focused on uh, computers and smartphones and different uh, learning uh, management systems. But then we also have some concrete technologies like uh, education uh, institutions and approaches and strategies. We need to focus on these areas as well, which is important. In the United States of America, uh, we have different applications um, and I will be sharing my examples with you. Uh, in Turkey, uh, as part of the National Education uh, Ministry, we have uh, this uh, EBA platform, which is called the Education uh, Platform. And uh, this education and technology platform enabled teachers in Turkey to uh, reach out to their students uh, to deliver homeworks uh, as April 13. Uh, again, on the EBA platform, teachers were able to deliver online courses. This is the course design uh, in remote, uh, in distance learning. And in distance learning, many teachers uh, had to transfer their learning materials onto online platforms. And during the first uh, phase, all I'm talking about all teachers and all learning and teaching professionals uh, around the world, because they have had similar problems. Um, since uh, they had to uh, deliver this very quickly, uh, we had problems all around the world. And one of the uh, most common mistakes is that these uh, courses, which are delivered on a face-to-face -face basis, with, uh, with, uh, and with different uh, applications, they had to be transferred to online platforms. And there were a number of problems in terms of uh, these uh, issues. 
I mean, the uh, focusing of students, communication with students. So there were a number of issues around these issues. And in Turkey and in the United States of uh, America, we, we uh, benefited from these technologies. Uh, if we look at education programs in the United States of America during the pandemic, the uh, education programs were not changed. It was not like uh, an instant uh, decision to change the programs, but uh, teachers uh, had to switch to all distance learning. Uh, therefore, uh, they had to go into adaptation and differentiation processes for these programs. And between March and June 2020, the uh, communication between students and teachers was rather problematic and teachers had to deliver homeworks for students. And between August and December 2020, uh, YouTube videos were used in distance learning and between January and uh, June 2021, uh, students came together with their teachers on an online basis for two times a week. And uh, in 2021, between August and December, again, uh, students and teachers were given the option to deliver their courses and take their courses on online or offline on a face-to-face -face basis as well. So that was a kind of a hybrid uh, model. If students uh, were willing, they, they can uh, carry out their education on an online basis. And again, in some states in the United States, uh, there were new sources for uh, education and teachers uh, for online uh, platforms, they went into a sort of differentiation. And based on the World Bank's Educational Global Practice Report, in 2020, uh, during the pandemic, due to the cancellation of education processes, uh, we might be confronted with uh, learning losses, which uh, in the long run might uh, cause some economic losses uh, as well, because uh, both on a face-to-face -face basis and on an online basis, this was uh, a challenging period and we had to uh, allocate these uh, programs and in order to evade economic problems in the future, this is uh, important for us. And again, in the um, um, the uh, evaluation, the measurement and evaluation is an important part of the education uh, process. Uh, so assessment and evaluation, as you know, is uh, all about the outputs of education. So the assessment and evaluation processes were very important for uh, the educators all around the world. So fail and pass principles during the pandemic have been uh, affected or suspended in some countries, or instead of uh, conventional examinations, uh, students were given uh, other sorts of uh, online tasks and homeworks and examinations. And teachers' uh, tendency to uh, employ conventional assessment and evaluation techniques uh, was also challenged. In the United States of America, students had to send their uh, homeworks on an online basis. Teachers uh, had some difficulties in building the modules for education programs. And uh, when uh, these uh, students uh, were uh, challenged, I mean, talking about the uh, general uh, problems, it was uh, seen uh, that in the United States of uh, America, we have had a number of uh, issues. In, in the United States, of course, uh, I mean, we had uh, options for grades uh, instead of, and also along with a uh, letter uh, grades. 
I'm going to talk to you about the psychological uh, impact uh, on students of all these uh, pandemic processes. But even a student who might get an AA uh, has opted for pass and fail. So in terms of assessment and evaluation, this is something negative because they opted for fail or pass only instead of a weighted letter uh, grade. If you look at the roles and responsibilities of parents during this process, as you know, uh, parents uh, were in a difficult situation and they were challenged. Why? Because before they had never uh, faced such a situation before and students had to uh, go back to their homes and they had to continue their education from home. And parents who had uh, no experience whatsoever about such a process had to learn some new uh, strategies and new modes. Students uh, had to carry out numerous educational activities at home. Therefore, uh, parents had to participate in these learning activities along with their children. What were the challenges and what were the different implementations? Let's have a look at this. In the United States of America, uh, in numerous states, uh, the teachers did not deliver homeworks. Therefore, uh, the systems were not running properly. We were a bit uh, lucky in Turkey because in, in, in Turkey, uh, I mean, uh, Students uh, and teachers uh, were uh, used to these kinds of processes, but in many schools, uh, we do not have such a process. The education is, uh, I mean, because in the United States, uh, uh, teachers are under normal conditions do not have uh, this uh, habit of delivering homeworks to their students. But in Turkey, we have the concept of homework. So. Uh, in the United States, parents found it more difficult to deal with this situation, having their children as students at school, at home and uh, trying to complete their uh, homeworks. And together with the uh, pandemic, people, I mean, students were uh, bored. Students uh, also, uh, I mean, due to their environment uh, at home, it might be negative and uh, not suitable for uh, doing their homeworks. And therefore, students uh, had difficulties in continuing with their courses. And there were a large number of students who were used to studying at library, and they found it rather difficult to uh, do their uh, learning work and activities at home. As you know, uh, in Turkey, uh, we had difficulties in this process uh, as well. Of course, we can talk about the responsibilities of teachers who are expected to tell uh, all these processes uh, and help the parents with these challenges. And Teachers uh, had, were in a situation uh, where, I mean, if we had the teacher at the center of the classroom, that was more difficult for teachers. And in the United States of America, uh, education technologies were learned swiftly by teachers and they have started to implement and employ these technologies. And if we go back in time from August 2021, all teachers, uh, both in Turkey and all around the world, had to uh, wear masks and they were concerned for their own health as well. So, and since the pandemic was still ongoing, uh, this process was rather stressful for teachers as well, and it still continues. And again, uh, in line with these uh, stress, 
This process needed to be managed properly because unfortunately when we uh, compare this with Turkey, our academicians uh, in Turkey, I mean all of them, uh, are careful about this. Because in this uh, system, in the United States of uh, America, before the uh, students start with their class, they know about their curriculum, uh, like uh, what courses will be delivered on what day uh, throughout the week. So they have the whole uh, program on hand. But in Turkey, unfortunately, even during the examination uh, weeks, some students don't know when their exams will be held. So there is this difference in terms of us <coughs> having programs. And this is a negative effect in terms of attendance. Again, uh, in education technologies, our teachers were uh, trained by the Ministry of Education and that enabled a swift transition to the EBA platform. Gülcan, may I ask you a question? As part of all you are talking about, what I wonder is, in the United States, I mean, you are uh, there and you were able to observe things uh, on the point. What, what was the main factor which made them successful? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, the education system is very well programmed. I, I can tell you this as the main uh, reason. And everyone uh, complies with the program. So you mean uh, they are disciplined? Yes, the methodologies are very well defined. But uh, unfortunately, uh, in many countries, including our uh, country Turkey, uh, we might have some problems in complying with these programs and predefined strategies. But in the United States, uh, professionals within the education system and all the stakeholders comply with these programs. And I was going to talk uh, about this in a minute uh, after digital uh, adequacy and uh, equality of opportunities. As distance learning became uh, the norm during the pandemic, as at least uh, in the state I am in now, I can tell you that students were uh, provided with uh, computers immediately. As you know, one of the uh, most important uh, challenges we had in Turkey was that some students could not reach uh, computers and tablets. So access to internet, uh, unfortunately, in Turkey, we have had a number of issues and challenges uh, since in the United States, there is no uh, infrastructure problem, uh, access to internet and access to teachers were uh, easy uh, on a comparative basis. Therefore, they were a bit uh, swift. So planning equality of opportunities, access to internet and access to computers. What parts, about what things would you criticize uh, in this state? Well, if not criticism, in terms of employment uh, and in terms of negativities and challenges, we have similarities with other countries as well. Uh, not everything was perfect in the United States, in education faculties or in processes of uh, teacher training. Uh, they were not delivered. It, it, it turned out that they were they had not received sufficient uh, number of courses on education technologies. Since this has turned into a pandemic, uh, a global pandemic, when they were uh, they when they passed to such a process, there were a number of uh, issues. But in the crisis management, teachers are successful there. This was what you said. Yes, as I've said, uh, I mean, since uh, em employments are student-centered. Uh, I mean, students uh, from that perspective in their uh, respective processes, since they're uh, 
they have been educated and trained uh, for such similar situations. In a case of crisis, they can swiftly uh, focus on the necessities and they can manage the process. Because uh, when we talk about uh, the necessity of waiting uh, some order from an external party, they don't do that. They don't wait for somebody else to tell them what to do. They have the system and they can put it into implementation immediately when need be. And we are talking about a state system. It's more flexible, uh, more comfortable. Uh, students and institutions have uh, communication, which is um, more practical. And from that perspective, this uh, could be uh, something easy. And it's our teachers who poop impl employ all the uh, all these uh, into implementation. Perhaps um, things were easier there because every state is responsible for uh, their own population. Yes, perhaps uh, they have an autonomous uh, structure. And compared with their um, culture, uh, compared, I mean, based on their uh, own economy, they can, uh, it's easier for them to give shape to their education systems. Thank you. I was, I asked what, what I was curious about, and you can just uh, complement what uh, you have in mind. Yes, let me wrap up quickly so that I won't take the time of other speakers. In terms of digital competences, uh, we have also seen that many professionals lacked these uh, digital uh, capabilities and competences. And of course, what's most important for us is that uh, technology uh, literacy is very important. And not only from the perspective of students, but for all citizens, uh, they needed to have uh, technology literacy. Let's uh, look at the digital uh, segregation. What we call digital segregation is all about the uh, access to those digital technologies with emergency distance learning technologies. I mean, we had these technologies in our society already. Uh, in, before the pandemic, unfortunately, we still had such digital segregations and digital differences between countries and between individuals. The pandemic has only made it more visible. And uh, due to different implementations in the United States, we have uh, differences. So uh, every student uh, is given a computer once the pandemic necessitated a remote learning Unfortunately, such a step could not be taken in Turkey. So in Turkey, uh, the support uh, was through platforms like uh, EBA, and we felt the impact of digital segregation at institutions as well. And as you know, this is a reality in Turkey. There is also a difference between private schools and state schools, which create uh, an inequality between students. And it's important to uh, eradicate this inequality. Only 63% uh, uh, of students in Turkey have an internet connection and 63% of students have uh, computers, and 23% uh, of students in Turkey, uh, they expressed that they could not continue with their distant learning uh, processes, which is a serious percentage. And that shows us uh, digital segregation in Turkey is a huge uh, step, is a huge challenge, and that needs to be resolved uh, immediately. We can also talk about the uh, tendencies of uh, students uh, all around the world. Uh, students were affected by this process of, and 80% of students in the United States, which is a huge uh, percentage, 
um, they were affected uh, negatively in terms of their health and uh, in high education institutions uh, the uh, educators and personnel I mean they uh, focused on equal uh, education opportunities and it is said that these uh, studies will uh, continue uh, in the future. I mean, we are talking uh, about uh, students within the uh, primary education system. I did not focus on special education students or formal training and devam eden öğrenciler için de bu pandemi sürecinin çok iyi yönetilmesi lazım ve bundan sonraki sürecin de aynı şekilde çünkü bu özel eğitim öğrencilerinin yine aynı şekilde burada da Amerika'da da pek çok noktalarda geri kaldığını görmekteyiz. Bu öğrencilerimize de yine aynı şekilde eğitim fırsatlarının eşit düzeyde sağlanması çok çok ön plana çıkıyor. Bununla birlikte neler yapılabilir bu süreçle, şu anki yaşadığımız süreç devam eden süreçte ve bundan sonraki süreçte neler yapılabilir eğitimle ilgili diye baktığımızda eğitimin sunumunda ve içeriklerinde kalite güvencesi sağlanmalıdır. Gerçekten eğer bir program farklılaştırılıyorsa, bir eğitim eğitim içeriği düzenleniyorsa bu bütün dediğim gibi öğrencileri kapsayacak şekilde yap, yapılmalıdır. Eğitim politikaları hiçbir öğrenenini gerek, geride bırakmayacak şekilde kapsayıcı, fırsat eşitliği ve sosyal adaleti sağlayıcı şekilde yapılmalıdır. Teknoloji altyapısına ve eğitim teknolojilerine anlamlı bir şekilde ve ihtiyaca göre yaratılım yapılmalıdır. Çünkü e, biliyorsunuz ki normal ilk öğretim öğrencilerinin e, yüksek öğretim öğrencilerinden çok daha farklı ihtiyaçları var. Yine aynı şekilde yüksek öğretim öğrencilerinde ilk öğretim öğrenci ve orta öğretim öğrencilerinden. Dolayısıyla her, iki, her yaş grubuna, her eğitimdeki e, öğrenciye göre bu e, teknolojiler de farklı uygulamalarla, farklı e, yöntemlerle, farklı stratejilerle şekillendirilmelidir. Eş zamanlı ders katılımlarından ziyade eş sat- e, zamansız katılım destekleyecek etkinlikler de tasarlanmalıdır. Çünkü eğitim kurumlarında öğrenme tasarımı, dijital iç- içerik üretim ve denetim birimleri kurulmalıdır. Bu, bu kurumlar biraz önce de bahsettiğim gibi Türkiye'de e, çok güzel aslında bu, kur- e, bu e, yönetimi işleten kurumlar var. Özel okullarımız zaten e, ke- her özel okulun kendi teknoloji... Have, we need to have content. We need to disseminate this in state schools as well. We need to have uh, new uh, plannings. Digital literacy is also important. Uh, all citizens uh, need to be educated in these areas. As you know, uh, this is something uh, new, a set of new norms. We are transitioning into a new world order. And we have to adapt to this, uh, and we had to adapt into this very quickly in order to catch up with other developed countries. All citizens should uh, improve themselves in these digital uh, competences. Perhaps we need to have uh, trainings uh, around these areas as well. Because uh, we've talked about uh, learning output and uh, We need to have education designs. And we have also talked about this uh, very quickly. The the parents uh, have different uh, roles. But then there are certain ways, you know, the the jobs and the other challenges and and a lot of uh, parents uh, had challenges well, maybe we can build some uh, therapy uh, groups for parents because we all need that we all need that i mean i am i am a mother and uh, an education professional And, uh, you know, I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, 
you know, in, in America, uh, they are handling this very nicely. The system performs properly. And I, and I say, we need to do this in our country as well. And this is a summary of my recommendations. I know that our time is, I hope I did not exceed my time, but if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. So this was my summary, comparing United States of America and Turkey, what happened? Well, thank you very much, Gülşe. It was uh, very enjoyable and very informative. Also personally, I must say that, and then you said the educational policies and when identifying such policies, I believe everything we have experienced, the anti-process, this experience will guide us through the future. What, what, what went wrong and how can we reshape the future? And to that end, your presentation was very helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Gülşah Battal Karaduman. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. We will continue with Hacettepe University uh, Pharmaceutical uh, Faculty, uh, Professor Didem uh, Şöretoğlu will join us and she will talk about how to increase the how to boost the immune system of uh, children by uh, using natural products let us give a quick break Uh, now we have Professor uh, Didem Şöretoğlu from Hacettepe University. And she will talk about using natural products to boost immune system of children during and after COVID-19 pandemic. Didem, welcome. Hello. 
Well, two years ago, when this pandemic happened, we were so scared and we were anxious and we didn't know what to do with there was no vaccine and no, no no medicine and people were dying and we were worried so i said i need to you know have good diet and boost my immune system including myself i started eating and drinking things i've never had it and now it has become a habit and i continue I care for eating for the most naturally sourced products. Do you think this has become a routine? I mean, do you think a, a correct diet uh, or healthy nutrition has become a habit for, for the wider society? Well, I think to the best extent possible, the impact uh, remains and people's uh, diet have changed. However, you know, people don't use those supplements for long. But pandemic has changed our lives, uh, the, our diet and our habits. Like, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, boil, boiled bone uh, marrow. I mean, I, I, I don't like drinking it, but uh, but I, I, I'm, I, I force myself to drink it. So how about children? Uh, I mean, you have the experience for the natural source products and we are all ears. Coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, started in China at the end of 2019. And globally, it caused over 5 million deaths. Like other viral diseases, the response uh, of the immune system of the host is uh, key for protection against COVID-19. Natural uh, products may improve the antiviral immunity of the, of the host body, uh, prevent COVID-19 infection, or help a more mild disease. I mean, it is essential to have a functional immune response to, to, vi to, to viral infections. And uh, uh, any uncontrolled responses are related to immunopathogenesis and extreme inflammatory response. And this, this may cause severe pulmonary diseases or other uh, impairments. COVID-19 uh, for comorbid patients uh, has uh, deadly T lymphocytes. I mean, they, they, they, have, they have low T lymphocyte levels and uh, antibody into introducing cells, uh, they, they, they act activate the congenital and, and acquired uh, immune uh, system. Uh, the, the cytokines make mediators and they introduce viral antibodies you know, Im, Im, Im, Im, immune activation can can can be extreme which cause a cytokine storm so a a weak a weak res, immune response may may cause a severe disease but then an extreme response may cause a cytokine storm so immune system is like a double edged knife if your immune system is too bad, it's not good for you. But if you have a very active immune system, that's not good at all. But before discussing natural products, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define a number of concepts. We are in phar pharmaco phar pharmacognosis department, and we study natural resources. We call them a drug, you know, identifying protection, content, uh, eff effects, and use. This is our uh, department's role. And, and the first historic records of nat natural uh, products and uh, medications were based on the uh, Medica booklets of Theocritus. 
So what are these resources? Plants, animals, uh, seafood, microorganisms, and today, biotechnological products. These are our resources. You know, morphine uh, and quinine used uh, to treat malaria for years and col col col colchicin obtained obtain from other flowers and atropine and galantamin used for uh, Alzheimer's. So a lot of uh, molecules are natural resource, natural resource like taxol used for uh, cancer or Vincrestin and Vinblastin are isolated from plants or they have been obtained uh, using chemical uh, reactions. And perhaps the most known molecule is aspirin. And, and aspirin, you know, the the Felix Alba uh, was known for uh, reducing fever, and then uh, an aspirin was obtained based on its content. How about a herbal drug, a herbal medicine? The World Health Organization defines as, as follows. Products uh, f uh, to, to prevent uh, from a, a, a disease or, or treat a disease containing drugs or their mixtures, uh, they are labeled as medical products. So it's not only for treatment, it is also for preventive. So we are talking about preventive medicine. In Turkey, European medicine agents, agencies rules are followed. And European Medicine, medicine Agency has a committee on herbal, her, herbal medicinal products. And it has guidelines on use cases and safety protocols. And then we have ESCOP. ESCOP uh, is an umbrella organization representing national herbal medicine societies. They, it has a scientific committee uh, which looks for scientific uh, data and publishes reviews on the therapeutic use of uh, herbal medicine. The, the purpose is to improve the scientific status of herbal, med herbal medications and also align uh, the regulations, individual regulations across the European continent. You know, uh, plants or herbal, her, her, herbal medications are used for uh, food or uh, herbal medicine. We call them phytopharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals like a supplement or like a uh, medical tea. I want to draw your attention to a point like a mint tea. We, we, we don't call a mint tea, tea a herbal medicine, for example. Herbal products can be extracted, dis distilled, fractioned, purified, uh, intensified, or fermented. And then they, they are molded into a certain pharmaceutical form, like a capsule, a tablet, and they are dosed, they are packaged, they have a well-defined indication. And they have uh, standardized uh, extracts. Nutraceuticals uh, may not be in, and they, they are also in a certain pharmaceutical form. They are, they are packaged, but they are more preventive purposes. And they contain certain preventive ingredients or at a higher dose than a regular diet. And the FFT, FFT does what ESCOC does in Europe, in Turkey. And they define uh, herbal medicine monographs uh, dedicated to Turkey. In 2017, they published their third edition, which contains monographs for 123 medical herbs. I mean, but these are very medical content targeting health professionals. 
So what sort, what what what type of her, her herbal medicine can be used for children? Well, I have to say that to avoid any uh, any confusion, the EMA in their monographs says that we don't have enough data for children below the age of 12. So there is no dosage. Even for garlic, there is no children dose for garlic. It doesn't exist. And, and that's only a precaution. But Ministry of Health and other national authorities have uh, approved uh, pediatric herbal medicine and they are commercially available. The first plan I want to talk about is Sambucus nigra. It is like, it's a type of a berry, a black elder. And it, it has, it is grown in Africa, uh, Europe and different parts. And also in Turkey, in the Northwest, uh, we have it naturally. Traditionally, it is used for uh, cold and the European Medical Agency says it has diaphoretic effect, like it give, gives you perspiration. It is Im, Im, immunostimulant, diaphoretic and antiviral. For children above 12, three to five grams of dried uh, flowers can be enjoyed like a tea or but EMA does not define any, uh, says there is not enough data for children below the age of 12. But you know, the, the black elder, you know, is also used as a molasses, you know, in Turkey, we use it as, as molasses and we can still improve our immune system. Another plant is echinacea or cone flower. It doesn't grow in Turkey. In Turkey, we call it echinacea too. It's not, uh, a, it's not, it's not a natural uh, flower in Turkey. Its uh, roots are used also its stem. And the, in the US, it is naturally grown in Turkey and in Europe, it is cultivated. Traditionally, it is used for cold and it has immunostimulant effect. And it is also used for uh, respiratory system diseases as a preventive medicine. And uh, it helps for other respiratory system related conditions. It is uh, an immunomodulator and it is also an antiviral. This product has a lot of uh, producers in, in the in the pharmacies. You can find in any pharmacy in, uh, for uh, 12 plus 100 milligram extracts can be used in standardized forms. Preventive, and it says you, you can, it is recommended to use for a maximum 10 days for preventive measures. You can give a break and then start using it again. But then ESCOP, this phytotherapy organization says for Younger kids uh, judge by their age and their body weight, and you can uh, adjust your the, the dosage. And there is a number of pediatric uh, support. Uh, and that there's a little, there's, there's a number of nutritional supplements for for the for for the children. The other one is Pelargonium uh, cydoides, geranium. In Turkey, we call it the African sardine. It is uh, dried roots are used. It is naturally grown in South Africa. It's not grown in Turkey. It is used for the symptomatic treatment of, of cold. It is an immunomodulator and also an antiviral for a number of respiratory uh, disease pathogen. It's, it's an efficacious uh, plant. Dosage for 12 plus 20 milligram ex extract for three days, three times a week. And if, if for 12 to 6, 20 milligrams uh, two days a week. The EMA says there's not enough scientific data for children below six. 
but this herbal medicine has pediatric forms and there are different doses uh, defined for different age groups by ESCOP. Another plant is we frequently use in Turkish cuisine allium sativum garlic you know garlic is a common food for Turks it's naturally grown in, in Central Asia and in Iran and it is cultivated in a lot of parts of the world well garlic has a lot of different traditional uses but it is it also helps in uh, curing the symptoms of uh, common cold it has it is an immunomodulator and an antiviral for influenza and it has um, anti-inflammatory effects which is good for suppressing any infection for 12 plus Daily uh, two to four gram extract uh, dose is recommended. And EMA says there is not enough data for kids younger than 12. But this is a dried extract. So it, two to four is for dried. So if it's a fresh garlic, like if you're consuming, I mean, you, you can eat garlic uh, in your food and that helps in improving immune system of yourself and your children. The next plant is Cornus moss, the Cornelian cherry in English. Fruits are so common in, in Turkey, commonly uh, used Eastern Europe, Iran, Turkey, and Syria naturally grow, but in, in a lot of parts of the world, it is cultivated. Additionally, it helps preventing common cold and improving its symptoms. Fruits are immunomodulators and also have anti-inflammatory effects. I must highlight that this plant has contains high levels of vitamin C. Fresh fruits or its juice or jams can, are consumed widely. And in the winter, we, you know, we use it as a puree and just, you know, uh, uh, improve our uh, immune system and help protecting preventing uh, infections and this one is very also very common in turkey the rose hip rosa canina this plant uh, naturally is natu naturally grows in europe uh, and other mild climate areas it helps uh, healing from uh, common cold also preventing and the improves symptoms it is uh, immunomodulator and has anti-inflammatory effects. It has it contains high level low levels of vitamin C, and that's why it is very helpful. You can drink it as a tea, or as juice, or like a jam. And in northeast uh, Black Sea region of Turkey, it is commonly consumed. In our childhood. Marmalades are mixed uh, with, you know, it, it, we were mixing it with, uh, you know, cold water in summer and hot water uh, in the winter, and we would just enjoy it uh, uh, with food and at breakfast. I guess that was to, to, to prevent in, infection. So improving your immune system, you know, everyone says vitamin C. And vitamin C is fundamental on the immune system and potentially it can protect you against the infections. It is an antioxidant, has anti-inflammatory features, supports immune uh, cells and their functions and increase their infection protective capacities like grapes, kiwi, uh, 
oranges, apples, potatoes, and peppers, green peppers, and parsley, they all contain high levels of vitamin C. And they are, and these are the dosages recommended for different age groups. Vitamin D was probably the most commonly discussed uh, support as a vitamin during COVID-19 pandemic. Vitamin D does not only support your immune system, but also uh, attaches to a number of proteins interacted by COVID-19 and which suppresses the effects, the infectious effects of COVID-19 virus. And vitamin D level and clinical results are significantly correlated. If your vitamin D level uh, is low, you are more likely to get COVID-19 infection. It, it's been proven. And COVID-19 virus encourages the release of inflammatory cytokines, and that may be deadly for some people and because of the respiratory system symptoms. So D, vitamin D partly restricts the release of, uh, of the cytokines. So fatty uh, fish and eggs, uh, they are rich in vitamin D and randomized clinical studies and meta-analyses have proven that vitamin D has protective against effects against uh, respiratory system diseases and it also suppresses the acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS. On the top right you see vitamin D levels recommended for different age groups. So uh, until one year one years of age it is 400 units and then it is 600 year, units onwards. Zinc Zinc plays a role uh, and it, in, in a lot of biological uh, events it, and then it has, it is important for anti-inflammatory and antiviral response. For COVID-19, there are studies if uh, it's protective and uh, th therapeutic effects. Uh, zinc, is widely used in a lot of uh, supplements. Uh, I want to underline something about vitamins. Vitamins and minerals. Uh, it is important to adjust the dosage uh, according to the child's age. Do not overdose. Do not overdose. And then Probiotics and prebiotics uh, all are always essential to boost immune system. Pro probiotics are produced in the intestine. Uh, they are uh, de they depend on the host. They are alive, and they are uh, and they have anti-inflammatory effects and they reduce acute upper respiratory system infections. But the data on COVID-19 is not enough, not yet. So instead of a medical supplement, you may want to consume uh, the food contain probiotics and prebiotics like pickled food and yogurt will help. And the, the prebiotics are mostly in, in the large intestines and they are helpful for, for, the, for the host. They are not consumed. They, they, are, they are parts of your diet, like the fiber. And for example, ban bananas contain un digested fibers which are prebiotics and they will stay in your in your large intestine and then uh, the, the beta glucans they, they have polysaccharide uh, 
structure they are con they are contained in in mushrooms and other plants and cereals but through different mechanisms they activate natural or or acquired immunity uh, they have they are immunomodulators they are also antibacterial antivirals and anti-inflammatories and beta glucan is also a prebiotic They are helpful for certain upper respiratory tract diseases, including tuberculosis, and it has been clinically proven. However, we don't have enough data on children when it comes to COVID-19, because all the studies are about, about, about the adults. But then in, in the market, there's a lot of uh, uh, products con containing uh, containing beta glucan and a lot of cereals already contain beta glucan. The next one is propolis. It's it's something that the honeybees prepare. They contain it from from the plants and through their secretions and their enzymes, they produce. And this propolis is something the bees produce to product their hives. Polis uh, means the city and pro means before the city. So the honeybees produce that to pro protect their hives. And we know that they are, their effects include uh, an anti they are, they are antimicrobials and anti, they also have anti-inflammatory effects. They are immunomodulators, antivirals as well. Other than that, its content prevents the replication of virus because they interact with associated proteins. It is preventive against respiratory tract uh, infections for kids. But all clinical studies related to COVID-19 were conducted on adults. After giving these examples, uh, I want to continue on a number of other things. You know, plant, herbal, herbal medicine, herbal tea, we must be be careful on a number of things. Number one, we may experience some problems. And the first one is related to the herbal medicine itself, like overdose, interaction with other medicine, or you may have allergic reactions. And then there are external factors that may cause problems, uh, like uh, mistakes during preparation and production using the wrong plant lack of st standardization, contamination, mixtures, and other errors may happen. In conclusion, allergic reactions and gastrointestinal problems are, are most common uh, when children use uh, herbal medicine or herbal products. So that requires uh, close attention and very sensitive uh, monitoring. Uh, so food or food supplements or medical supplements are authorized and permitted by the Turkish uh, agricultural and forestry products. I mean, they are permitted by the ministry, but they may not have all the required analysis, medical analysis. So you have to be careful. But then there are uh, herbal products approved by the Ministry of Health, which are more controlled. But then the dosage, the content, harmful contamination uh, are among common problems especially the products sold on the internet or Chinese origin products do not contain uh, the claimed uh, herbs or maybe they contain less or they contain others which are not defined on their labels. It's because 
we don't have enough inspection and auditing. So do not shop online. Better not to shop online these products. It is very important to understand that our diet is of utmost importance. For every herbal supplement, consult your doctor. Go and buy from the pharmacy and never shop online uh, the food supplements because of the reasons I just highlighted. Perhaps our principles should follow what the Hippocrates said. I mean, everyone says, he said this, let food be your medicine and let medicine be your food. And following this guidance will help improving our immune system during and after the pandemic. That's all I want to say today. Well, thank you very much, Professor Didam Shuretolo. I made a list and I, and I made my mental notes, all those helpful herbs. When I go home, I will check which, which, which ones I have at home but if not, I'm planning to buy them. Thank you very much. All right, now we are moving to the New Zealand. And we will learn the effects of COVID-19 crisis and its effect on, on, on children. We have Jackie Soti, the director from Save the Children. Uh, he will join with a pre-recorded presentation. New Zealand. My name is Jackie Southey and I am the Child Rights Advocacy and Research Director for Save the Children New Zealand. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and share my presentation, Not Seen and Not Heard, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the health and well-being. New Zealand. My name is Jackie Southey and I am the Child Rights Advocacy and Research Director for Save the Children New Zealand. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and share my presentation, Not Seen and Not Heard, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the health and well-being of children in New Zealand. The COVID-19 pan pandemic has reached and impacted every corner of our world. In January 2020, remote Pacific Island nations such as Kiribati have recorded their first cases. However, COVID-19 has not just impacted us through illness alone. Even countries with relatively low infection rates and few deaths, such as New Zealand, have felt the significant impacts of the pandemic via the COVID-19 crisis more so than the virus. The global fallout has impacted New Zealand at, 
of the virus has impacted New Zealand and has resulted in border closures, isolating New Zealand from the rest of the world. Some children continue to be separated from their parents for more than two years and lockdowns that have seen people confined to their homes for months at a time. There has been a reduction in or changes to access to services such as health, education and welfare support. The serious social implications that are harder at this stage to fully quantify, given we are still experiencing the pandemic, remain to be fully revealed. And like many other countries, for two years, we have lived in a disrupted and stressed society due to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. Unite against COVID-19. The New Zealand government was quick to respond to the onset of the pandemic and introduced a number of policies and restrictions. In response to the pandemic, the New Zealand government continues to implement policies to either limit the spread of COVID-19 or to reduce the impact of COVID-19 restrictions. New Zealanders have been asked to unite in the fight against COVID-19, making sacrifices, accepting limits on freedoms, complying with new rules such as lockdown levels, and now the traffic light system. The government has committed budgeting and resource allocation in the fight against COVID. In responding to COVID-19, many resources have been allocated to initiatives that benefit families and households. For example, funding for accommodation supports and food security, mainly in the form of food banks. Spending allocations for children have largely been attributed to education and some welfare prov specific provisions. In contrast, spending has been predominantly allocated to businesses and COVID-19 related public health policies, such as free COVID-19 vaccines for New Zealanders five years and older. So what has life been like during COVID-19 in New Zealand? We have had lockdowns from level four through to level one, with level four being the most serious of these. In level four, everyone is required to stay home. They are required to form a bubble with those in their household. They're not allowed to mix those bubbles with others. New Zealanders were allowed to leave their homes to, for essentials, shopping for food or for medications or for exercise outside within a five kilometre radius. Retail was closed except for supermarkets, pharmacies, petrol stations and corner stores. And essential services allowed to continue, for example, farming or transport of goods. All schools, early childhood centres and universities were closed. Primary and secondary schools and university moved their learning online. All playgrounds were closed. Children were not able to access them. It became difficult to access health or dental appointments and there were limits to social services. Children even were even more restricted as they were not allowed to enter shops with their parents. Auckland, New Zealand's most populous city, home to 1.7 million New Zealanders, has borne the brunt of the lockdowns, experiencing more frequent and longer lockdowns than any other city in New Zealand. And enduring a hard border closure where movement in and out of Auckland was severely restricted for more than 120 days. The language of COVID-19 and the way the virus works has not been advantageous to children, pitting them against adult needs, labeling them as not at risk and serving to render them invisible. The elderly are at significant risk, but COVID-19 is not dangerous for children. Children are less likely to be impacted by the virus, but, but they can spread it to their families or adults. Keeping children at home will stop the spread in the community and protect vulnerable adults. Key messages such as these have created a sense that children are fine and not affected by the COVID-19 illness or the crisis. Too cute. Children are, are often put in the cute basket rather than being addressed as equal citizens or any real effort to make information available specifically for children. Early on, the Prime Minister hit the world headlines due to her assurance that the Easter Bunny would still be able to visit New Zealand children. 
very cute and not negative, but doing little to address the serious issues children are facing. Our children are impacted by the virus and the crisis. In the recent COVID-19 Delta outbreak, about one third of the people affected in New Zealand have been children and young people under the age of 20. Children have played an important role in the fight against COVID-19. During lockdowns, children and young people did not go to school, play sport or attend cultural activities. They avoided playgrounds and missed visiting their friends and extended family in order to comply with government orders to stay home and save lives. While infection rates remain relatively low, there continue to be varied and ongoing impacts for children and young people. Children and young people represent a critical 20% of New Zealand's team of 5 million, yet we don't typically include them in our policy briefings or media messages. We as researchers invested in child health know that when children are marginalised, adults can overlook or misunderstand their needs. This is a quote by Drs Jim Russell and Julie Spray. seeing and hearing from children. Dr. Julie Spray, a child health researcher, has found that in New Zealand, children have been really include, rarely included in messaging about COVID-19. And a limited focus on COVID-19 related research. Dr. Spray undertook research with a group of children in a bid to understand children's experiences of the pandemic and found children were concerned about when the pandemic would end, being isolated from their friends, Vaccinations, would they hurt children? Are they safe for children? And when they would get their vaccine? Understanding what the alert levels mean and how we would get out of them and worried about getting sick themselves or making their family sick. A study involving, involving 1,400 children aged eight to 18 years by the Office of the Children's Commissioner looked into the experiences of children in the 2020 level three and four lockdowns. The study identified five key insights. One, COVID-19 lockdown had a range of different impacts on children and young people, both positives and negatives. Relationships are critical. The impacts of lockdown on relationships with friends and family, both positive and negative were significant. Children and young people enjoyed having control over their time having more free time and having opportunities for new activities. The changing nature of education during lockdown was unsettling for some and seen as an opportunity for independence by others. Improvements in wellbeing varied across children and young people. The Growing Up in New Zealand study, a study looking into how children were coping with COVID-19 lockdowns provided similar insights to previous studies 2,510 to 11 year old children participated in the study led by the University of Auckland. Key findings from the wellbeing report include, nearly 80% of children reported having a good time with their family in lockdown. Children living in a larger bubble, six or more people during alert level four were more likely to experience better health and wellbeing. Around 40% of children displayed symptoms of depression and anxiety. These children were most likely to be girls, those worried about their family's financial situation, those who had fewer positive experiences in alert level four, those with existing wellbeing and developmental concerns. Māori and Pacific children recorded lower depression and anxiety scores, which researchers attributed to greater family connection. Children classified as obese at eight were more likely to record poor physical and mental well-being during the COVID-19. This study is a, subset, is a subset of the longitudinal Growing Up in New Zealand study. Our children are superheroes. To give greater visibility to the contribution children continue to make to the fight against COVID-19, Save the Children New Zealand launched a public campaign called Super Millie. 
Super Millie is a superhero child, helping children and adults to get through the lockdowns and keep safe from COVID-19. Our message was that all children were superheroes. The campaign included videos, a learning resource, social media posts, and media coverage. On a serious note, we've advocated to the Prime Minister and key ministers to give children greater visibility in the crisis and the crisis response. I'm now going to show you the short video of Super Millie. Hi, I'm Super Millie. Remember me? And today I'm going to show you five ways to keep safe and entertain yourself during lockdown. Number one. Eat well. I've created my own recipe for super Odie cookies. They taste delicious. It's delicious. Number two, be smart. I've been working on my own trap to capture the coronavirus once and for all. Got it. Well, I think I got it. Number three, keep learning. This is a great time to read up on all your favorite subjects. Dad, can we get a dog? Number four, use your imagination. Make a blanket fort and imagine that it's a portal to another world. And number five, most important of all, stay in your bubble. Whoa, whoa. It was important to give some perspective to how children were experiencing the pandemic in the public arena, helping people to understand the positive ways that children were contributing, but also in the more serious issues that children are facing in our advocacy direct to government. Getting it right, children's rights in the COVID-19 response. As a member of the Children's Convention Monitoring Group, Save the Children contributed to this report, Getting It Right, Children's Rights in the COVID-19 Response. This report was an analysis of the New Zealand government's response to COVID-19 and how children's rights were recognised and upheld during the response. This report found that the government worked swiftly to respond to the crisis and created policies to house the homeless, strengthen financial safety nets and harness technology for online learning and more efficient service provision. However, with the exception of education, few government departments could provide clear examples of how they considered the rights of children. Early on in the pandemic, the Ministry of Education supported schools to move to learning online. The education of children has been significantly affected during this time. Learning supports included moving to an online system, printed education packs for students without devices, devices for some students that were without access to online learning, and two dedicated television, television channels, one in English and one in Te Reo Māori, New Zealand's Indigenous language. COVID-19 continues to impact children's education with it, and there has been an increase in homeschooling applications. It has been a record rise by parents to apply to homeschool their children. As you can see in the graph, particularly from August to from August 2021 through to January 2022. Some parents cite concerns their child will catch the virus. Others are specifically concerned to their child being immunocompromised or having a disability, making them more vulnerable to becoming seriously ill. Others are concerned about the vaccine mandate or that their children are required to wear masks whilst at school. Children have experienced two years of interrupted schooling. Students in Auckland missed at least the equivalent of a term during the COVID-19 lockdowns in 2021 alone. The impact on young children in Auckland has been significant, with many early learning centres being closed for the full duration of the lockdown, leaving children without early learning and parents without childcare support for 107 days. This has taken a particular toll on children and sole child families who did not have another child to play with during this time. COVID-19 has impacted the health and well-being of our children, 
particularly as health resources have been reallocated to respond to the COVID virus or that they have been restricted due to lockdowns. Delays to dental care is one example. We're now 3,537,000 children aged zero to 14 nationwide are waiting for dental treatment in a hospital setting, typically under general anaesthetic. Childhood immunizations are at a 10 year low. 36,747 New Zealand children having missed their scheduled vaccines against deadly childhood diseases such as measles, polio, mumps or diphtheria or whooping cough. Currently, children, currently childhood vaccine is dominated by the drive to vaccinate children aged five to 12 years against COVID. And it is important that we do vaccinate our children against COVID. It is also important that we continue to vaccinate our children against deadly childhood diseases. COVID-19 has severely highlighted deprivation caused by existing systemic inequities. At least 20% of our population experienced food-related poverty. Pre-pandemic Ministry of Health figures estimated that 174,000 children under the age of 15 experienced food insecurity. Food insecurity is estimated to have doubled since the onset of the pandemic. Families in Auckland have been hardest hit. With schools and early childhood centres closed during COVID alert levels three and four, children who would usually receive food from teachers or breakfast and lunch programmes have missed out on this, fight, on this vital nutritional support. Sadly, there has been an increase in family violence. The national lockdown saw reports of family violence spike. During alert levels four to two, the number of family harm incidents reported ranged from 345 to 645 per day, compared to between 271 and 478 in the same period in 2019. Calls to Lifeline and text messages to Youthline have increased markedly during the national lockdowns and reports of family violence have increased, yet reports of concern to Oranga Tamariki saw a 24% decrease during the national lockdown. This is potentially attributed to children not being out and about in their communities or seen by their teachers or healthcare providers. Three infants under two years of age have died under suspicious circumstances during, 20, during January 2022 alone. Whilst this tragic, these tragic incidences cannot be directly related or to being caused by COVID-19, we must consider what the impact of our stressed and disrupted society for now two years has had and how it has contributed to these deaths. The way children have experienced the pandemic has been and continues to be diverse. Some have experienced the lockdowns more positively enjoying their time at home with their families. While others have struggled with isolation, food insecurity, lack of access to online learning and increasing anxiety. To ensure that we do well for our children, including in times of crisis, we must see them, hear them and include them. It is the time to do more for our children, not less. Thank you for the opportunity to share my presentation with you. This presentation shares insights into the impacts of COVID-19 on children in New Zealand. It is not exhaustive and does not and is not a full summary of all impacts of all children. This is particularly important to note as the pandemic goes on and we are still continuing to experience new impacts from this pandemic. Thank you for your time.
Ve ben şimdi sözü Hacettepe Üniversitesi. And now I'm uh, giving the floor to Professor Süleyman Sadi uh, Seferoğlu from Hacettepe University Faculty of Education, the Department of uh, Computer and Learning Technologies. Well, welcome, welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, as you know, we have uh, had experienced lockdowns during this period, and we have changed uh, our uh, digital habit. And presumably children have moved uh, closer to a uh, kind of uh, overuse of these digital technologies and a kind of uh, addiction has emerged. So from the perspective of children, what kind of suggestions uh, would you have for parents who are concerned about their children using uh, these digital technologies and platforms and Uh, tablet computers uh, very much. And you might even have suggestions for us as adults as well. We have even started uh, he hearing a new concept like this digital parenthood. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me greet all the participants with due respect and uh, love. And I'm going to mention a number of the issues you have asked uh, uh, during my presentation. So I, I'm an academician at the Faculty of Education at Hacettepe University. And we are training uh, teachers who are experienced and knowledgeable uh, in the areas of digital technologies. And we, we aim at training them uh, in using these technologies properly. And our uh, teacher uh, applicants, uh, well, not only as teachers, but they might be uh, working in different positions uh, in the business world. They might create uh, softwares and uh, digital designs and programs for teaching in other platforms as well. And of course, in this digital transformation process, in this uh, new world what we can do what can we do uh, and how uh, can we increase social contribution and support this is what we're trying to do so from that perspective i would like to uh, thank you for being invited to this congress so uh, in relation to your question that you posed uh, a moment ago uh, i mean in this road leading to digital efficiency let me dwell a bit on what kind of experiences we had in this digital uh, period. And uh, of course, uh, the experiences we had during the pandemic uh, were, were important both for adults uh, and for children. What can be done for uh, the well-being of children in terms of their physical health? So I'm going to delve into some detail in relation to children's experiences. But before that, let me share with you uh, an anecdote. Last year in spring, uh, we uh, had great achievements, both in team uh, plays, in archery, uh, for example, uh, Mete Gazoz's uh, achievement uh, and our uh, young girls, had great contributions, which made us very proud indeed. And we uh, applauded them and we uh, really uh, felt very uh, happy. So that was really uh, the cream of uh, these uh, achievements, what we had in the volleyball area. But of course, uh, we know what happens uh, behind uh, the winners and these uh, winning scenes, these uh, sportsmen and sportswomen and athletes have a great effort in the background. The support that they had received from their families and from their coaches um, and um, exercising throughout the day and sticking to a very disciplined uh, way of living. So when we talk about success, it really comes from uh, the background. And the same thing uh, applies to the field of education as well. We have teachers, we have students, we have uh, parents. So we have a number of stakeholders. And without these stakeholders, 
and without their proper contribution, we cannot have success. Of course, not all stakeholders might be able to deliver that kind of contribution on, on the same uh, level. So it's important to uh, have a kind of awareness in this uh, area. So what did we do during the pandemic? Uh, so I have shared this image from time to time. So when the pandemic uh, was started, this was uh, the situation we were in, actually. Uh, so we were like passengers who were waiting to get on the plane uh, and the platforms, uh, the materials that we would be using during the pandemic were not ready, not in the sense uh, that they were uh, applicable in, in, in this mode. And then the plane uh, came, but then we couldn't sit on all seats. We had this social distance issue. So this was exactly what we uh, lived through during the pandemic. And the schools uh, were transferred to households. And the digital technologies uh, in houses uh, were not sufficient. In some uh, houses, those technologies and devices did not exist at all. And in some households, uh, parents and children were somehow not uh, prepared. Of course, uh, using new systems uh, was a new challenge, and uh, we, we had to uh, use new systems. And there was this need for different materials, which was the uh, most challenging thing, actually. Of course, in uh, these uh, teaching and learning processes, interaction is very important, but we had uh, difficulties in interaction as well. So this changed based on uh, age uh, groups uh, and internet connection availability of uh, devices. But the internet connection was problematic all around the world because everyone started using it and there was an overload. And students had other problems like uh, connecting to their courses. They lost their connections and um, the same thing applied to teachers as well. Of course, this uh, has affected the process uh, tremendously. And uh, role and assessment and evaluation, well, that was mentioned uh, by previous speakers as well. It's not only about assessment. So we have problems uh, in this area uh, as well. And sometimes we had uh, screen uh, shots and we shared this in social media platforms. But we were not uh, aware of our uh, violations because we were new to these mobile technologies. And we can uh, anticipate what kind of errors we might fall into. And some students were not able to turn on their cams or they were not willing to do so. This was a problem for teachers and it was a problem for the interaction we want to have amongst uh, students. So uh, there were some sabotages and uh, attacks like Zoom bombing. Uh, and there were racists and other kinds of attacks. And uh, the language used was also problematic. Of course, we need to ask uh, about the uh, responsibilities of the stakeholders. So a number of speakers uh, have mentioned this. The roles and responsibilities of parents uh, have uh, changed. And they, they just had to uh, assume the responsibility of uh, the parents and children. So uh, 
some students had a re difficult time, uh, some others did not, but it was not the same for all students. For example, some students were not able to reach out to the system and that was uh, discussed frequently, not only in Turkey, and some uh, student uh, groups. And for uh, students with uh, special needs, we had a problem. Of course, the level of digital literacy of parents contributed to this to a certain extent, but usually uh, these students uh, have gone through serious losses uh, in their education processes. And some others uh, were uh, working, as you can see on the screen, it might look funny, but uh, so this is a child writing about uh, the fact that uh, she or he has to take care of chicken in his or, his or his household. So uh, children working uh, were also a problem. So we've learned a lot during this process. We, our awareness has uh, raised. So we said, well, uh, remote uh, education, uh, distance learning was a possibility indeed. And of course, we need to be careful uh, here because that kind of uh, stance uh, might be misleading. We are going through a serious transformation in terms of digital technologies. Sometimes we might tell ourselves that, well, we have learned everything, but because the awareness is not that high, we might be doing things uh, wrongly. And uh, one thing I need to uh, highlight is that All the activities during the pandemic were tiring, but uh, teachers uh, really had the greatest challenge. Uh, it's like uh, teachers are delivering uh, ready-made things, but they uh, worked more and they uh, struggled more to reach out to their students, but it's not being voiced uh, that often. So if we can uh, explain uh, and uh, try to explain uh, this process. Of course, uh, this brings in some uh, questions. During the uh, pandemic, we had a number of uh, difficulties. We had uh, assessment and evaluation processes, uh, the role uh, processes, attendance roles, uh, and uh, this awareness has been raised uh, significantly, but the system was uh, rather tiring. And as you can see on this uh, screen, which is about digital technologies and loneliness. So in history, uh, when uh, TV sets were becoming part of households in an ever increasing manner, it's changed our lives. But now we have mobile uh, devices and smartphones. So even if we are sitting in the same room, these smartphones left everyone in their own world and created higher levels of loneliness. And in these changing times, children interestingly wanted to go to their schools because uh, in the old days, they were not willing to go to school uh, most mornings, but now that has changed. And if we look at the post-pandemic period and face-to-face -face, uh, education, of course, uh, we had different uh, problems, uh, problems in relation to children's relations with uh, the uh, th with their peers, uh, and there were serious problems in their communication, and they are going through problems of uh, focusing. And on the other hand, uh, students uh, and children were kept away from physical activity because they had to spend most of their time uh, in school. Children are not running like they used to do. Uh, 
Now, parents uh, want them to have physical activities. And in terms of physical activity, this is a great uh, problem. So in as part of these new technologies, let me share with you a number of uh, informations with you. So based on uh, January 2021, uh, the total population is 7.8 billion in the world. Uh, 5.2 billion of that population are using uh, smart uh, phones. And uh, the number of internet users is 4.9 billion. So in January 2000, uh, that, that was lower. So this is a serious uh, increase because the number of social media users has increased because social media is all about the uh, smart devices we use in our uh, pockets and people from every age group can enter into those social platforms and uh, share their posts and even if they won't be sharing posts uh, they are exposed to the content uh, there. And uh, of course, uh, we are confronted with a new, new kind of uh, literacy, which is the digital literacy. So uh, our list of competences is getting uh, longer. So we have new concepts like e-learning, uh, e-training, uh, e-government, uh, e-law uh, and e-trade and e-society. Almost everyone uh, made use of the e-government platforms uh, all around the world, for example, and uh, electronic uh, trade, e-trade, due to this necessity, we had uh, increases in the number of users and it has turned into a different structure. And we have uh, new concepts beginning with uh, digital as a prefix, digital literacy, digital citizenship, and digital diet, for example. Uh, perhaps this is one of the issues of this Congress uh, as well, because uh, if we, are, uh, we have this kind of digital uh, dependence or addiction, then we have to keep away from digital technologies up to a certain extent as well. So we have a more uh, new concept, Zoom bombs or texting and sexting, uh, doom uh, scrolling, And of course, we have new risks and uh, threats. For children, uh, these are dangerous platforms most of the time. And we might have some fake identities on the social platforms aiming at children. Uh, we have a number of uh, researches in this area. One is the European Union Kids Online uh, project. This was in 2010. And as part of this, uh, I mean, Turkey was also part of this uh, survey and research. If you look at the results of the uh, research, there are some risks in relation to children's being exposed to online uh, attacks and uh, risks. So this was uh, revised and updated in 2020. And another important point in this survey is that the lowest internet literacy around the world is in Turkey amongst uh, children. So uh, if you look at the results here, uh, especially the, uh, you see that the problems are increasing. I mean, in terms of suicidal ideation, ideation, for example, uh, content uh, showing ways to commit suicide is something uh, dangerous. Uh, hatred uh, and drugs, uh, another part of the uh, coin. And online uh, abuse, loneliness, 
uh, hate this hate discourse of hatred uh, and bullying on the uh, social platforms and uh, health problems like obesity, muscle and uh, bone diseases and Zoom fatigue and harmful software and other sorts of addictions. When we look at the child abuse uh, issue, well, this is all about children being exposed to uh, unwanted uh, content on social media. So uh, in terms of uh, child abuse, uh, we see a new uh, definition. So child abuse is uh, a child being mistreated physically or psychologically by an adult person. So it's misbehaving. And uh, when we say abuse of children, we tend to think about sexuality and sexual abuse only, but this is actually a wider concept. Uh, and it needs to take place in uh, online platforms. And because children uh, spend long hours uh, on the online platforms, they feel loneliness and they are not aware of this at all. So cyberbullying is another issue. In the physical world, uh, older children might inflict physical bullying on uh, younger children. So when you uh, do this and uh, record it on your video, on your smartphone and share it on uh, one of the social media platforms, that becomes uh, uh, online bullying. And substance abuse uh, and addiction, uh, well, a similar uh, problem is valid for digital technologies as well. Like they want to use these technologies and they're almost addicted to them. Uh, they cannot do without them. Uh, in the old days, uh, moms used to send their children away to their uh, rooms when they're punished. But then the same thing happens to the internet. Even if you would be sending your child to his or her room, well, they would be uh, getting online and not feel alone at all or just serve their addiction. And they might have concerns of being excluded uh, from their peers, marginalization, uh, being introvert, and uh, it, there is more uh, game and entertainment on these virtual platforms. And if children have easy access to technology, that accelerates things. So uh, there are a number of symptoms in relation to that so that you will be able to uh, observe your child, like lack of hygiene, and uh, uh, lack of willingness to go out, uh, anxiety, irritability, and a sense uh, and a uh, sense of deprivation. Uh, and they constantly think about these technological activities. What kind of questions can you ask? Is your child uh, looking happy? It excited, and uh, do they lie? Like, uh, how long have you been online? Not long, like one uh, half an hour might be an answer, but then in the reality might be that they might be online for hours on end. So naturally, they are um, subject to online risks, uh, which might result in uh, problems in academic relations, social relations, so digital diet is the first solution. I mean, we uh, care about our physical diets, what we eat and what we don't eat. So the same thing uh, might be uh, applied for digital uh, usage as well, which is called the digital diet. And you can shorten the time and control and limit your time you spend for online platforms. You can uh, turn off your uh, wireless connections, you can turn off your notifications, and some smartphones have nighttime applications. And you need to set realistic targets. We tend to forget this, but unless you set yourselves realistic targets, uh, you may find things difficult. And we have this three T detox, TV, tablet, and telephone. We need to uh, minimize the use of uh, these uh, devices. 
So if we care about uh, this, uh, we can control our children and save them. Of course, there are other things like reading books, listening to music, uh, and creating a balance is the most important thing here. For example, what we say is that internet is forbidden. What, what, you can just, uh, instead of banning the internet, you can uh, forward your child accordingly. In social media, I can give you an example, you know, to put the baby asleep, you know, we have some musical tool, uh, toys. We can, we can make the same thing on the streets. You know, also, also, also for the adults, you know. You know, it is, you know, it, it is sometimes related with someone else, someone else controls it remotely. And, and there is a digital footprint and the people may not have enough uh, the idea about digital footprint. And the key solution is to become digital citizens. We need to improve digital literacy of, the, of all our citizens. I mean, at least equip them with the fundamental skills and help them use technologies in a, with critical thinking and not just be consumers, but also producers. And we need to raise awareness about digital technologies. And it is all about using this with knowledge and conscious. And digital parents require these skills. And... Uh, and they protect their children from such threats. But then we didn't, I mean, I'm, well, I'm not sure, I mean, how, to what extent the, pa the parents possess such skills. We know there are issues. And I, I wouldn't say let's may have a family uh, activity. Maybe when we are out as a as a family, we shouldn't be using any mobiles at all. There is a tremendous digital transformation, a disruption, and there's a constant release of new technologies which require new skills. The Information and Technology Committee offers certain resources on safe uh, internet. Two days ago, that, that was the World Internet Day, and we shared information on safer internet. And the BTK has studies on violence on the digital games. The Turkish Presidency Office addresses the issues. The UNICEF has a recommendation on baby care and, and the, its stages. And then we have a, you know, uh, a, a law on the protection of the personal uh, information and privacy. It was enacted in 2018. And then there are vital digital skills, digital life skills. All children need are on the screen. We need to support our children to develop these skills. When sharing on social media, we need to check who can see this. Am I harming anyone? Am I you know, bragging or am I setting a bad example? And this relates to the accuracy of information. Now there are seven uh, types of uh, data, our wrong or false information. Uh, and we may need a triple filter when posting and I wanna share tate.org. Of course, there are other confirmation platforms like Doğrulugüne, Doğrulukpaya and Doğrula.org. And these platforms help filtering Mal misinformation and confirm the authenticity of online posts. 
This is an, an image released by BTK. There are a number of in, in, infographics. So, and it deals with what we can do. And maybe we need a digital contract with our child. When we define the contents of that contract with our child, then it is more likely for the child to obey uh, the rules. And in conclusion, one of the former Secretary of Education in America says, we're currently preparing students for jobs that don't exist. They don't exist and we will be inventing technologies in the future, but they don't exist. So it is a dilemma, he says. I mean, we, but the things we are discussing about children and their future, they don't exist. And it's, it's such a challenge. And for us, the educators, our life is not easy either. But then, of course, uh, it doesn't mean that it's, uh, we cannot manage it. And, and I have to say that social media is addictive. So let's stay connected, but don't be addicted. And we can overcome this by life lo lifelong learning principles. I want to thank, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you.
Şimdi konferansımıza devam ediyoruz. Profesör Next session uh, we will have another beautiful presentation but let me just thank Professor Sadi Seferoğlu. Now we have Dr. Anita Lovren. She is joining us from Melbourne University. She will be talking about uh, a healthy and sustainable nutrition for children and adolescents. So hello and thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. I'd really, I'm very grateful to be invited to speak at such an interesting and timely conference. And I come from Melbourne, where we had some of the longest lockdowns. So um, hopefully uh, um, I, I've got a good appreciation of some of the impacts of lockdowns. So in my presentation today, I'm going to firstly talk about healthy diets for children and adolescents. Then I will be talking about sustainable diets. And then at the end, I'll talk about how diets have changed during the pandemic. And, and I want to bring it all together at the end and identify where the overlaps are and this sweet spot in the middle. So what is a healthy diet? I'm sure many of you have got lots of different ideas and you may have heard of some of these different diets. And when it comes Um, to children, parents are bombarded with many competing ideas about what is a healthy diet for their children. In Australia, many people get their dietary advice from celebrities rather than from qualified experts. And this 2018 study revealed that the top five Facebook pages in Australia providing nutrition advice were actually led by celebrities not nutritionists or dietitians, and that these top five pages had 93 times more likes than the pages led by experts. So where can people find evidence-based recommendations about healthy diets for children and adolescents? Well, the best source of information is your nation's food-based dietary guidelines. According to the FAO, food-based dietary guidelines should provide context-specific advice and principles on healthy diets and lifestyles, which are rooted in sound evidence and respond to a country's public health and nutrition priorities. It's food production and consumption patterns, the socio-cultural influences and the food composition and accessibility factors. This map shows the countries with national food-based dietary guidelines. And the results on the next few slides I'm going to show you are from this 2019 global review of food-based dietary guidelines. So analysis of dietary guidelines from around 90 countries showed that although there are country-specific differences for the reasons I explained, overall, there is good agreement internationally. Nearly universal guidance to consume a variety of foods, to consume a higher proportion of some foods than others, to mostly consume fruit, vegetables, and starchy staples, but also include animal source foods and legumes or beans and to limit sugar, fat, and salty foods that are high in sugar, fat, and salt. Indeed, 40 countries around the world recommend these five healthy food groups, starchy staples, fruits, vegetables, dairy, and other protein foods. And these five food groups are exactly the same ones as the ones that appear in the 2015 Turkey, Turkish dietary guidelines and their food guide. And they're actually the same five that also appear in the dietary guideline food guide for my country, from Australia. You can see the similarity. We have the starchy staples, we have the vegetables, the fruit, the dairy foods, and the protein foods. So let's take a step back now for a moment and think about why children and adolescents require a healthy diet. 
It is in order to support optimal growth and physical development and cognitive development and to support optimal functioning and physical, mental and social well-being. We want to promote health now and in the future. And we need to avoid all forms of malnutrition. Now, it used to be that malnutrition referred to undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies. But now the term malnutrition also includes overweight and obesity. And by preventing obesity, we're likely to reduce the risk of several diet-related non-communicable diseases, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. Part of the recommendations made um, in food, sorry, part of the basis of recommendations made in um, food-based dietary guidelines is the achievement of nutrient recommendations. So these tables come from some of the Turkish background papers. And you can see it, the tables looking at adequacy of a certain number of nutrients. And there's pages and pages of this where the, the, the um, committee went through and looked at for the nutrient adequacy for various groups of the population. The other main basis for recommendations is the scientific literature, particularly studies, prospective cohort studies, studies where we've um, followed people for many years and looked at their diet and then their later health outcomes, and particularly the ones that have looked at dietary patterns. So based on achieving nutrient requirements and on healthy dietary patterns, Recommendations for the number of serves per day are calculated, as you can see here for the Turkish Dietary Guidelines. And you can see the recommended serves here. And I want to bring your attention to the top of the pyramid, this little bit circled in red. I'm going to uh, zoom in on this little section. It says the foods to consume rarely in small quantities. And this is the list that's provided processed meat, such as salami, sausages and ham, pastries, chocolate, biscuits, cakes, alcoholic drinks, soft drinks, chips, butter, ice cream and jam. And these are the foods which are almost exactly the same ones that the Australian Dietary Guidelines recommend that we eat only sometimes and in small amounts. And these are foods that we call in Australia discretionary choices or discretionary foods and drinks. So you'll hear me use that term quite a bit in my presentation. This is what I mean, the, all these unhealthy foods and drinks. Now, one of the main problems with the diets, children's diets in Australia and in other developed countries, is that these foods are displacing those healthy, nutritious foods I showed you earlier. Here's some data. And you can see we've got two to three year olds, four to six, four to eight, nine to 13 and 14 to 18 year olds. And you can see that between 30 and 40 percent of their overall energy intake is coming from those unhealthy discretionary foods I just showed you a picture of. This slide, I'm sorry it's a little busy, but it shows the Australian recommendations for adolescents in terms of serves of the various food groups. We've got light green for the boys and brighter, darker green for the girls. We've got the five healthy food groups I showed you here and this is the minimum number of daily recommended serves. Here we've got the unhealthy food groups, and that's the maximum recommendation, recommended intake. Now I've added what Australian teenagers actually consume. Blue for the boys and pink for the girls. And you can see for all five of the healthy food groups, teenagers in Australia are consuming much less than is the minimum recommended. However, when we look at the unhealthy, the discretionary foods, those unhealthy foods, you can see that Australian teenagers are consuming, um, the girls are consuming double the maximum recommended, and the boys are consuming 50% more than is recommended. I'm going to change gear a little bit and talk about something called ultra processed foods. Over the past decade, there's been greater recognition of the impact of food processing on health. So ultra processed foods are foods made from ingredients not usually found in a domestic kitchen. And they're being increasingly recognized as being associated with poor 
health outcomes. Here's a systematic review that was published by Lane and colleagues. And I'm going to show you the results on the next slide. But they analyzed the results of 43 different studies in adults. And they found that a higher consumption of ultra processed food was associated with an increased risk of all of these conditions. But what about children and young people, I hear you say? Well, this is a systematic review that specifically looked at the relationship between children's intake of ultra processed foods and um, health outcomes, they identified 26 studies and found that in most of those studies, there was a positive relationship between ultra processed food intake and body fat. So the children who ate more ultra processed food tended to have more body fat. And the reason for this might be explained by this randomized control trial that was conducted in adults. So 20 adults living in a research center were fed ad libitum diets, so they could eat as much as they liked with this diet. And they were presented with either an ultra processed diet, which is in the blue line, or an unprocessed or minimally processed diet in the red. And you can see that when they were eating the ultra processed diet, they ate more in terms of energy, and also they gained more body weight. And the diets were similar in every other way. So they had similar energy was presented, similar sugar, fat, fiber, and macronutrients. But it was just that the, the participants wanted to eat more of the ultra processed foods. So there's been a lot of research into the health effects of ultra processed foods recently. And it seems likely that dietary guidelines in the future will provide guidance about restricting consumption of ultra processed foods. Taking a more global perspective now, although I've shown you that there's very good agreement about what a healthy diet for children is internationally, there is still so much room for improvement. In 2018, it was estimated that one in five children under the age of five were stunted due to chronic undernourishment. In addition, 7% of children were wasted and 6% were overweight or obese. So just to summarize this section of my talk, I would say to achieve healthy diets for children and adolescents, follow the, your country's food-based dietary guidelines and consume a variety of foods from the five healthy nutritious food groups. As they say, the trouble is these foods are getting displaced by those unhealthy discretionary foods and drinks I showed you, which often tend to be ultra processed. So it's important to try and keep those to a minimum. Thirdly, we need to try and match the food and drink intake that we have with our energy requirements. So again, reducing ultra processed foods can help us with that. Now I'm gonna change gear and talk to you a little bit about a sustainable diet. I expect many of you are familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that set out to transform the world, leaving no one behind. Within the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, there are four goals that are particularly relevant to today's topic. How can we achieve health and all forms of malnutrition and take action on protecting the climate and halting land de degradation all at the same time. Over recent years, there's been a move for food-based dietary guidelines to take more account of environmental sustainability. And some countries such as Sweden have already done this. You may have heard of the Eat Lancet group, who have designed a planetary health global reference diet for healthy people and a healthy planet, which is very influential in this area. And the number one recommendation for eating more sustainably is usually to eat more plants and less animal source foods, particularly beef and dairy. But is it really that simple? In the next few slides, I'm going to consider the feasibility of this advice and the likely impact on dietary intake in terms of ultra-processed foods 
and nutrient intakes. So first of all, feasibility. This graph shows the Eat Lancet recommended diet, which is in orange, and the average Australian intake, which is in blue. And you can see that the average Australian would need to consume an additional three serves a day of whole grains, more vegetables. They would also need to triple their intake of legumes or beans and increase their intake of nuts fivefold. So I'm not sure that many Australians are going to do that. Indeed, we've been asking people for years to do, make those changes in a smaller amount, and people are still not eating the recommended amounts. So instead of eating more whole grains, beans and nuts, the plant-based message has really led to a steep increase in consumption of plant-based milks and plant-based meats, as shown. And you've probably seen these products in your supermarkets. And this is um, the rise in consumption in the UK between 2008 and 2019. But there have been similar trends in Western countries. The problem with these um, imitation foods that look the same, taste the same, and can be used in a similar way is that they are not nutritionally identical and that we're actually often swapping a minimally processed food to foods um, that are ultra processed. So although plant milks are perceived as healthy, there is actually a large variation in their nutritional profile. Most of them are low in protein, minerals, and vitamins. And when they're fortified, they is quite uneven um, and a little bit difficult to know quite um, what they are and they're not fortified with. And we don't always know the nutrient bioavailability of the nutrients that are present. So how accessible those nutrients are to the body anyway. So this 2017 study compared the protein content of cow's milk in terms of the recommended protein intake for a toddler. And you can see that apart from for soy, there was a very big difference in protein. All the other alternatives were actually much lower in protein. And here's a study looking at iodine in cow's milk and in some of the alternatives. Many of them are not fortified are very, very low in iodine, which is important for neurological development. And those that are fortified are not fortified to the same level um, as is naturally present in milk. I could go through all the nutrients in turn, but to save time, I'm going to just look at some data from a recent dietary modeling survey. So Salom and colleagues used um, data from the French National Nutrition Survey and model the nutritional impact of swapping meat and milk to plant-based alternatives. Now, the good news was that dietary fiber intakes would increase, but there would also be marked de decreases in intake of all these nutrients. And there would also be an undesirable, quite substantial increase in the intake of ultra-processed foods. So, Making a healthy diet a more environmentally sustainable diet is a little bit more complicated than just replacing meat and dairy with plant-based foods. And determining the environmental sustainability of individual foods is actually very complex as there are several planetary boundaries to consider. It's not just about climate change or greenhouse gas emissions. We also need to consider water use, cropland, and even things like pesticide residue toxicity. And which is most important? Um, and how do we determine the relative importance of these things? Local variation in the food system also needs to be taken into account. For example, water use may not be such an issue in some areas as it is in others. Calculations using global averages or data from countries with very different food systems can lead to inaccurate conclusions. And many studies, including the Eat Lancet one, did not consider food processing when they were determining the environmental impact of foods. They only looked up to the um, stage of food production. And we know that we eat a lot of processed foods so food processing 
does have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions and water use, for example. Each country has a different food culture and different public health nutrition challenges. So when we're looking for healthy and sustainable diets, I think we do need to do it on a national or even local level. And this Australian study actually takes account of these factors. And one of the and so when they did this work for Australia and took account of all these factors, one of the key observations was that it was actually the total energy intake, the amount of food people were consuming, that explained about half the variation in environmental impact scores. So the clear message is just don't overconsume if you want to reduce the environmental impact of your diet. It also showed that you can make a reduction of around 15% in environmental impact by making dietary changes, but still being compliant with the Australian dietary guidelines. So within each of the five food groups, for example, choosing those foods with the lowest um, environmental impact. And the researchers said that the highest priority should be given to reducing consumption of discretionary choice foods because we eat far too many of them. And because we eat so many of them, they actually have in Australia a very high environmental impact. Now, while 15% reduction is actually useful, it's not enough to achieve planetary boundary targets that, need, that we need to in change. Um, and so we need to make improvements in our food production. So for example, tomatoes, the amount of carbon dioxide emissions and water use can actually vary very widely according to the way that the tomatoes are produced. So it's time that we put more focus on some of the food production methods. The other thing that the authors noted is food waste. In Australia, 30 to 40% of food is wasted. And if you look at the global figure, it's estimated to be about 30%. Producing all food. Um, has a, an environmental impact. So if we're going to reduce the environmental impact of our diet, we really do need to stop wasting as much food as we do. So just to sum up this section of my talk, um, here are some conclusions about environmentally sustainable diets for children and adolescents. Firstly, it's actually very complex. And it's not always a good idea just to go for the simple or even a global solution. We probably need um, to consider the nuances and um, have local solutions or national solutions. Energy impact has the biggest impact, energy intake has the biggest impact, so let's avoid overconsuming. Let's reduce consumption of discretionary and ultra-processed foods and drinks, those foods I showed you. Plant-based meat and dairy foods replacements, um, the foods that look a bit like meat and taste a bit like meat but are made from plants, tend to be ultra processed and are not nutritionally equivalent. So if you're eating these, we need to make adjustments. And we need to also consider the overall food system. It's time to reduce food waste and it's time to advocate for um, improvements in the sustainability of the, the way that foods are produced. I'm now going to talk about the impact of the pandemic on children's diets. As I know, previous speakers have already explained, life for children and adolescents has changed markedly during the pandemic, particularly during periods of lockdown. Sometimes there were food shortages, um, particularly of fresh foods. Some households had a lot less money. By spending more time at home doing homeschooling, children's physical activity levels sometimes diminished. And in many cases, stress and the proximity of the kitchen led to increased snacking and eating occasions. So looking at the published research, and there's a lot of research coming out at the moment, but already um, there's a number of um, systematic reviews and scoping reviews. So this scoping review came um, out in 2020, sorry, 2021. It identified 23 studies in various population groups, but they were mainly adults. But you can see that most of the changes um, people, in people's diets and lifestyles were less healthy, but not entirely. And some people did actually, 11 studies actually did show 
um, that some people had uh, slightly uh, made slightly more favorable and healthier food choices. But overwhelming, more, overwhelmingly, more studies showed that people whose diet became less healthy. Looking specifically at children and adolescents, this 2021 uh, 20, systematic review identified 10 studies that assessed the impact of lockdowns in children and adolescents. And again, the results were actually quite mixed. There were some beneficial changes, such as increased adherence to a Mediterranean diet, but there were also studies finding eating patterns became less healthy, such as increased intake of discretionary foods. Now, one of the studies in the previous review actually included participants from Turkey. So I'm talking about this for you today. So parents of 47 year olds were questioned and the parents came from Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Britain. Relatively small study, 330 parents. But the parents were questioned and 63% said that their children's weight did not increase during lockdown. And 73% of Turkish participants in these, of these quite young children reported no increase in children's consumption of unhealthy foods. However, the previous study relied on parent reports and this study from the US measured the height and weight of children and then estimated BMI, body mass index. So in this study, over 432,000 children were studied. And you can see overall, um, there was a huge rate increase in the rate of obesity um, during the pandemic, particularly in these three to five-year-olds, but also um, in six to 11-year-olds. Um, the increase in 12 to 17-year-olds was not quite as pronounced. Other countries, including China, have reported an increase in obesity rates in children and adolescents. And here's a recent study from Austria. Children aged seven to 10 years as girls and boys. And again, you can see a rapid rise in overweight and obesity rates during the pandemic. And people are starting to talk about um, cobesity, so COVID obesity. However, it's not just obesity. This is a large study 5.2 million people under 30 were studied, mostly in the US. And you can see the um, new cases in eating disorders in the years prior to the pandemic and then during the year of the pandemic. And there was a 15% rise in eating disorders. And when the researchers drilled down to see which part of the population was most affected, it was mainly the 15 to 19 year old girls. And this study from the US highlights the pandemic disproportionately impacted households with children. Uh, the prevalence of food insecurity tripled. And as a previous speaker said, this may be due to the shift to online schools um, where families depending on free or reduced price meals were affected. So in global terms, before the pandemic, there had been some progress on the zero hunger sustainable development goal. However, it's been estimated that the pandemic will lead to 13.6 million more children suffering from wasting. So just to sum up this part of my talk, in terms of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on children and adolescents' diets, again, it's complex. Responses vary. Some diets have become healthier, but many more have become less healthy. Weight gain was increased in some children. Teenage girls seem particularly at increased risk of eating disorders. And we have had an increased risk in food insecurity in many families. So my final slide, so to bring it all together, what can we say about healthy and sustainable diets for children and adolescents living through the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, through all of this, the common themes are to encourage our children and young, and young um, adolescents and teenagers to consume a variety of foods from all five healthy food groups. If plant-based alternatives are consumed instead of meat and dairy, take into consideration that they're not nutritionally equivalent and make allowances. It's important to reduce consumption of all these ultra-processed and discretionary foods and to match our overall intake to our energy requirements. And if we reduce intake of these foods, it will get easier. 
And finally, let's all play our role in helping the planet and let's try to reduce food waste. So thank you for your attention. Um, you can contact me here. And um, I'm sorry I couldn't come over to see you. I would love to come and talk to you all one day. Um, but thank you again for inviting me to, to speak to you. Thank you for very much, Anita, for your presentation and support. I hope that uh, we have a chance uh, together again. Thank you. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Araştırma sonuçlarını bizimle paylaştığınız Thank you için. very much for sharing such insights with us, Anita Lawrence. We will be more than happy to see you one day in Turkey. Now I want to continue uh, with a professor from Hacettepe University, uh, Mrs. Hilal, uh, Professor Hilal Özcebe, from the Public Health Department of Hacettepe University. She will talk about the health literacy and, and improving the well-being of children. Professor Hilal Özcebe is with us. Welcome to our broadcast. Welcome. Hello. Of course, uh, the awareness on health literacy has increased during the pandemic. And what is it really? Protecting children's physical and mental health. What things should we be doing in these areas? So will you please share some information on these areas with us? Well, with gladness. First of all, uh, thank you very much for being invited for such a nice meeting. We thank you for obliging uh, to our invitation. Well, I am an academician at the Department of Public Health and Faculty of Medicine at Hacettepe University. I work on uh, health of children. So the pandemic has influenced us uh, all uh, deeply. And during this process, we have uh, had different experiences. When it comes to health uh, literacy, it uh, became even more important. And we have been uh, we, we, in a situation in which we wanted to know more about our health and we had to change uh, our lifestyles. Yes, that was a necessity. Uh, we, we really had to change it. And uh, from that perspective, uh, how COVID-19 has affected children and children's health, how it affected communication between the families and children, the relationship between uh, COVID-19 and health literacy, 
uh, we are at what stage are we uh, during the return to school process and mental health literacy. So these are the main areas that I will be discussing. Let me first share uh, with you this uh, slide. Uh, if you look at data from two days ago only, the total number of cases uh, is um, 400 million uh, cases. This is the, the global figure. And as you can see in all continents, our cases uh, are high in numbers. During the uh, pandemic, as you have seen, when you mark the years, uh, 2020 and 2021 uh, passed with the pandemic. There were a number of increases in the pandemic, but this last uh, peak is a large, very uh, high peak uh, indeed. And uh, well, uh, in Europe, we have the largest number of cases where the World Health Organization is located. And thankfully, the number of casualties, I mean, the number of uh, deaths uh, is a law recently, but then uh, it has increased uh, along with uh, the number of cases, although uh, mortality and fatality levels have decreased the number of deaths uh, increase as we have more cases. And unfortunately, we have lost 6 million people because of this pandemic. As you can see, uh, the American and European uh, continents were amongst the continents which were affected most by the COVID-19 pandemic. And how have children been affected? So this uh, graph, uh, I mean, there is always one thing which we come across uh, in the media and uh, scientists usually argue that uh, COVID-19 affects uh, adults more than uh, it, does, it affects children and vaccination programs for children uh, have only been rolled out recently uh, after the uh, vaccination was uh, produced. So we see the children and adolescent uh, figures uh, in the population. For children and adolescents, the, the dark blue bars represent the numbers. So these are uh, figures and statistics taken from uh, these uh, countries, 104 countries. So mainly COVID-19 uh, is affecting adults and the, case, the number of cases amongst children and adolescents is comparatively low. COVID-19 has increased our lives uh, deeply. Together with the onset of the pandemic, we had to uh, wear masks. We do not communicate without masks. And at the first stage, we had lockdowns uh, at schools and workplaces. As previous speakers have already mentioned, we have had new processes like distance learning and remote working. Uh, stay home, uh, well, that was the motto and the name of many campaigns all around the world, as mentioned before. And the social and cultural activity uh, spaces were closed down. We had to go on living at homes. Social distance, the physical distance, uh, it, well, we have had new concepts like uh, these. We have had gone through quarantines. Uh, we had limitations between countries and between uh, cities. And we had to increase our concern for personal and corporate and social uh, hygiene uh, precautions. We talked about these issues for a very long time. Uh, screening tests became part of our lives. We could not participate in social uh, activities without go having a screening test and vaccination programs and also uh, the necessity to show our vaccination cards when uh, required. So how do these macro social changes affect the smallest uh, individuals, the youngest individuals of society? That is to say, how were children affected? 
as you know, children until the age of uh, 18, well, uh, they are subject to the uh, rights of children. So we accept every individual as a child up to the age of 18. And uh, it's the responsibility uh, uh, of states and in adult individuals to uh, safeguard the mental and physical well-being of children. So this is a study from UNICEF uh, focusing on the impact of quarantine on children. It's a systematic uh, compilation. So the number of samples is 130,000. So depression stands out as one of the most important factors. And in children, again, we have an increase in fear and anxiety. There is an increase in suicidal uh, uh, ideation and attempts and uh, trauma and post-traumatic stress, aggressive behaviors, alcohol and substance use. And uh, there are also some increase uh, in unwanted behaviors in uh, social lives, uh, especially towards uh, adolescents. Uh, the, the use of alcohol and substance increases. And uh, again, uh, we have findings, although minimum, uh, we have some positive impacts on uh, mental health uh, as well because of the lockdowns and the way individuals spend their time at home. But generally speaking, it played an important role in depression, anxiety, uh, substance use and uh, psychological uh, well-being in general. Compared with uh, boys, girls had a higher level of depression and anxiety. And in uh, boys, the use of alcohol and substance is higher compared with uh, girls. So for older children and adolescents, uh, we have observed depression, anxiety, and aggressive behaviors. If they have a specific disease like chronic and uh, mental, this effect is much higher. And during the pandemic, uh, violence uh, emerged as uh, an issue for children uh, and the perception of risk resulted in fear those uh, with problems uh, in family, uh, those subjected to discrimination and bullying in countries with low income and children in conflict zones were affected more than other children. So uh, children all around the world and disadvantaged uh, situations became more foregrounded. When it comes to physical and mental uh, health, I mean, as far as physical health is concerned. This is a systematic uh, study compiling 71 uh, researchers in 35 countries. It focuses on the quarantine uh, process. So people slept more and they spent more time in front of the screen and uh, a decrease in physical activity. So when we have less physical activity, of course, we come across with the problem of obesity. Another compilation, compilation study shows us that the diet habits have changed. Uh, people, uh, children uh, consumed more food and mostly unhealthy food like potato, uh, meat, uh, sugar uh, and um, insecurity in terms of food uh, emerged as an issue due to economic reasons. The lockdowns uh, decreased physical activity. And from another perspective, I mean, obesity was increasing on the one side. Uh, Jarvin and her friends, for example, uh, carried out a research covering the years 2019 and 20 and the increase in obesity was like 20.7%. If the child was obese, COVID-19 had a much uh, more severe progression. So we have an impact on the physical activities of children uh, on obesity, uh, which uh, result uh, in a severe progression of COVID-19. 
We know that anxiety is also on the increase, but in obese children, anxiety levels were much higher. Again, uh, physical activity and screen time emerged as important um, issues. As you can see, uh, these studies uh, are compiled from different countries. And this uh, study, which comes from South Korea, as I have said, found out the uh, impacts uh, we found. And it also affects the relationship with the family, the stress level in family, depression, uh, emotional problems, use of tablets, and the resulting behavioral problems were uh, related to one another. So on a reciprocal basis, these factors affected one another. If an individual within the family is in depression, especially if one of the parents, mothers or fathers, well, that affected the period of uh, sleep, uh, the amount of time spent in front of the TV and tablet uh, computers, uh, and it also affected behavioral uh, issues as well. So we are talking about a psychosocial impact of the pandemic on the family as a general uh, principle. Parents also were uh, influenced by the pandemic, depression, anxiety, difficulty in uh, presenting their parenthood uh, and other behavioral problems. So if you look at uh, these graphs, we have an increase in depression, both in mothers and fathers, and based on their education levels, again, we have an increase based on income, depression is higher, and based on uh, school education levels, again, we see an increase in depression. So looking at this study and thinking about family relationships, how would parenthood influence uh, children? Uh, how would these relationalities uh, impact the situation of the child? If the COVID-19 pandemic's uh, macro uh, social changes uh, will be interpreted within the framework of families or in uh, crowded families, you can very clearly see that it has affected the mental health and well-being of children. And on the other hand, this result also uh, shows us that uh, in relation to uh, immunity levels within the family, social distancing, and um, obliging to social distancing uh, rules and use of masks uh, had a positive correlation with these results. We are not only talking about physical and social problems within the family. Uh, it also very much depends on the exposure and sensitivity of the family members to the pandemic. So how was the change compared with the pre-pandemic uh, years? As I have said, during the pandemic, we had an impact on sleep, physical activity, peer and family relations. So this Canadian study has also found out this, but when anxiety levels were uh, analyzed before the pandemic, the relationship between sleep and screen time, I mean, uh, their relationship with the uh, family members and their relationship with the uh, screens emerged as important uh, relationalities. So all these factors have been affected and they influenced one another. Of course, the pandemic process, the social and economic status of pa parents were influenced by many factors, which included the fear of getting the virus uh, and uh, this mechanism within the family uh, at large was uh, affected. Prime and uh, colleagues uh, carried out another study in 2020 and they uh, have come across with this uh, result. If you look at uh, the social disruption and the caregiver's well-being, 
uh, that like job loss, financial insecurity, and social distancing and confinement, and all uh, their all of these factors impact on the general well-being. So the resilience of the family members and the family in general is uh, very critical here. If you look at this mechanism, uh, in order to get away with this relationality, the uh, family should be resilient to protect children, which means uh, family members need to assume serious roles in protecting children against the pandemic and improving their social lives. Well, health is a situation of well-being. In order to uh, be uh, healthy uh, and um, sharing uh, healthy behaviors, this is how we name them. In COVID-19, we have seen that uh, our perception of well-being and health has changed drastically and we have lost our general pattern uh, when it comes to evaluating these factors as the, all humanity when it comes to social relations and substance use and depression we have had serious problems and in order to come over these problems we need some interventions these areas for intervention are strengthening individuals and the health system and uh, communicating these things uh, well. Of course, uh, improving health and health education is very critical for the individual to uh, obtain healthy behaviors, their ability to assess their uh, well-being. We need an increase in health uh, literacy. Uh, which result in social empowerment and uh, change, both on a social and individual levels. So the recent focus is more on health literacy. So what is health literacy? Uh, World Health Organization has an old definition. Uh, it's the representation of cognitive and social uh, skills in relation to the individual's motivation and skills uh, to use the necessary information to keep their emotional, uh, mental and physical health uh, well. Sorensen and uh, colleagues in 2012 made it clear that health literacy is very much linked to general literacy levels. Protecting your health, sustaining it and improving it and in order to increase your lifestyle and improve it, being able to reach out to the right health resources. So this definition has these uh, principles. The European Health Literacy Study defines uh, 12 subsections for health literacy, access to information, understanding it, being able to interpret it and applying to uh, information uh, in relation to health and being able to use them. So uh, use of health services, secondly, protection against diseases, and thirdly, uh, improving health. So when we talk about health literacy, we are all at the same time uh, talking about health literacy, protection against COVID-19, and uh, the potential for further improvement of our health and accessing the right information and understanding it. In COVID-19, when it comes to uh, health literacy, we have had serious problems and uh, we had uh, like a uh, disease, uh, kind of another pandemic of information. Wrong pieces of information were shared amongst societies. Uh, information which was not evidence-based was shared by individuals and masses, or we had to face a bombardment of wrong information. So all in all, uh, we have seen that uh, in terms of health literacy, the skill of implementing these principles uh, were very critical indeed. All sorts of information uh, should be blended with the uh, old uh, information. 
So we need to share the right information on a continuous basis. This is especially important for fragile communities. In COVID-19, uh, health uh, literacy uh, was studied in a structural equality model. So let's look at this. This is a Chinese uh, study. So individual health literacy and COVID-19 information sharing with uh, family members, there is a positive correlation between these two factors. And information sharing with family members and the individual's employment of or preventive behaviors also had a correlative relation uh, on a positive tone uh, with individual health literacy. That means, in other words, as individual health literacy increases, we know that preventive measures are being taken. So uh, how is individual health literacy uh, affected? Age, education uh, and income uh, stand out as the most important factors. Also, there are some other personal factors as well. So if you look at uh, the UK, we have another group of researchers there which come up with an ecological uh, model. This shows the social determinants of child health uh, model. Uh, and Tyler, at the age of four, has cerebral palsy and he has a developmental uh, delay. Uh, this relates to mental and physical health problems, attachment and bonding, poverty, parental health, bereavement. Schools were closed. Uh, we came up with social media. And uh, in many countries, uh, we had uh, problems in financial, financial and health services. So what's happening on this side? Uh, in terms of uh, health uh, care and the postponement and problems of health care, the mother is being depressed, the father is losing his job uh, and not being able to uh, communicate with grandmothers and grandfathers and uh, waiting uh, for a long time for future health uh, controls and uh, not being able to go on holidays or participating in social activities. So we, we, we cannot contain ourselves with a family only. We need to have a wider perspective, including the social structures as well, because during the COVID-19 pandemic, the social structure as a whole has collapsed, in other words. So we had depression cases, anxiety cases uh, in children, and amongst children we have post-traumatic stress syndromes in relation to lockdowns. But still, uh, we need to think uh, about long-term mental health and uh, psychological well-being or disease, including suicide, because uh, the pandemic is not over yet. Two years have passed and children have lived uh, with these problems for two years and they have started school with behavioral problems. So uh, for a long time, they're attending their schools, uh, but as the previous presentations uh, have uh, mentioned, they still have problems in social uh, interaction, in, uh, I mean, those with aggress aggression, uh, with stress problems. So uh, we had to deal with a group of such children at our schools with these problems. So if uh, we consider this last uh, peak, still uh, we have a significant fear rela re relation in relation to the uh, sickness. So all around the world, we still have deaths and risk for catching the virus. So uh, we still need uh, some things to be done, both uh, within the families and uh, at school. So we need a holistic strategy to control uh, things I have mentioned on both sides. Uh, so British Columbia has published this uh, study in terms of capacity improved development and mental health uh, at uh, school in the classroom. Capacity uh, development includes uh, mental health literacy, social and emotional learning, resilience, uh, and uh, 
going uh, to school on a continuous basis and playing games and in emotional uh, and mental health we are in need of a comprehensive school health uh, principle uh, basic uh, skills so we are not only talking about mental health only uh, or physical health only so uh, when we talk about literacy in health we need to include uh, mental health issues as well and we need to pay attention to uh, this need for uh, literacy for mental health issues so what are the targeted gains we want children to be able to access to information on health, to understand health messages. We want them to be able to decide consciously in relation to their health issues. And they should be able to use information to improve their own health. And we want them to be able to participate in positive activities. And we also want our children to have an awareness of their own actions and uh, decisions. This kind of self-awareness amongst children is, for me, perhaps the most important thing, because uh, we have been talking about mental and physical health uh, measures. And uh, this kind of self-awareness will allow our children to be able to observe their bodily symptoms more efficiently and timely. Uh, and that will enable them to act uh, on ethical and social terms, which would in turn uh, make them individuals who are able to manage themselves and keep uh, on lifelong learning throughout their lives. So presently, uh, the health uh, literacy includes uh, mental literacy as well. At least this should be our aim. Both families uh, and both uh, schools need to be supported in these areas. So th this is all I will have to say, and uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Uh, Hilal. That was a very uh, informative presentation, especially for mothers and fathers if uh, they're watching us. Well, thank you again for your participation. Thank you for including me in. Now uh, we will be moving on uh, with our conference with uh, Dr. Ol uh, Uner from Oregon Health and Science University uh, from the KC Ophthalmology Department. So we have a recorded presentation from him. Let's move on. With Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ol Uner, uh, and I'm a clinical and surgical resident in ophthalmology at KCI Institute. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Sabri Utad Food Research Foundation uh, for the invitation. Uh, my talk today will be on the COVID-19 pandemic and children's eye health. Um, you can 
contact me via the uh, email and various social media platforms that I have uh, listed on this screen. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, I'll mainly talk about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic first, uh, and then overall what we mean by children's eye health and its importance uh, in a variety of different settings. Uh, we'll then talk about the impact of COVID-19 on children's eye health. Um, I'll specifically be looking at uh, different refractive errors that we've seen uh, in this population, as well as some care coordination problems that we faced. Uh, we'll briefly touch base on nutrition and children's eye health, uh, and then talk about some professional society guidelines and recommendations before coming to a close. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, um, has had a substantial impact uh, in our world, um, ranging from health to economics to um, socio-cultural um, uh, platforms, uh, it has dramatically changed um, how we practice medicine and practice life. Um, I'd like to talk about um, Dr. Wen Liang uh, for uh, just a little bit. Um, he was the first doctor to um, notify the Chinese authorities um, of the coronavirus. Um, he was seeing new patients in his clinic um, that had different manifestations of eye diseases that he hadn't really seen. Um, unfortunately, he succumbed to the disease um, along with uh, many other healthcare workers in the setting. Um, but given that I am a trainee ophthalmologist, I just wanted to um, honor him and uh, the healthcare workers uh, whose legacies we uh, continue uh, to honor. Um, looking at some numbers by the World Health Organization, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, had a total of 386 million cases in the world um, with the last update of February 4th. That is a tremendous number when we think about it. Um, over 5 million people have died from this disease. Masks, international travel bans, and a variety of other um, problems um, have arose during this time, um, and governments had to impose uh, significant bans in order to control the disease. We can see from the geographic map that um, it has mainly been focused uh, in certain countries like the US uh, and Russia, um, but it is virtually in almost every country um, when we look at uh, especially the major countries. Um, this has unfortunately led to significant burden in the healthcare system. Um, several rural hospitals um, and even some urban ones have forced uh, to recruit trainees into hospitals, and some have even gone bankrupt because of um, how much the pandemic has affected both the economic situation um, and the availability of healthcare workers. Um, this was a CNN article um, that was written in 2021 um, of how it impacted hundreds of different rural hospitals in the United States. In response to this, uh, certain healthcare uh, services um, had to be remodeled, uh, and this was a great uh, paper on restructuring emergency eye services. People had to be seen and triaged in certain settings and made sure that the emergent uh, was seen first and then the urgent and the routine. Um, virtual ophthalmology became um, a huge thing in our uh, community um, as more and more uh, trainees and uh, physicians uh, had to work uh, from a remote setting uh, and that we had to uh, control um, how our patients' um, disease were progressing. Uh, so virtual ophthalmology became a very hot topic, but unfortunately continued to exacerbate disparities in eye care utilization uh, with different rural hospitals um, and communities receiving care differently. Among all of this, um, where does child's eye health fit in? Do uh, virtual care um, platforms exist? Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, first of all, um, eye health, when we think about it in children, is a key factor for quality of life. When we think of children, they are constantly observing uh, the outdoors and their surroundings uh, and getting visual stimulation to their brain. So not only is visual health important 
for vision related quality of life, but it also affects cognitive well being uh, and social interactions. Uh, it has been shown in several studies to be a strong predictor of academic and future performance. Um, this um, randomized clinical trial published in JAMA Ophthalmology showed that school-based vision programs uh, were key in identifying visual problems and if treated, um, having a great impact um, on the children's well-being. Um, it also has substantial economic costs. Um, children's vision impairment and disorders account for almost $10 billion of spending per year on the U.S. healthcare system, with families shouldering 45% of this cost, not to mention the um, cultural and the uh, emotional um, and mental component um, of these disorders. Unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, our, our children were outside playing and interacting with our environment, um, but what was once was uh, is now like this on the right side of the picture uh, where um, parents are reluctant to send their children outside to play, um, fearing that they uh, will either catch the virus or um, even worse, um, spread it um, to the remainder of the household. This has led to significant changes uh, in how we uh, see eye disease in children. Uh, when we think about the normal eye, I want to introduce the concept of good vision. Uh, in a normal eye, we see uh, the books, the apple, and the board very clearly. Um, in an amblyopic eye um, or in a lazy eye, um, these eyes unfortunately do not develop properly because of poor visual stimulation and that the brain basically cancels out that eye. And amblyopia is a huge concern uh, in children, um, hence why I started uh, with uh, this condition. Uh, and unfortunately, if not treated early, can result in irreversible vision loss as we see in this picture where everything is basically blurry. Strabismus or misaligned eyes uh, is another disease uh, that um, needs to be caught early in children uh, in order to prevent amblyopia. Um, as you can see, different um, eyes can be facing in different directions, and this can result in visual deprivation uh, and uh, loss of those neural circuits uh, that go into the brain. These need to be caught very early and be treated. Myopia or uh, nearsightedness is a disease on its own. And we'll be focusing on this a little bit more in our talk later. Myopia, as most people know, um, is a disease where um, the near objects um, appear um, very clearly, but um, the far objects are unfortunately very blurry. Um, as you can see uh, in this graph um, published by the um, Prevent Blindness Association, uh, we see this significantly more in Asian populations um, as they get older. Complex genetic traits along with environmental factors play a key, ro key role um, in the development and progression um, of myopia. Another um, disease uh, is astigmatism, um, which is a result of irregular curvature um, of the front of the eye um, that results in complete blurriness uh, regardless of distance. And same with myopia, uh, we see a complex interaction of genetics and environment at play uh, where um, specifically Asian and Hispanic populations um, have a significant um, increase in the prevalence of astigmatism uh, with Hispanic kids as young as six months um, having almost 15, 16% um, prevalence. I get the question, is myopia that bad a lot? And I want to put this in the context of the pandemic. Myopia um, is much more than glasses. Um, we can see on the left upper side, um, a very familiar scene of children uh, being very close uh, to the screen and having more screen time as a result of the pandemic. This results in dynamic changes to the eye. Um, this is a great picture um, of the first eye as, as we can trace from here um, that is emetropic or does not have myopia. So it does not have any refractive error. And one that has about 15 diopters of myopia, which is considered pretty significant um, on the outer side. 
we can see that the eye has grown significantly um, in myopia. And this is because of the eye's interaction with the environment. As our environment comes closer and we're constantly looking at screens or we're indoors, the eye thinks that that is the surrounding that it will have uh, for a long period of time. So it tries to adapt to make sure that you see those near objects very well, but that is at the expense of losing sight um, at the far periphery. This unfortunately uh, results in significant damage to the eye. As the eye grows, um, the retina, which is the uh, neural, um, neural tissue that uh, receives input from the surroundings and sends it uh, to the brain um, starts thinning and we get the risk of retinal detachments and tears. This is analogous to um, stretching a paper as it gets um, more and more taut. It, um, unfortunately zaps at one point. As the retina thins, um, certain areas of the eye also thin, uh, and we see tissue damage um, in very severe myopia. So when parents ask, oh, is myopia that bad? I tend to say, yes, it can be um, if it is not stopped um, or um, if it's not diagnosed early. We've seen uh, the rates of myopia increase significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this was an early study uh, from uh, young Chinese school children uh, during the outbreak where they measured um, spherical refractions, so um, how much myopia they have, along with the length of the eye or the axial length um, in grade three students. They had a non-exposure group from uh, November and December of 2019 um, who were um, outside and not part of the pandemic. And then the November and December of 2020 or the exposure group um, who were um, indoors and having more online learning classes. And as we can see here, um, the percentage um, of uh, prevalence of myopia between the two groups um, was about 8%. And this was a significant increase. Um, we also saw uh, the progression of myopia in school age children after COVID home confinement. Um, this was a study looking at many years of primary school students, uh, age six to 13 years, uh, during the six years of screening. And we can see that um, the spherical equivalence, uh, which is how bad uh, the myopia is, um, was quite steady to maybe slightly worsening uh, before the pandemic, but then hit a significant turn uh, where both um, boys and girls um, had a significant increase in myopia. This was more pronounced in ages six through nine compared to ages 10 to 13, um, as you can see qualitatively on the graph. This makes sense because children at this age um, have more uh, dynamic responses inside the eye, hence why school recesses and outdoor activity is so key. We've also seen um, online time increase and outdoor time decrease during the pandemic. Um, these were two great studies published in ophthalmology and the American Journal of Ophthalmology um, that looked at um, different grades of students uh, and how uh, the myopia progressed pre and post COVID. Uh, and you can see that there was a significant increase uh, in the spherical equivalent, uh, which is worsening myopia um, in this table and how online time significantly increased uh, in both grades uh, and how the outdoor time decreased uh, significantly, especially for the um, stage two kids um, who were a little older. So not only the rates were higher for grades one to six, as we see here, um, but there was more online time and less outdoor time, which was likely associated with this change. But we know that um, outdoor activity can actually reduce the prevalence of myopia in children as well. Um, this was a phenomenal study that looked at uh, the association between near work and outdoor activity and the odds ratio of developing myopia. And we can see that as we get higher outdoor times and lower near work times, uh, we actually saw a significant decrease uh, in the odds of developing myopia. 
there was um, a randomized control trial looking at outdoor light intensity in myopia prevention. Um, this was a very large group um, that um, separated school kids uh, based on recess outside classroom and a control group that did not go outside during recess time. And um, amazingly, um, they were able to show that the new incidence of myopia was 35% um, less. Um, and this was um, quite substantial um, compared to um, the control group um, and the percentage of myopic shift also decreased. So more outdoor recess um, is associated with less myopia. When we think about um, refractive errors, um, we also need to think about problems in care coordination. And this actually applies to many other fields of medicine, um, but has been specifically important in ophthalmology um, just because of how, uh, how key the time frame is uh, in diagnosing these disorders in children um, and the short period of time we have to treat it. Um, this is from adult data, um, but about four in 10 US adults uh, reported avoiding medical care because of concerns related to COVID um, with delay and um, delay in urgent and emergent care associated with people with disabilities, such as visual impairment. Um, these people are key to see in our clinics, um, yet uh, they are um, reasonably scared um, of uh, COVID-19. Um, that's where telehealth really came in. But even with that, uh, we were unfortunately missing some people and we are seeing pretty severe disease in our clinics at this time because of this. Um, there was another study that was um, published by the um, SHADAC um, that analyzed the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare access. And it saw that about uh, one third um, of the 58% um, that changed access um, had a provider cancellation and about 15% um, self-canceled the appointment uh, with over a fifth delaying care. Um, all of these um, were significant problems um, in both children and in adults. And I want to just stop and highlight how important an annual exam is to a child. Um, we've been talking about various statistics, um, but just to recap, uh, one in four children um, have a vision problem, uh, whether that is undiagnosed myopia. Um, about 60% of children with learning difficulties have an undetected visual problem. That's why um, school screenings are so important in children. Um, and this can result in um, social uh, delinquency and difficulties in interacting with people. 70% um, of delinquents had an undetected and untreated vision problem. So this is not just a health-based problem, um, it is a societal-based problem. Um, vision impacts sports performance, uh, and most of what we give to children in schools are presented visually. So it is very important to make sure that children get the eye exams that they need. And when they don't, we unfortunately see significant problems. Um, this was a study published by the Global Retinoblastoma Study Group, which I am a part of, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, where we reported um, different modalities available um, in different treatment centers. Retinoblastoma is a um, very serious um, eye tumor in children. It is the most common um, intraocular primary tumor um, in kids. Uh, and what we saw was that the examination under anesthesia modality, which is used to diagnose retinoblastoma and examine it in most cases, um, had a 42% decrease in availability um, across the world. We saw decreases in enucleation and intravenous chemotherapy with enucleation being removal of the eye due to a tumor um, and um, different chemotherapy regimens um, with intravenous and intraarterial chemotherapy showing a three and a 24% decrease respectively. So these children were having tumors and continuing um, all that um, we were doing and unfortunately had this huge gap in their treatment that resulted in severe disease. 
I want to briefly touch base on nutrition um, and children's eye health. Um, this is a question that I get very often. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, even though we know that it is crucial, um, there is no direct research that links specific nutrients um, and children's eye health in kids. Um, there's no specific societal recommendations, but we know that a healthy diet with antioxidants uh, and a balanced diet overall um, is key for um, development in children. Um, antioxidants um, can be found um, richly in leafy green vegetables, beans, um, salmon, um, and other citrus fruits. And we know that vitamins play a key role in eye health overall because we prescribe them. Um, so the ARETS2 formulation um, that you see here um, is a common uh, treatment agent uh, for age-related macular degeneration um, that is of medium or high severity. Um, there are um, varying guidelines um, in prescribing these treatments, but we think that uh, these treatments um, have a substantial impact uh, in um, slowing down the rate of age-related macular degeneration. And this has been shown in several large clinical trials and has been standard of care at this point. We unfortunately don't have similar data in children, um, but the fact that we give these to adults um, is a strong indication that um, a healthy diet uh, with many antioxidants would be beneficial for children. Um, I want to touch base on vision screening guidelines since we talked about school-based uh, screening so much. Um, the US Preventative Services Task Force uh, recommends screening children at least once between ages three to five years um, with the American Academy of Pediatrics and Ophthalmology recommending um, additional um, ages. Um, and if you notice, um, most of these years um, are times where um, the child eye growth is um, quite important in terms of preventing those uh, amblyopia and other problems that we mentioned. Um, these people are quite young. Uh, any abnormal vision screening should be referred for a comprehensive exam. This is so important. Uh, when these children are identified, they need an evaluation by an ophthalmologist or an optometrist uh, to make sure that they are diagnosed and are followed up. I also get asked a lot about screen time uh, and how much uh, screens uh, should be given to children. Um, this has unfortunately skyrocketed uh, in the event of the pandemic, uh, and the American Academy of Pediatrics and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry issued a joint statement um, with a great visual um, that we have below. Uh, with 18 months or younger, um, they do not recommend any screens um, unless it is to be with family uh, and friends, so more social interaction-based screen time. Um, up to two years, um, they say limit screen time, or um, if you do have screen time, choosing high quality educational programming is beneficial. Uh, from two to five years, um, about an hour a day in the weekdays, and up to three hours on the weekends is generally the recommendation. And then six or older um, to be placed consistent limits um, and uh, types of social media uh, spent. This is important because uh, screen time can affect sleep, exercise, and uh, limit outdoor time. Uh, so it's important to make sure that um, our children are um, getting the outdoor exposure that they need. Um, for parents, um, there are um, a few different recommendations. Uh, visual engagement in children uh, is very important. So making sure that they are seeing their surroundings, that they're interacting with you in the environment is key. Um, parents are generally the first people to identify eye problems. Um, know the Glow is a, a nonprofit foundation um, based in the US uh, that uh, aims to uh, improve education on glow diseases. Um, something that uh, we see in this child, for example, um, is a white eye. And this is generally recognized by um, parents or other relatives when they take a picture or when they look inside the eye. Um, and glow diseases do include retinoblastoma, the most common intraocular cancer that we talked about in children. So this child might have a cancer um, that is untreated. And 
80% of these aren't detected by family. So keeping an eye out for the child is so important. Making sure that kids wear adequate eye protection uh, when they're doing certain activities, encouraging healthy screen time and attending regular eye exams are all um, parts that uh, parents uh, can play. So in summary, um, the pandemic has had a significant impact on children's eye health. When we look at the economic impact, uh, its uh, sociological impact, um, it has unfortunately transformed um, the way that we uh, see and diagnose um, children's eye diseases. Um, telemedicine um, is a phenomenal platform that is growing, even though it hasn't been um, tested and used as frequently in children, um, I think it is um, growing really quickly. Um, we've been uh, seeing some uh, great results in uh, kids who are newborns uh, and diagnosing them uh, through um, telemedicine, um, but it is something that the pediatric eye health community uh, is slowly um, incorporating. Myopia is unfortunately on the rise, and this in itself is um, an epidemic. Um, we're seeing significant increases across the world, and um, we are scared that this will lead to more retina problems, more detachments, tears, uh, and other problems um, that we will face um, as a profession in the future. Children need more outdoor time. Uh, parents have been saying that all the time, but research has shown this as well. School recesses are beneficial if spent outside. After school activities, if they involve um, outdoor time is beneficial. And we need to find alternatives to screen time uh, in kids, um, whether that is uh, incorporating uh, more time uh, spent with friends outdoors in safe environments, um, or um, things that we can do um, indoors that um, do not involve uh, constantly looking at um, a screen at a few um, centimeters of distance. A balanced diet is important for vision, even though um, no direct link has been established in children. And when in doubt, I always say discuss all concerns with the pediatrician because every child is different. Even though the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact in eye health in these children, um, every child develops and progresses differently. Um, so making sure that um, you report everything um, that you are um, afraid of to the pediatrician, whether that is increased screen time um, or um, changes in dietary activity um, would be beneficial. Um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Frederick uh, for providing me some of uh, his slides. Uh, he's one of our uh, myopia experts at KCI Institute. Um, and um, Dr. Hubbard, who has been an invaluable mentor to me uh, and um, allowed me to be involved in the Global Retinoblastoma Study Group. Um, here uh, is my uh, contact information. If you would like to email me or um, discuss anything over social media, um, I'm quite active as um, an advocate and uh, making sure that we um, educate everyone um, about eye diseases uh, and um, everyone who's involved. Um, so uh, feel free to contact me um, and thank you so much for your attention.
Öner'e çok teşekkür ederek Profesör Hünkar Korkmaz'a gidelim. Want to thank you all Öner and without any further ado we want to move on to Profesör Hünkar Korkmaz. She is from Hacettepe University and she is currently the chief of the Educational Sciences and Methodologies Department. Uh, welcome, Professor. Thank you, Semiha. It's a great joy to be with you today. Well, across uh, the conference, I really loved the way you approach, uh, uh, and I hope that you will continue joining us in future conferences. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, we have gone through, and we are still in the pandemic. It's not over yet. Our life has changed. People, students could not attend uh, school. There were there was remote schooling, and there were lots of issues. How can we help them? Not just during the pandemic. Sormak gerek. Öyle değil But mi? don't you think we need to ask children what they want? Well, thank you. It was uh, a, a nice opening and and emphasizing the, the wishes of the students uh, is important because we are not only mandated to protect children at times of crisis as educators and parents because we always say that children are our future and they are the guarantor of our future the healthier we raise them the better we train them we will be uh, protecting the future And the better we employ them, that this will also bring economic development. But then the pandemic has raised uh, our awareness. Well, ever since the past, uh, we we knew it, but we can now uh, understand it better. We so and during my presentation, I will talk about uh, what changed during the pandemic and what what will happen next. And this, of course, this is in the context of school-based learning and curriculum. Let me just give you an overview of my presentation. Measures taken, were the schools ready? Challenges in online training, uh, incomplete training and solutions. Well, in general, when something happens, Uh, and we have issues in human uh, behaviors. We always say, well, education is a must. And Mustafa Kemal Atatürk said, you know, national education is one of our primary tasks. And we can only succeed as a nation if we give a high quality education. And Mandela says, education is the only weapon to change the world. Tanzania former president says education is not a way to eliminate poverty it's a way to fight poverty and Kennedy said our national progress is related with our progress in education and Malcolm X says education is your passport to the future Our constitution, article number 42, says nobody can be deprived of learning and education. Education is a fundamental human right. You can uh, ask for it. And, and no democratic country will deprive their children from their fundamental right to get education. And uh, as current You know, Turkey also signed the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, and, our, and item number four is quality education. Turkey has committed to that, and we said we will uh, dedicate all required efforts. This says until 2030, all children will have access to free, egalitarian, and high-quality primary and secondary school. Egalitarian fair, free, and especially for the for primary and secondary school, we will guarantee a high quality education. And Turkey has signed this declaration. So what happened? 
Well, unfortunately, sending girls to school is a challenge. Increasing compulsory education duration is a challenge. Are we offering fair and equal education opportunities to all kids? Well, we have been struggling. And today we are in danger of losing all these rights. Unfortunately, because during the pandemic, people, uh, people quit school, especially girls quit school. And unfortunately, uh, communities who were reluctant to send their kids to school are now using it as an excuse. And it was complicated to meet these goals, even in the best times. But oh, the lockdown and closing down schools made things even worse. Unfortunately for Turkey, we do not have a you know f a numbers or, or reports and the ngos like T turkish uh, society of doctors and others and several ngos have reports on this matter and they have been addressing what uh, to discuss And based on these conferences, one of the biggest problems are, I mean, are, are, are, do we te train our students? Well, the ministry tried to do this. Do children have access to healthy diet? Physical activities are enough. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, in, in, you know, the number of cases are peaking and children are affected. Do, do we have enough water? Is there a safer way to commute to school? Can parents help uh, homework of school? The, and maybe the, may, the, the household needs more income and therefore the children are working instead of going to school. The first uh, a, announced case was in Turkey was in March, and then we had a recess, but then we did not open the schools, but we chose remote education. So we lost 62 days without education. So what happened? Universities and campuses were closed. All education were made online. On June 7, we, we had a national exam, but then we moved it two, two months and we, we also said to students, you won't be responsible for some of the courses. Uh, closing down borders also limited international movements, so international collaboration activities either stopped or were damaged in 2021. On the first semester, on August 31st, we announced a face-to-face -face education, but because of soaring a number of cases, we postponed it. And on September 21, we started, but then on stages and certain grades went to the school. And on the fourth level, all students, uh, were back to school, but all of a sudden, because of the rising number of cases, everyone went back to remote learning. So in 2021, students did not go to school, I mean, face to face. On the second semester, we had, you know, uh, we wanted to make it in stages, but it was mostly online. So we did not have uh, a full attendance at all levels. In the meantime, as we were closing down the schools and offering remote schooling, and we know the total screen time of students, but the curriculum did not change. Our current curriculum was developed for a face-to-face -face training, and we had to implement the same curriculum for online training. The ministry said, okay, uh, uh, I will help uh, compensation. <clears throat> they planned scientific social uh, activities and 
and they also made a, a law and they limited the annual leaves of um, teachers with one month only and said you will continue teaching your students uh, uh, you know the, the makeup classes so when you want to change something uh, you you need to know what people will accept, you know, physically, you know, socially. You know, Maslow has a hierarchy pyramid of needs. You know, you know, it, that on the top we have self-realization. However, it has changed. Now, nutrition, health, access to correct, accurate information, communicating with parents and teacher-student interaction replaced the former needs because when people are hungry you and when when they cannot meet their physiological needs when they, i mean when they are wasted you cannot expect much that is the most fundamental need we, we, without meeting the fundamental needs you cannot uh, add up anything else a lot of people lost their jobs and because of uh, misinformation the needs and their priorities have changed minister of education you know when the schools were closed and when the when all the expectations changed ministry of education you know discussed what are important in, a, in every school that was a recess we could not uh, we do not uh, implement the curriculum so uh, the ministry said let's identify the critical learning outcomes and focus on them you know we have a process I mean, we have a project in collaboration with Saburu care foundations uh, diet and nutrition research institute uh, and and the ministry we have identified that especially in the lower grades you know, personal hygiene, protecting health, choosing healthy diet, uh, observing personal hygiene, following, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, some, some rules or um, you know, the, the code during eating and sa safe commute, commute to the school, who to call in times of emergency, safe use of communication means and identifying safe and unsafe areas and until first second and third grade even on the fourth grade that the children did not gain these outcomes unfortunately when when children grow as, as children grow uh, the, the curriculum focuses on academic outcomes but not on those other uh, learning outcomes so what we have in the world, 5 million students uh, could not access remote schooling. This is a part of the United Nations report. 35% of all schools, primary schools, don't have even, uh, you know, uh, an, a fundamental, you know, uh, hand washing uh, facility. You know, you may build a fantastic curriculum. You may have the, uh, a great uh, education system, but if you don't assure, uh, you know, quality and well-being of your teachers, unfortunately, it is it's not worth. You now, like you're traveling on a plane, the first thing you need is, you know, they say, first wear your mask and then attend to your child. So same thing, if we don't evolve parents, and teachers in this process, if we do not care for the well-being of parents and teachers as much as we care for students, we cannot succeed. Turkey doesn't have this report, this teacher well-being report, but in England, an education support organization has been publishing this. Since 2014, uh, they have been releasing uh, this publication. The, the most striking rip data was revealed in 2020 and 2021. 77% of all teachers said they have 
symptoms for uh, psychological disorders. 72% says they are under stress. And as they move on to executive levels, their stress level increased to 84%. 46% of teachers say they do, they do not feel bad, but they had to continue their job. 42% say uh, their employers and, and their jobs have negative effect in their well-being. And 54% that in the past two years, they thought about quitting uh, education industry. So. These numbers uh, may, that does not permit a quality education environment because a quality education system can only function with the teachers, but the teachers don't have, have it. How about the other negative impacts? Like online lessons cause Zoom fatigue. And then people who have ease of access to internet and those who don't, uh, they, there's a huge gap between them. And the cognitive, social, and emotional uh, experiences are lost on online classes. There's a lot of incomplete teaching and it, it, teaching profession is now overloaded with stress and it is not no more a you know, a shiny uh, career path. Uh, one of my colleagues have shared, I think Mr. Suleyman Sabi Seferolo said, children have forgotten to walk and to run. That's what the teachers are saying. The pandemic have increased, you know, uh, equal, I mean, the, op the, the, the gap in opportunities and access, especially for the marginal groups. What were the benefits? Well, we have developed creative ways to maintain education at all conditions. We offered flexibility to students, you know, hybrid forms. And then uh, the community and parent involvement increased, especially in private schools. And in my opinion, as a curriculum developer, uh, the incomplete learning uh, is the most critical challenge. You know, uh, you know, in some publications, they, they use the term uh, lost learning or lost education, but I say incomplete. You know, in a routine curriculum year, students uh, are not given opportunity to complete their classes. We don't offer it. You know, normally we, we should be offering them an experience. We are not offering them this uh, greater experience. So that means we are causing an incomplete learning. So you may think about cognitive uh, learning or, you know, going by the book. No, I'm not talking about that. Because school is not just a place where students are exposed to the definitions of an atom or history or something. In the school, there are emotions, psychomotor and sensory uh, development. Anything and everything an individual will be exposed in life uh, is experienced to a certain extent in school. So, and now we are, uh, children have risks uh, to not to graduate or failing to graduate. And this curriculum does not support the students in terms of successfully going through the pandemic. And I know my students, they are uh, baffled and they have, uh, they are concerned about the future. And, you know, we have the power to inspire them. We have the power to enable them. And I always say that, well, Hünkar, you know, can you give this uh, flower pot behind uh, Semiha? But if you ask my necklace, I can give it to you because I, if I'm healthy, I can convince my uh, children to remain healthy. If I can hold on to life, I can uh, persuade them to hold on. So incomplete training is not only about academic tutoring. 
it's not about just communicating things on on zoom the more active a teacher the more active her students will be the better she grasps uh, a curriculum topic the better the students will so this proves how a role model we have become there are very important uh, research reports unfortunately we don't have a data about the lost education, I mean, this uh, loss of education or incomplete uh, ed education. In America, an NGO and a curriculum associate uh, says, I'm ready. And they, they did the study on 1.6 million primary school kids in more than 40 states. They compared the math and reading skills of the kids with, you know, two years ago, with the kids two years ago, and they compared their scores. Unfortunately, math in math, 10 points, and in reading, students are nine points behind. And this gap grows for in rural areas or in colored group or in Latinos, it's, it's even more. And the social and the lower socioeconomic level of the family goes, the gap grows. And then the Stanford University Credo, that's Credo Center for Research, their study revealed that uh, the reading skills of students drop by 30% and math skills will drop by 50%. In Germany, and there's an interesting study it says. You know, during times of lockdown, you know, before that, students will have 7.4 hours on average in school activities. Now it is 3.6. And, and on, on the phone, they, they spend 5.2 hours on average a day, but then they sit. It's a passive consumption. And in Germany, it says we help our kids uh, financially, but uh, in terms of digital skills, we don't, we could not provide equality and uh, equal access. I mean, the world has similar problems, similar uh, issues. Uh, in, in Germany, only 6% of students on, attend to, uh, you know, uh, Current, you know, online classes, 2% joined once or none. And the lower the family's level goes, the, the, the gap grows. In England also, it says a student on the third grade in seven years later. So it, in seven years, if you continue like this, the total loss of education will be one and a half years. In Belgium also, there's a study that says, you know, uh, there's, there's a huge loss. And in Holland also, you know, lower social economic classes are losing more. And World Bank says this doesn't only apply to your national exams, but also on the international exams, this will be seen. So in all these re researches uh, prove that, you know, reading and cognitive uh, you know, skills were assessed, and unfortunately, you know, vulnerable groups uh, are, you know, in worse situation. What have we done in Turkey? In Turkey, Ministry of Education analyzed, uh, you know, losses in education, and for uh, 7, 8, 11, and 12 grade students were assessed in terms of uh, you know, lost in learning, but then findings are not revealed and act we don't have an action plan. So we need a data-based governance system and we don't have a database for education. We have a lot of research reports, but we don't have a, a consolidated database to see all of these researches. So we don't have a data-based uh, system. So what are my recommendations? Well, Emergency does not mean just opening or closing schools. 
and saving uh, education does not mean you know uh, saving the day it's about designing a long-term future and we need a holistic approach and involvement of all stakeholders and uh, our teachers had huge concerns on what to do and the entire semester has ended and on on the fall semester you know the ministry announced changes but uh, you know uh, all the, um, but then we need i wish we had flexibility for teachers to get prepared and and the digital literacy of of teachers are now more important we have to train the future teachers in a more digital uh, li digital literate way we have to make this happen because i have heard a lot that you know remote learning uh, kills creativity and and reflective or thinking no i disagree like you you are talking about geometry and you can ask uh, why why do you think are the the, the huge uh, you know uh, covers are not triangle or rectangular but they are round or or the the cans why, why are they round or the coordinates you know this child can be a pilot or a captain or or, or even maybe a a butler in, in a theater but they still need coordinates we need these you know different numbers but we we calculate all those stars and everything with uh, numbers and then you know why why do you think the letters of an ambulance are in reverse because you will see that on the rear mirror like in painting class a homework for 10 10 grade you know reflection on mirror you know stand in front of the mirror and paint your you know draw your own figure or you know try to lace your shoes and in every you know in every lesson in every class we have different creative ways of teaching online and even on remote uh, and distance learning students have a chance to experience and share and here is a photo from 1962 and uh, this is a publication in Italy and they had this feature imagined people are in their individual cars now look at uh, the classrooms the classrooms are more or less the same as imagined in 1960s the architecture of school buildings has become more important their ventilation the distances between the desks and hygiene conditions all of them and their uh, sizes have become so important in finland there is an expertise about school architecture i know our architecture departments focus on that but we need more professional approach to school architecture and make sure that our buildings uh, are aligned with, with universal standards and and we need to redesign our buildings for potential future lockdowns because a lot of parents don't want to send their kids to school because of safety and health concerns and teachers should not be asking why am i here but they should be asking what is how, how how can i translate this into life you know the inputs outputs and the results and education systems and uh, and and the and the systems should move from a factory metaphor to a nomad platform if there are inputs and outputs, if we if there is unwanted output, we can dispose it. We can ignore it. It can be, a, you know, it, it can be a kind of error. But now we don't think like that. Let's go to Italy, travel together, 
some of us will remember how the streets smell and some will remember colors and some remembers the taste education is like that it, every this pandemic is like a journey so consider this as a journey forcing the same curriculum to every student is not fair we need more individualized more customized curriculum especially for the vulnerable communities you know from vienna university shema mentioned that we need to identify strategies properly we added the uh, students to the i mean we force our students to join exams and to, to win something but this increases anxiety unfortunately we need to use the results uh, as an input to a kind of system and uh, and then you know the income gap uh, changes the success and this can further alienate and isolate our students and indeed measure and assessment is like reading a thermometer a thermometer may read uh, your body fever but we need further diagnosis to understand the root cause and uh, we need doctors to provide proper care and therapy so yes we are measuring we have the numbers but what is next what are the reasons why students fail and how can we treat this do we have teachers to give the remedy do we have professionals that's critical i think my time is almost up let me wrap up you know uh, these are the factors for future uh, education system technology natural disasters uh, climate immigration mobilization political systems changing business life demographics and changing values so we the curriculum developers i have my you know students in the undergraduate or graduate i say we develop curriculum and we shouldn't be developing curriculum just for today we need to anticipate the future because today's students will be teaching for the future we have to solve the problems of the future Well, we see that almost all uh, teachers uh, will have to employ that kind of futuristic perspective. So why were we here today? Learning and teaching will shape the future of humanity and this uh, world. The future is not here yet, and we cannot anticipate the future without understanding today, the present time. We need to prepare our young people to acquire the required competences for this new uh, world. We have to prepare them uh, to face uh, the challenges of the future because we cannot uh, train uh, and teach children with the principles of yesterday but they will be the ones who will solve the problems. So children will be managing and, and, and controlling the future. A better world for our children and a world, a better world for our children. So we need to preserve the well-being of our children mentally and physically. Thank you for your time and for your attention. But the greatest uh, thanks goes to the support uh, for the support of the Far Sabri Ulkar Foundation and for making this possible on behalf of the uh, scientific world and my colleagues and my institution. I really uh, thank you for making this happen and also to the technical team. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a very uh, enlightening presentation. You had honored me uh, in the beginning of the presentation and I like to thank you for this that was a very fluent presentation indeed and i was uh, very uh, much moved i uh, listened to you uh, heartily thank you
Now we are moving to uh, Spain. Professor Alicia Sainz Bautista will be uh, with us uh, from the Extremadura University. She will be soon with us. So we are coming to close. Uh, we have a guest from Spain, Alicia uh, Senes. As we all know, the pandemic has changed the whole world, and there were a number of countries uh, that changed their education system. So Spain was one of those countries. So our professor will be uh, explaining what uh, has changed in Spain. So the screen is yours. Thank you very much for the for the presentation. Um, uh, as you said, I'm Dr. Cianes Bautista. And first of all, I would like to thank the organization committee of this Congress for inviting me uh, in order to, to participate as a member of this uh, wonderful panel with all the, the experts. I'm really glad to be here and share this space with both the audience and of course the, the rest of the panelists. Um, well, um, as, uh, as you can see, um, my contribution is how the pandemic changed school education, um, specifically the, the Spanish experience. So um, the structure of the presentation would be divided in all these, um, these, um, these parts. I will briefly start with, uh, with an introduction that we may all be familiarized with. Afterwards, I will explain the objective of this contribution. I will uh, briefly explain some basic aspects about the Spanish context in order to understand better the, the situation here. And later I will talk about what is happening to education right now in the Spanish context in primary and secondary education, basically. We are about to analyze which are the current challenges in education education right now and I will finish with uh, some brief conclusions and of course future perspective. So um, yeah let's begin with some uh, introductory 
information. We all know that during the, the, this pandemic, due to COVID-19, challenges have emerged worldwide in relation to multiple and multiple, as well as heterogeneous areas and fields of expertise. Education has been one of them, but not just one of them. It's one of the most affected areas that worries worldwide. So um, it is a field it is necessary to continue uh, working on, doing research, uh, working in order to, to improve the state of education um, in, the, in the pandemic. So what's the main objective of my contribution? Well, it would be sharing the challenges, latest developments and future perspective in relation to education during this pandemic in the, in the Spanish context. As I said, I would like to explain a bit how, um, how Spain or the Kingdom of Spain is organized. We are uh, politically a parliamentary constitutional monarchy um, Spain is a country that has more than uh, 47 million inhabitants. And as you can see here in the map, uh, we are part of the European continental territory. Plus we have the Balearic Islands uh, right here in the, in the right. Plus the Canary Islands, which are in the Atlantic Ocean. But that's why they are in, in a box plus uh, two cities in the, in the African continental country, which are Ceuta and Melilla. So uh, in the end, we have 17 uh, autonomous communities, plus two is two uh, small autonomous cities. That means that in Spain, um, it's not everything centralized, but we have some autonomy in, this, in these areas. So, yeah, that's uh, the main information you have to know. So right now, um, what is happening to, to education? Well, um, it depends on the levels, of course, but there are some measurements that in primary education and secondary education were implemented due to this pandemic. For example, they created a specific COVID-19 commission at schools and high schools. Um, they were doing some actions before school opening and they were organizing how everything was about to, to be organized when we were about to go back to normal or the new normality that we talk about. They planned very carefully the daily school entry and exit they, um, when I say they, in this case, I mean schools and people that, works, uh, that work at schools. They organized the school entry for family and other external ad agents. Um, they changed the classroom disposition and common spaces. For example, in, in primary education, children ten tended to be uh, together in small groups or in couples, and that's not possible anymore due to the sanitary conditions. They also created these bubble groups uh, with, with students in order to control um, the, the students that were positive and all of that. They also were working on personal prevention measurements for reducing contact with people. Um, they worked very hard in health promotion and education. Um, they uh, organized movement uh, allowances between students and teachers during school time, the organization and, dis and distribution of education materials and didactic, and didactic resources was also changed and adapted to the, to the new situation. Um, the adaptation to online teaching under exceptional circumstances was uh, a pretty important challenge that we faced. Also, we were uh, focusing on hygienic cleaning and disinfection of spaces and personal protection. 
um, they created guidelines and recommendations both for both teachers and students and also family at higher risk from COVID-19. They made specific actions for complementary services like school transportation, like school cafeterias, like mm, everything. Also, the use of toilets were, was controlled and how to proceed if there are suspicious or confirmed COVID-19 cases at schools. They were, uh, teachers were, um, were the responsible of, of informing families about all this information. And they finally created a, a system of monitoring and evaluation in order to know how, um, how all of this was working. So here we can see a, uh, a lot of, uh, of sanitary and organizational measurements, but they were, but there were absolutely no curricular challenges. It's true that we had more flexibility, for example, but education itself, the contents didn't change at all, not in secondary education, nor in primary education. So I think that's a thing we, we should think about too. Uh, yes, uh, some, of, some of these uh, organization uh, measurements were uh, working with the, with the windows opened. Um, and in Spain, there are some places where it tends to be very, very cold during the winter and very, very hot during the summer. So that could that could affect the the learning and, and teaching uh, processes both for teachers and students also it was it is compulsory to wear to wear masks during the lessons so there's also a, a loss of um, of um, of nonverbal communication at schools right now of course, the, the use of hydrological uh, gel, and also they they put some stickers with, uh, yeah, these kind of stickers uh, on the floor in order to follow to follow the um, the ways one way or or two ways uh, floors, for example. Yeah, those were the one of the. Mm, most relevant or more visible uh, measurements that we made. But this situation give, uh, gave, um, uh, gave us the opportunity to see and to evaluate the, the challenges, the current challenges that education is, is facing in Spain. For example, um, I would like to, to highlight two of them right here. One of them would be the appropriate use of technology and the other one would be the prioritization and innovation. In the first block, in relation to the appropriate use of technology, um, it might be used, it, it might be focused uh, not only on teachers who, who would have to improve this, but also um, in students and families, okay? And the second one would be prioritization and innovation. Uh, with this, I mean, giving priority to some contents among, among others, like for example, new innovation possibilities in relation to resources, the resources that we have and the use that we give to them and also the, the methodologies that we implement during our, during our teaching. But there is also a, a very important thing that I would like to highlight in this, uh, in this space that the Congress gave to me. And it is the, the balance between work and family. It's been two years, uh, in a couple of, week, of weeks would be two years, that families had to organize everything in order to give response to, uh, to, the, to the new needs that emerged in relation to their works, in relation to their families, in relation to school, to education, to everything. So this pandemic brought the day that the balance between work and family um, 
it has been and it is uh, very very hard for families um for example here you can see a picture which is the the mequida plan that's that has been extended until the the end of the of the month until the uh, 28th of february and this plan consists on uh, an allowance um in order to take care of uh, the partner or children or grandparents and grandchildren um, infected with, with COVID symptoms. It gives um, people flexibility in order to work, but they also have the, the policy that if you are a close COVID-19 contact, plus you're vaccinated, plus you have no symptoms, there's no lockdown needed. So you have no paid uh, sick leave. And th this is a problem for many, many families whose children, for example, have COVID-19. Because yeah, they uh, companies, they give the flexibility in order to work, but how are we about to work if we have uh, our partner right next to us, which is, uh, which who has uh, COVID-19 or our children. I mean, the, the probabilities that we are also positive are very high and it is a risk indeed. So now it's, um, it's one of the, the challenges, the, the most important challenges that we are facing right now. And for example, at schools, um, I, I, um, I selected this, uh, this online newspaper that says, um, for example, that uh, uh, children aged uh, with uh, 12 years old or, or less, which means uh, that they have to attend uh, to primary education or secondary education and even early childhood education, who have been a close contact of COVID-19 people are allowed to attend class. So no quarantine is needed for, for these students too. So uh, we can deduce that COVID-19 protocols at schools are not that tough anymore at schools. So um, yeah, in order to, to, to put our class, a whole classroom in lockdown, when all of this began, it was only necessary that one, uh, one child was uh, positive. And right now, they consider four or five uh, positive cases in order to, to put the, the whole class in quarantine. So, yeah, this is a, a fact that is uh, relatively new. Here you can see the, the, the date. Uh, the news um, is for the, from the 14th of January, so less than a month ago. And I think this could be a problem, uh, both a sanitary and educational problem. Why are they doing this? Because they, they know deep inside that education is becoming um, a problem. And it's probably because of this pandemic uh, lacking a lot of um, a lot of uh, necessary uh, skills, for example. So um, yeah, I would like to finish with some conclusions, and I would like you to to invite you to share your experiences or to ask more information because for me, it's easier to explain what have we experienced and what do we have and which challenges are we facing right now. But I would like to invite you to, to ask me for more detailed information or for some specific um, issue that you would like to know, that the audience would like to know. So yeah, in conclusion, um, education procedures are about to change in order to give response to the unexpected needs that the 21st century has brought. Of course, we have to continue improving the weaknesses that surfaced with COVID-19 pandemic, like the ones I've mentioned uh, a couple of minutes before. 
but we still have to wait in order to know with, with certainty what's the definite impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in children, which are about to be adults in the future, in relation to education, to societies, to lifestyles, to emotions, to everything. So, yeah, shukran, and I am available in order to answer all the questions and to discuss all the information you may, you may, you may have. Thank you very much. Evet, Alicia Hanım'a biz de çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Yola devam well, edelim. Well, uh, thank you, Alicia. Uh, that was uh, very enlightening. Let's move on uh, with our next presentation about uh, supporting uh, children's emotional well-being. Dr. Edil Aksöz uh, will be using this. Thank you. Completing my doctoral dissertation at Middle Eastern Technical University in the field of guidance and psychological counseling, I'm working as a psychological counselor at a private health institution in the United States. Today I'm going to talk to you about supporting the emotional and psychological well-being of children and adolescents during the pandemic. So uh, when we talk about such uh, challenging times, I will be talking to you about how we can support uh, their emotional well-being. As we all know, uh, during the present pandemic, the whole world is under a great threat. We are confronted with a kind of unknown and we, we, have, we feel the threat of uh, dying. Uh, and generally speaking, this is a very serious challenge all over the world. We are not talking about social uh, constraints uh, during this process. We have to deal with uh, numerous emotional uh, problems as well, because when confronted with uh, cases where we feel uh, the uh, threat of uh, death, we usually uh, feel a kind of bereavement and a mourning. And children are especially uh, prone to that kind of uh, negative feelings like the pandemic and illness and death. And they have a different sort of putting those concepts into meaning when compared with adults. So that uh, makes it very clear that children might find themselves in a uh, anxiety which is deeper than the one felt by adults around them. So uh, during my presentation I will be sharing a number of suggestions with you as to what can be done to support children in these challenging times. So first uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the uh, concepts of well-being and mourning and then uh, we will cover the developmental stages of children children and their reactions, how should we talk to children, uh, what can we do in the long run, how can families support uh, their children, and of course um, I'm also going to talk about a number of self-care suggestions. So we talk about uh, death, when we talk about the pandemic, of course we are not only talking about death only, and it's not the proper thing to do. But as I have uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning, when we think about the threat of death, all the reactions we produce might be labeled under the framework of mourning. Because when we are confronted with a death, children are affected by that uh, as much as adults do. Children might not have uh, been confronted with a death previously, 
So it, it would be meaningful for us to talk to them and try to explain what uh, this concept is all about. So uh, families need to support their children. They need to build uh, an emotional uh, framework in which children would feel themselves safe. So family support is crucial during these challenging times. So what is mourning? Um, let me begin with this. This is not only related to death, when we are in a kind of challenge or when our lives are under uh, threat, when we lose uh, a loved one or one of our relatives. Uh, mourning uh, as a concept covers emotional, physical, somatic, uh, and behavioral and cognitive uh, reactions. I'm not only talking about uh, adults. The, the concept of mourning and the reactions of mourning can be seen in children as well, but their reactions are somehow uh, different, and I'm going to uh, elaborate on that in a minute. So why do we show uh, reactions of mourning when we are confronted with death? Because uh, the sense of losing our loved ones uh, result in a sense of uh, threat uh, against our lives and it changes our daily routines as well. When we look at uh, the present times, the pandemic has changed our daily routines, excluding none. So all these limitations caused by the pandemic or the social losses are categorized as non-death uh, Threats. So from a developmental perspective, children and adults are, react to these situations differently. They might have different reactions. Why are their reactions different? Because uh, when we talk about individuals, uh, in order for individuals to understand death, they need to understand uh, three uh, concepts, universal, universality uh, and uh, in the uh, universality concept. That means that uh, children need to understand that they will die as well when the time comes. So it's, it's a kind of inevitability. And the uh, second principle is irreversibility, or the, uh, I mean, after uh, death, uh, that person will not be back, but the ch child might still be waiting for her or for him, which means uh, the, ch the child doesn't have the uh, concept of irreversibility and uh, the concept of or the lack of functionality means that uh, dying makes that person, the person who has died, will no longer show uh, life functionalities. They will not uh, talk, they will not miss anyone, they will not feel cold. So all these functions will end. So when the child understands these three concepts and principles, they will somehow come to terms with death and uh, the image uh, uh, as we adults have in relation to death will thus be implemented and built in children as well. So we can also talk about the development of the perception of death based on the de de developmental stages of children. So in the uh, emotional uh, and uh, the sensory motor uh, phase during ages zero and two, uh, death cannot be perceived. Children can only uh, feel uh, the lack of individuals uh, in their immediate surroundings, but irreversibility as a principle doesn't exist. And a uh, pre-processing uh, phase during ages two and six, the sense of death starts to uh, develop and the, the children start to understand that death is something which causes sadness because uh, they can observe and understand the reactions of adults around them in a more competent uh, manner. And during this age, between ages two and six, uh, children might develop uh, some magical and um, 
gözde görülmeyen um, bir virüsün söz konusu olduğu some, çocukların somehow uh, metaphysical uh, beliefs uh, in their uh, minds so such yani reactions yani might be foregrounded uh, how can we example those uh, exemplify those uh, for example they can relate uh, the death uh, of someone uh, with uh, themselves let's say they have quarreled with uh, someone and during the quarrel a child might have shouted at the other child like go away I don't want you I want you to be dead and that child might die soon so that will create a sort of problem uh, in the child who has uttered those words and in the tangible processes uh, phase between ages 6 uh, and 11 a sense of temporality and a sense of time develops uh, children understand the continuity of uh, death and they come to terms with the uh, inevitability and irreversibility of the concept and they might develop fears like what happens after death and there might be some frightening concepts and entities like ghosts uh, and um, concepts related to uh, death. So children might go through problems, especially during the pandemic. The families might have difficulties in explaining things to children because we are talking about something uh, unseen. We are talking about a virus. So they cannot uh, make it concrete uh, in their minds. They cannot conceptualize it. So this might be a challenging. If we look at uh, between ages 11 and 18, uh, where some uh, abstract uh, processing comes onto the stage uh, and children evolve into adults, uh, children can now understand uh, death and uh, related concepts in all their entirety and they start to produce reactions similar to adults. And together with adolescents between ages 11 and 18, children start to think about their own death. There might be behaviors, uh, risk-taking behaviors. I'm going to talk about that uh, as well. But especially during the pandemic, in the case of uh, death and the, dis the uh, disease uh, being seen in people around the child, so uh, children might start uh, thinking about and dreaming about uh, what hap what would happen if they would uh, be uh, sick. In children and in adolescents, if we look at the reactions of mourning, uh, well, we might think that they will not be affected and we might uh, think that children uh, have nothing to do with the uh, feeling and the emotion of mourning. But even in uh, very small children, uh, they might find themselves in situations where they are mimicking the behavior behaviors and reactions of their parents around them, especially in relation to their cognitive development, it's very important to observe mourning reactions in children. So fundamentally speaking, what might happen? We might observe some emotional reactions, depression, hopelessness, anxiety, sense of uh, uh, anger and loneliness. And during the pandemic, it's not only about uh, mourning, but uh, during the pandemic, uh, we, we have uh, such emotional reactions and also a sense of guilt. Uh, we might have a sort of a regression from a behavioral perspective. They might uh, try, uh, regress move away from social life and they might feel a uh, burn out burnt out uh, and in relation to this sense of uh, exhaustion and fatigue uh, children might find themselves inactive in many fields of life and from a cognitive perspective uh, the child might find themselves in constant rumination about the person who has died and they might develop low of self-esteem, they might feel hopeless, and they might fall into negative uh, feelings. And uh, I mean, it has been uh, longer than two years, unfortunately. So we, we were not able to control the pandemic. There were uh, waves of it, and it was continuing for a very long time, which might trigger the sense of uh, hopelessness uh, and uh, all those negative feelings even deeper in children. 
And children, from a cognitive perspective, might find it difficult to remember things. They might have some problems in their memories and in their concentration. Of course, uh, they might also find themselves in a denial. Um, denial emerges as another important cognitive uh, reaction, like that there is no such thing as a pandemic, there has not been any deaths. From a physiological perspective, uh, substance abuse uh, might uh, be visible, loss of appetite and phatic and some somatic complaints which might uh, change depending on the age of the children. So this is a chart that I have prepared on the basis of uh, age periods. So preschool period uh, between ages 2 and 6, we might observe more phobic uh, reactions. Uh, anxiety might uh, forward children to uh, stay close to their parents. And during uh, adolescence, these anxieties might uh, be in different uh, shapes, like an explosion of uh, anger and uh, anxiety. But no matter what happens, we might have a direct uh, impact on their school uh, lives, uh, and they might be uh, unwilling to play games that they used to play. They might uh, want to stay at home and uh, not socialize. And during adolescence, again, uh, strong denial, anger and uh, sadness. And also uh, I, uh, uh, suicidal ideation might come up, like uh, perhaps in the current situation we are in, it's normal that uh, children uh, show such reactions and we have to accept it. How are we going to talk to these children? What are we going to tell them? So the right thing to do is to talk to children in a clear way to set uh, them uh, a role model and uh, we need to explain things uh, as clearly as possible and we need to allow them uh, to share their emotions and feelings with adults and we need to support them to do that. So what can we tell uh, children? Fundamentally speaking, we need to explain them what's going on. Open communication uh, is really helpful for the emotional development of children and all aspects of their emotional well-being will be supported through open communication. Sometimes it might not be easy for you to talk about death, but in the current situation we are in, uh, when we are dealing with uh, concepts of death and uh, physical distance and um, emotional constraints. Of course, we, we, we can just try to choose the right words for children and we need to explain how we ourselves feel and how we can protect ourselves both physically and emotionally. How shall we protect ourselves uh, from an emotional perspective? Well, we need to be able to share our feelings. Uh, first, we should be open. So it's up to parents first uh, to give meaning to their uh, emotions. This is not always easy. Sometimes we might be going through some uh, rather complex uh, emotions and feelings, but we need to be able to focus on ourselves and uh, be able to share that with our uh, children. And uh, sometimes uh, parents tend to hide their emotional feelings if they feel uh, and if they think that they're uh, too strong, so so as not to uh, inf impact uh, children, they tend to hide their feelings. But one thing that we should not forget is that as adults, uh, we can cry and we can feel sad, and uh, these should be normal uh, to our children. So it's crucial that we need to set a good uh, role model for all of them. We can use a uh, paper and pen and we can uh, 
play with uh, papers. We can encourage them to visualize their uh, emotions. But uh, when our children, for example, tell us that they're angry, there might be another underlying reason for their anger. So we need to be uh, able to uh, understand that. So we, we need to support our children. First, we need to support ourselves physically against the virus, but we need to protect ourselves emotionally as well. And how can we do this? Uh, by building an open uh, communication within the family. We, can, uh, we should continue our healthy activities. We should go on socializing. And um, if children uh, have some favorite games and some favorite routines, we need to think and find out ways of adapting those activities into these pandemic times. And we need to allow for differences. If the family has more than one uh, child, then that means uh, we might have different reactions within the same household uh, from one child to another. So uh, we need to accept that this is normal. So that, uh, of course, we, we need uh, to bear in mind that children will behave in a childlike uh, manner. And this is normal. They might not be as careful as we are so we need to be patient and supportive uh, all the time and we need to limit children's exposure to uh, speeches on pandemic and disease and uh, we need to limit their exposure to news and social media and news channels even putting on a mask in our daily lives well this is a constant reminder which is useful perhaps but then we need to have a balance and we can uh, make use of some small daily talks with them so as to update the situation uh, for our children and the supervision of uh, the family is crucial of crucial importance here and what can we do at the school of course uh, in a process of pandemic uh, even if we are not talking about uh, the pandemic and uh, death uh, schools should be able to present our children a safe environment all the time and schools uh, should have a supportive environment preparations uh, for a pandemic uh, and uh, strategies uh, of uh, action and adaptation during the pandemic like online training and what does it really mean to deal with uh, losses or losing our uh, loved ones and what will the stakeholders within the uh, school be doing. So uh, this should uh, be a comprehensive crisis intervention plan uh, which needs to be prepared at uh, schools. And we can support our children directly at schools by talking clearly about the pandemic and about the uh, concept of death. And this should also be uh, delivered by uh, the guidance and psychological counselling. It's very important to uh, try to understand how, what children uh, think and feel. And in order to prevent children to fall into wrong feelings and emotions, we need to clarify all these negative feelings for our children. If uh, there is a death uh, within the family, we should be able to explain this to our children. And we also need to build uh, an environment in which children would feel safe and where children would be able to express their feelings uh, in an independent manner. Well, uh, the, as far as schools are concerned, families need to be informed as well. We need to be able to observe the reactions of children at school. We need to focus on their social relations, their uh, emotional well-being. So the families need to be uh, informed about this. If I think, uh, if we think that children need to have psychological support, the families need to be informed. Of course, when coming together with families, uh, we need to. Uh, Bear in mind that uh, whatever children might have told us, uh, that should stay uh, between the child and ourselves. 
So that means we need to uh, show respect to the privacy of children and uh, we need to be able to teach and inform children and families about potential emotional reactions so that families and parents should know uh, what, how to manage this process with their children during the pandemic and they would have an idea uh, about uh, all these uh, phases. So do's and don'ts, what should we do and what shouldn't we be doing? Uh, listening to them and answering the questions of our children, this is important. We need to be accessible. There might be anxiety, not only in children, but in adults as well. Unfortunately, uh, we all go through uh, anxious periods, like if I come too close with someone, I might get the virus and I might be ill, and we are using masks in our daily lives. But when uh, we are talking about children, they need to be educated uh, in the area of uh, protecting ourselves, and we need to encourage them. Uh, if need be, we need to uh, look for some additional uh, support. You can consult a doctor or a psychologist and a physician. It's important to continue their uh, daily routines. Uh, children should feel that life is going on no matter what happens. And uh, also, uh, we need to make it clear that we are trying to create a new normal. Of course, there will be a need for us to do some things differently. But uh, it's important for children to understand the process so they will be able to adapt to their surroundings. And one thing that we need to bear in mind is that for children to understand that there are some new rules in our lives, we need to uh, just uh, make it clear that there are new ro rules uh, in uh, our lives. Uh, their families, uh, the parents might have been working remotely and uh, this kind of co new communication uh, might have resulted in changes in uh, people's lives. So the clarification of these areas uh, is important for children uh, for and for their emotional uh, well-being. If uh, we think that children uh, are subject to a deep sense of mourning and if we think that uh, our children are exaggerating things, well, we might think like that, but we should not uh, make... We, we should not uh, make it clear to our children and they should not uh, feel uh, that. So it's not uh, proper for uh, us to react like that. Instead, we need to understand that we need to be supporting our children. And ignoring things is also uh, something we should keep away from. We need to acknowledge the challenges and there is a change around us and we need to think how we need to adapt. The, the worst could have happened. Uh, I mean, uh, this will make us stronger. So we need to keep away uh, from com uh, comments which are not tangible and concrete because if we produce such a vague commands, we may not be able to support the emotional well-being of our children. As I have said, uh, usually uh, I think it from the perspective of our mourning, but since we have not been able to anticipate the pandemic, it seems like that even uh, before uh, death occurs, it's important that we need to be able to talk to our children about death, because this is important for all of us, and we need to be able to uh, prepare for this. This is not a talk like everyone will die and uh, we, we are going to die too, but rather uh, we need to be able to explain uh, children what's going on, and we can refer to the news that we are hearing constantly, and we need to ask them questions so as to understand what they think about it. If they keep asking questions about death to us, we should not ignore those questions. And uh, when children open this subject, uh, parents should not uh, ignore it. Uh, that might just deepen their anxiety. And it's important uh, that children should be able to uh, 
ask these questions and we might also uh, ask our children and we need to take their questions uh, seriously. Uh, children ask questions uh, so that uh, they will um, be able to manage their anxiety uh, and they will be able to feel uh, in a more positive uh, way. So it's important to understand the underlying reasons for their anxiety. We need to use a simple language as the case is in our communication with children all the time. What's the amount of information uh, does my child need? Because when we are talking about vaccinations, uh, trying to explain a five-year-old child about the uh, genetic technology behind those vaccinations would not be meaningful for the child. So you need to simplify your language and uh, adapt it to the age level and the comprehensive uh, capability. And uh, we need to take into consideration the personality of the child as well. Of course, when we are uh, sharing some information with uh, children, that information needs to be uh, accurate. Um, we should not uh, tell them things like the deceased person has gone uh, to a travel and uh, he's on a long journey because uh, that might result in uh, the emergence of another strain of anxiety in the child in relation to the concept of uh, travel. Uh, so it, she or he might generalize that anxiety. So we need to explain things uh, clearly and uh, or uh, the verb uh, disease, for example, might not be explanatory uh, to a small child. So we should definitely use the word die if need be so that the child will understand that that person will not uh, be uh, alive from uh, then on. And uh, after school, we need to ask our children like uh, how their days uh, were and uh, what were the activities uh, they had during the day so that you can have some uh, clues as to their emotional uh, condition and uh, support them accordingly. And lastly, we need to explain our children that it's uh, absolutely normal for them to have complicated feelings and especially after uh, death and losing a loved one, it's, uh, again, very normal for uh, human beings to, to feel uh, confused and fall into complicated emotions. And you should also highlight the fact that these challenging times will pass and uh, normal days will come. And uh, let me also dwell on uh, activities in relation to self-care as well. One of the most important things uh, that uh, could be done is uh, continuing with uh, self-care. This is not only valid for the pandemic period or in the case of that only. Uh, continuity of uh, self-care is crucial for our emotional well-being. And as for children, uh, we can read books together with them. We can go on walks in open air. We can watch the clouds. We can do some uh, paintings with them and drawing activities, playing games, dancing, looking at the stars and going to bed uh, early and uh, keeping a diary. So for a good emotional uh, development, uh, these are all very crucial. And one thing I would like to highlight is that, uh, for example, you can just make a list uh, of activities that you will be doing with your child after the pandemic, which would encourage their emotional well-being. It might be a good activity that you can have with them. So I would like to thank you for listening uh, to me. You can uh, send your questions to me if you have any uh, through this email of mine. Thank you and enjoy your day.
hocalarımızı dinlemeye devam ediyoruz. Son değerli hocam. Continue hoca. listening to our professor. Our last uh, professor is with us and now we will have a panel discussion. Well, the students uh, now have an elevated uh, gap in terms of their individual learning differences. From SEV group, we have Ayşe Demel Koçar. Ayşe, welcome. Well, the changing uh, education system and its noticed uh, differences on uh, individual students. Uh, we will listen to your insights. Well, thank you. I want to thank for organizing this conference and also inviting me here. I wish all the best to those who made this happen. Well, I will be talking about the individual uh, differences and the uh, students' learning uh, in light of the pandemic. And let me start with some basics. Well, learning is a process involving the school, student, and the parent. It's like uh, a triangle, and they feed each other, and they are interdependent. So if we neglect any part of it, uh, and if it is or disconnected, we will fail, or we may not reach desired goals. So the pandemic, uh, unfortunately, negatively affected all three arms of this triangle. And so parents, students, and teachers uh, were all influenced by the pandemic, and they had to survive online. This also reshaped our relations with our neighborhood and our daily routine. In this regard, so what is a school and why pandemic impaired our lives? Let us give an answer. The school is not just a place to learn. It's an environment to equip students to exist in life and, and learn um, social and com communication skills. So it's a, it's a place to develop and, and, and enrich. Unfortunately, students were deprived of this environment. Uh, so now we have home office and homeschooling. And all of a sudden, we had to move to homeschooling. And we had to manage this. And we transformed part of our homes to a classroom for our students. It was a learning place for our teachers. It was a teaching place. And the pandemic brought the online education concept to our lives. It is the fastest and easiest way to build communication between the teacher and the student. How about its consequences? To give a few examples, with technology, the academic and social emotional needs of students have changed. Now students have an increased gap. For some students, it was easy to manage, but for others, it was a challenge. Parents needed guidance in, in, in more areas. And the, there were increased expectations from schools. Uh, they were expected to manage all this process smoothly, and the communication need between the student and the teacher increased, and we also needed uh, teacher support. So why we are discussing all these needs? So maybe we should respond to the question, who, who is a teacher? Teaching uh, is a privilege and requires professional qualification to teach online or face-to-face. -face. They can identify individual needs of a student and can respond to it. So the parents uh, are now desperately needing uh, teachers because or teaching skills and they don't have it. And teachers uh, know how to adapt their skills to changing environments. And with the pandemic, 
and with uh, the with online education we had to update revise and manage our ourselves teaching uh, during the pandemic is totally different than the conventional concept it was unprecedented and we teachers we we challenged all the borders to sustain education and keep communicating with our students and the parents. And the parents had to assume partially some of the roles of teachers. And they've been active in many roles on which normally the school and teachers will be more active because it, a teacher provides uh, a knowledge and helps you gain a skill. But teachers also influence social development of the students. So the parents assume some of these roles. So with changing roles and with changing uh, responsibilities and with the changing expectations, the balances in the family life also changed. And with good and those who could build uh, good communication uh, could had you know more efficient uh, learning experience. In addition, during the pandemic, as part of the online training in 2020, 2021, and finally in 22. Uh, we started face-to-face uh, you know, -face education, but uh, is everything uh, evolve uh, or does everything evolve as expected? Well, a lot of changes happened, in, you know, in social uh, aspects, and we our priority was to meet the needs of our students. Uh, we realized that their academic skills. Uh, have changed and there's a huge gap, especially written uh, expression skills, reading, understanding, and expressing oneself. Those skills uh, differ widely across students. They, they lost their uh, ability to focus and concentrate following a screen and or staying you know, connected to the class just by listening has become even more difficult. Impaired communication skills uh, are also visible. Students also have difficulties in following a social code of conduct, especially during class breaks. Students don't know what to do because in online education, they stay on their own, alone, in a, in a room at home. But then back to the school, they are in a crowded room and some children did, couldn't uh, find, figure out what to do. And of course, they have an increased need of physical activities. And after some time with the pandemic, their needs for physical activities have increased. Well, of course, there are, there are reasons you know, why we have experienced all this and why things were not as they were in the past. First of all, the physical environment. You know, there were uh, conditions that we could you know, have at home or not. And and they all affected, uh, you know, the social and emotional development of students and technological equipment and infrastructure support. You know, in private schools, problems were addressed in short time. Uh, given uh, the average conditions of uh, Turkish households, not every student had proper means to join online classes, and that caused gap in terms of access to skills technological technological skills for parents students and also for teachers it was you know uh, a challenge you know some of us are more digitally literate and could 
plan their uh, classes and they could move faster. But a lot of teachers lacked such literacy and also parents were not uh, dig digital literate enough and so forth. For them, it was not easy at all. Duration to focus have decreased. It wasn't even enough in a regular classroom. And, and for many students, it caused in the pandemic increased attention deficits. And the responsibility, sense of responsibility also decreased. Now it's one of our priorities as a teacher, that uh, distant learning and just connecting to a class uh, did, did not, you know, help students to improve their sense of responsibilities because students were only connected to their classes digitally. And, and although their parents were very supportive, the responsibility was mostly on the student, you know, joining the class on time, leaving the camera on, following up the homeworks, and they were all the students' responsibility. Materials were not uh, enough. Some private schools and some fortunate government schools uh, had an easier time, but uh, on, a, on, an on an average, that was a huge deficiency. So the school-parent collaboration is always important, but then with the pandemic, you know, uh, guiding the development of students, uh, we focused a lot in terms of communicating with parents. Connecting to the teacher is more difficult for the student digitally. It's a huge challenge, you know, to emotionally connect to your teacher on the screen and feeling sense of belonging was not easy either. You know, normally in the class, uh, you know, uh, the, the teachers go and uh, put a tap on the shoulder and it's not easy, you know, the sense of belonging was not easy at all. You know, being open to in, in, uh, innovation and changes, you know, although we are at home, we use technology and use online training or e-learning. Uh, things have changed. You know, we had a lot of changes overnight. We tried to maintain our uh, education and we tried to adapt. As we also tried to encourage our parents and students to adapt themselves. But then it is the age of innovation and we have to develop the skill. You know, we assume that uh, e-learning was the solution. And our schools, we invested in technical infrastructure. But is technology at the true solution? Was it effective enough as most assume? You know, a lot of things have changed in education. But it's not in terms of using technology, but it's mostly in communication and socializing. Because that, the, the need to socialize has increased. Use of technology was an option before the pandemic. But now it has become a necessity, a purpose. Using technology has become the goal. Today, you know, we still have that confusion when using technology. And we, we have to decide, is it the purpose or a tool to learn? You know, Ellen November said, when adjusted and used for, for the purpose, we will be using more technology, not less. And he is right, because considering the time we have spent with our students, using technology is like cooking. You know, uh, it's not the amount, you know, it's not putting too many 
herbs in, uh, in, in in your meal. You have to be selective and you have to adjust the amount to give the best taste. Just like the technology, we need to decide when, where, and how to use technology. During the pandemic, we could not help but to use technology at all times. And as we gradually return to face-to-face -face education, it is the time to ask when and how. So we are, we've been using technology. How, uh, didn't we have any benefits? Let me compare. Of course, there are benefits and also uh, damages or pros and let's say pros and cons. The pros, quick com communication and the the content has in enriched uh, more interaction, more attractive presentations, uh, group work, breakout sessions, education has be, has that no borders, and timeless feedback uh, time increased, and uh, faster and more feedback could be given. So these are the benefits of technology. But. But then we need to continue have reaping these benefits. We shouldn't be just forgetting them after the pandemic. We need to make sure that we use technology in a meaningful way. How about the cons? Like communication was confined to a screen. Mostly verbal communication and written communication was used. We were away from physical material, mostly audiovisual uh, resources were consumed. And unfortunately, after some time, it ha has become less attractive. And for junior classes, it is important to use physical objects for their development. Unfortunately, we had a drawback. You know, audiovisual interaction uh, deprived us from some other aspects like writing skills. Because a lot of students uh, typed in, but they might write with, with, a, with a pen. Although the students have their notebooks, and, you know, putting that on the screen is not enough. It wasn't as good as it was in a classroom. And especially at home, you know, students who could not uh, complete their physical education or students who could not, you know, do their homework and join the class on time had challenges as well and they could not progress well. When compared with, uh, and, and, and, the, and the classes were limited to similar content because the means of technology were limited to age and level. And students, because of repetitive exposure to, say, to similar content, they lost their focus. So in light of all these pros and cons, what is next? How are we going to steer our future? With, in this semester, we are we have face-to-face -face education. How are we going to combine uh, the pros and cons? And we are now talking about a, a differentiated learning or individualized learning. Well, in the world, it has been implemented for a long time, and also in our country, we have a history. But the, but the pandemic reminded us of its importance. Education is best achieved during a medium, you know, difficult level. Shouldn't be too easy, shouldn't be too difficult. But the pandemic, made things easier for some students, but made it very difficult for some others. 
altta kalan ve üstte kalan yani zorluk derecesinin altında ve üstünde kalan. So for those who do not fall into the medium challenge level, uh, their learning gap has increased. The pandemic has changed the way we give training, its format and everything. But then the purpose of learning has never changes. Our goal is to accompany our students in their quest to learn. And we, we offer them a relevant and uh, meaningful environment. So when we are back uh, to face to face, now we can create better learning environments for them, the most enriched environments so that we can you know, eliminate the gaps we have experienced during the pandemic because differentiated education is not just a strategy, but it is a way of thinking covering everything. So if, if a teacher has, has this approach, then she will she will not let any student behind and will will will will do the, her best how about you know online and versus face to face is it like black or white well, i don't think so because in the future uh, the, the future of education will be shaped as followed you know our students now learn more, but they understand less. Use of technology in education is not new, but it has a new way of usage. So we cannot say we, are, we, we won't use technology anymore because education cannot be confined with just the walls. It has, it has a, a more holistic process and individualized education enables, you know, borderless, limitless and timeless education. And at this level, you know, there are differences among individual students. We need to align it and we need to define, a, you know, a holistic pathway so that their learning experience becomes more relevant. How about the future of uh, the learning? You know, we, we said, you know, we cannot separate online and offline training. It's, it's going to be together. Our, our students should not be just uh, in the walls of the schools, but before and after their class. They can repeat what they learn in the class. And also during the class with their you know, individualized differentiated learning experience, they can act freely. They won't depend on the teacher. And by using technology, they can also you know, increase their learning experience. Future of learning will depend heavily on the technology skills. That requires teachers to, to develop uh, such skills as well. Integrating technology to the classes, also uh, a planning skill, because it's not just knowing what to do, but also implement it, implementing them and integrating them. They are even more valuable because we can only prove that we understand it as soon as we implement what we know. So as teachers, we need to be more creative and plan our classes uh, to you know, maximize students' attention. We need to understand individual differences and use methodologies to address such differences. Be flexible and be adaptive just as we expect these things from our students. We 
and all of them, all of these mentioned above, will help sust building sustainable learning experience. Well, of course, technology is, a, is an enabler. But then we have two important questions. One of them, which technology should be choose? The other question is, which one of them will increase the efficiency or the productivity of our students? I think the second question is more key, increasing productivity of our students. Carol Ann Tomlinson says, and I, and I love this, she says, this could be your 15th year of your uh, profession, but this is the first and only year of your second grade student. I mean, you can change these numbers, but the message is clear. For our students, this is the first and only experience. Our duty is to make this more enjoyable and more productive for them. It's our professional responsibility. So for our students and for our teachers, we need a differentiated education. And that will remedy all the, uh, all the damages of the pandemic because differentiated education will Im improve uh, sense of belonging, responsibility, acceptance, respect, empathy, perspective, collaboration. That's all I have to say. I hope that with the pandemic, you know, these, and, uh, I hope my presentation helps managing the gap in students' learning. Well, our teachers are so valuable. We cannot repay you. We cannot pay you back. Thank you very much, Aicha, for joining us. It was a beautiful presentation. Now we are approaching to the end, and we have a panel discussion from Akdeniz University, a Faculty of Literature, Psychology Department. Uh, Ece Varlık Öztöy will manage the panel she will share her experiences but then she will be joined by four mothers soon we will be back with the panel
Herkese merhabalar. Well, hello everyone. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to welcome you all to our conference organized by Sabri Ülker uh, Foundation. This is a special panel uh, we are uh, organizing and we would like to extend our thanks for such a conference. Uh, and our thanks goes to the technical team and to the foundation and the organization committee. Let me introduce myself. I work at Akdeniz University, Dr. Ece Varlık Öztoy. I'm working at the Department of Clinical Psychology and this will be a very special uh, panel uh, and I will be moderating. Şöyle, e, bugün başlayan ve e, bugün içerisinde izlediğimiz bütün e, sunumlarda... And all the presentations that we uh, listened today, as you have seen, we have listened to some valuable participants and experts uh, working in their respective fields. Now we will be handing over to uh, our uh, experts and they will uh, share what they have gone through uh, during the process. So this will be a very uh, fruitful panel and I, we would like to extend our thanks to all our participants well, since uh, the morning, uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the program, everything was uh, dealt with in a very apt manner and in a very informative manner. Of course, we will uh, try to uh, discuss what will happen from now on, which uh, to a certain extent our speakers did. And so I would like to... Uh, have the introduction from our, our parents, our mothers. So please introduce yourself and your child. Well, thank you very much and uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Irem Yilmaz. Uh, I, I, I, have a, I'm, I have graduated from Akdeniz University uh, and I'm a science teacher at a special uh, school in Antalya. I have a daughter and both my pregnancy uh, and uh, with a newly born baby, I had to deal with this uh, pandemic process. Both as a mother uh, and uh, as uh, an academician, you were able to uh, go through this process. So thank you. Leyla Hanım. Hello, uh, I am Leila Goldfinger. Uh, I am from uh, America, United States of America. Uh, I work in Pennsylvania. And I work with uh, teachers. Before Pennsylvania, I worked at Los Angeles and uh, most of the pandemic uh, was spent there. So I have uh, a child. Uh, four and a half years old uh, so you are both uh, a working mother and Turkan Hanım yes Turkan Turan Güven I'm a, I have graduated from Ankara University uh, in the preschool uh, education department I'm a PhD student uh, and in Ankara, uh, I'm also a private uh, school um, mistress uh, and I have two daughters. So Türkan Hanım is also a working mother and also uh, an academician uh, and de dealing with her profession. So motherhood is, as you know, uh, an endless uh, profession for all of us. Well, hello everyone. I'm a graduate of Bilkent University, Department of Archaeology, and then I have uh, completed my supervision and psychological and pedagogy uh, training, uh, and I work at TED Ankara. Bir 12 yaşında, bir 16 yaşında, biri ön ergenlikte, biri ergenlikte, iki kız çocuğuyla beraberim. Çok güzel. Nazan'ın da geçmişinde bir öğretmenlik var. Ne oldu? Uzmanlıkları var. So she's not working actively at the moment. And uh, so the common point for all of mothers is that uh, they are working mothers and some of them are, are academicians and they have a motherhood. Uh, 
And uh, from our mothers and uh, from ourselves, what we expect from our panelists is to discuss uh, their uh, difficulties and challenges and see uh, what kind of results uh, they have had in their endeavors to uh, make this process easier for their children. So thank you very much for all the information you have given about yourselves. So during this panel, uh, we will be discussing uh, around issues like uh, mother's habits and nutrition. So we are talking about routine uh, issues uh, and uh, psychology and physiology. So all of these are uh, totality. And we would like to see what has happened during this process. Irem Hanım, so the COVID-19 uh, process, what things has it changed for you and for your family? Well, first of all, nothing much has changed uh, for a small baby, for my small baby. She was born into the pandemic. Her living conditions were normal, but especially um, I was affected uh, from this process. And... Uh, staying alone and I had uh, hesitations um, related, I mean, in, in terms of going out when I was pregnant uh, because uh, I was not uh, deemed uh, healthy and uh, uh, I could see my husband only a day after the birth. These were difficult uh, things for me. But all in all, uh, generally, uh, grandmothers and grandfathers uh, played an important role uh, in our lives when the baby was born. But then uh, they could not visit uh, us. They could not see their grandchildren because they could not uh, help. Well, I have a brother living abroad. Uh, my daughter is one and a half years old. So his university doesn't allow him to go uh, abroad and to visit another country. So these are uh, difficult situations and the challenges we had uh, throughout the process. So uh, we un un understand your uh, level of anxiety uh, and for a pregnant woman, this is really uh, very uh, challenging. So you are uh, absolutely right in than the things you have said. So during this pandemic process, what has changed in their routines, in their nutrition? Were there some changes? Well, during the first six months, uh, the baby is fed on uh, mother's milk. So uh, we didn't feel it much. And uh, we were uh, not consuming packaged uh, food. So I'm not, uh, I was not able to visit supermarkets very often. I was uh, able to start working when it was only a prude. Perhaps he was thinking that the whole world was only uh, comprised of those people she has seen uh, in the household. We were a bit concerned about uh, vitamin D because she was not out and we increased the dosages of our supplements. From a developmental perspective, uh, I understand that this, this was a critical period during which the mother and the baby are expected to stay together. So the pandemic from that perspective uh, has been positive for you. And from this perspective, um, it is uh, positive uh, in one term, but also uh, we are dealing with a lack of stimulants that should come uh, from abroad. And uh, as you have voiced, there might have been some issues related to those areas because the baby was only seeing you around herself and nobody else. Are there any examples you can give about this? Well, I returned school when my daughter was 10 months old. And during this process, uh, my, her grandmother uh, started taking care of uh, him, her. So it's very important for babies to see people around. My daughter is 16 months old, but she's walking. Uh, she's learning to walk uh, only quite recently because she had limited space uh, outside. 
And I don't think that her muscles had the opportunity to develop in this kind of environment, be it uh, the sleep order or nutrition. Uh, we were very regular during the pandemic and during the lockdowns. Uh, we did not have any problems in relation to our routines. Yes, as you have said, perhaps the greatest problem occurred in the area of physical activities. But although uh, at, at that age, as a small baby, these are not things considered very important, still uh, you had limited means of going out and spending uh, time with your baby under the sun. Well, another issue I'd like to mention is that whether this is very important uh, as far as uh, screen uh, usage is concerned. So we are not uh, in, uh, encouraging parents to expose their children to digital screens uh, for long periods of time because this is a very serious developmental process. And when children are confronted with too much screen, uh, you may come up with unwanted uh, results. So what, what, what's your experience in relation to this relation with the screens? Well, we tried to do it the best, but I had online trainings uh, and online education because of my profession. So I was spending time in front of the monitor all the time. And uh, she, in a way, witnessed this process, and we were not able to isolate her completely from uh, that environment. And since we were not able to receive support from our uh, mothers and fathers and family members, we were alone. I've tried very hard to limit things, but uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, even if she was exposed to the screen, uh, I tried to use it uh, for educational purposes, like for listening to music, uh, for example. Well, yes, uh, we understand that you were uh, do, trying to do your best in this uh, area. So we have too many issues in relation to this. So together with the stress uh, and with uh, these issues, uh, we were uh, having a troubled time in uh, engaging our children uh, at home. So all in all, uh, looking uh, generally, so there were not much changes in our nutritional habits. This is what you said, because you were uh, regularly with her and you were able to uh, control what she ate and at what time. So do you uh, feel yourself sufficient when uh, a similar uh, context comes up again based on your experience? So first of all, uh, I criticize myself uh, very often and very severely. Once, if, if we will be in a similar situation again, I think I will be more comfortable and I would not be that anxious because uh, since I had limitations of uh, physical activity during my pregnancy, I found it uh, very difficult to uh, deal with this issue because uh, I was confronted with a lack of physical environment and physical movement uh, because uh, of staying at home. So things were not as uh, good as we wanted uh, it to be. So uh, from a personal perspective, I think that we I can manage such a similar process much better if that happens again. So children are in need of uh, clean air and uh, many other issues. Uh, so it's our responsibility to uh, try to help our students and uh, children in that manner. So secondly speaking, uh, we are moving to Leila Hanum. So when we look at ages uh, of our participants, we have uh, three pregnancy uh, processes and experiences. So Leila Hanım, uh, what can you tell us? What things did COVID-19 change on your side? Perhaps you could offer us a different perspective. Yes, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, in 2020, in March, our school was closed down with a sudden decision. We were not uh, prepared for this, both emotionally and uh, mentally. So uh, as a school uh, manager, uh, I had to uh, make a quick decision. Uh, I needed to protect the well-being of our teachers as well as our students. So that was a dual task. 
So as a mother, uh, I had to go through uh, numerous changes as well. Since my child is uh, a student and goes to school, I already knew that routines are very important for them. So I've tried to imitate the school environment and its routines within our household. Uh, I've turned uh, our uh, living room into a classroom environment uh, for uh, state. I've, I've installed uh, signs and mathematic uh, stations and uh, classroom facilities as much as I could, of course. And uh, I came up with a schedule for my child, uh, very much like the school programs we have. Uh, but then uh, she doesn't know how to read and write at the moment. Uh, so she could uh, use that schedule. So this was very helpful because uh, she was not in need of an adult person uh, next to him. So this was the uh, positive uh, aspect of the pandemic for us. And uh, both for us and for Doruk, it was a great change not being able to communicate with his friends and not being able to come together with them. And I've tried very hard to participate in his activities and that created a sort of context and environment in which we could discuss the issue of the pandemic. We have used sanitizers and put on masks and uh, rehearsed some daily tasks. Since we were using dolls as uh, puppets and uh, models, uh, we were also playing games, but then that normalized the situation uh, significantly. So since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Doruk will be celebrating his third birthday. So it, his birthday is in uh, April and she, he was very sorry because he was not able to uh, celebrate his birthday uh, with his friends. So uh, we wanted to make him happy and uh, we bought our cake and uh, his friends came up to the front yard uh, with uh, placades and gifts for him and he really felt happy. So uh, many of uh, his uh, relatives are in, in Turkey. So since uh, he got used to using Zoom, uh, we uh, made use of the Zoom platform to come together with our relative members and he really liked this. So the pandemic, uh, what, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that had both positive and negative uh, impacts. It, it, on our side, it was not like we were uh, dissatisfied with the pandemic and we were cursing all the time. Uh, we were trying to find the good in this period. So these were the biggest changes on our side. Well, thank you. Well, actually, as Leila Hanum has uh, told us, if I cannot go to school, the school can come to us. So for this to happen, you, you uh, have used your own professional skills and information. Creating these kinds of routines is very important. Uh, I mean, we will talk about uh, these kinds of regulations. Crises and pandemics will uh, be part of our lives in the future, and we are responsible for being able to organize our lives. And this is a really uh, challenging process. So Leila Hanum's example was a very, a very apt one in terms of preparing a suitable environment for our children in which they would be able to manage their own routines. Of course, being able to present and create uh, such an environment within the house is very valuable, but perhaps the greatest challenge for our children is the fact that they were not able to communicate with their peers during the pandemic. And this is exactly the period uh, during which children learn to play with their peers. Uh, and um, despite the fact that you are a professional teacher and as a mother, you have used your professional expertise and knowledge for your child, it seems you have still had some problems and issues. Yes. So you, you've said that you have uh, tried to protect your routines, but were there any changes in terms of nutrition and diet? Well, we haven't had a great change in terms of nutrition. Of course, from time to time, we might have uh, overdone in, in eating uh, sweet uh, foods. 
and sugar consumption might have increased, but then uh, not, no major changes have occurred. Well, uh, they are they've returned uh, to school, uh, so we can just continue with our uh, programs. And lastly, another thing I'd like to ask you is, sorry for interrupting. I mean, uh, it's also the uh, preschool period, uh, as you have said. Did you have any problems in relation to this? Because children have uh, limited attention spans, but uh, the parents have um, expectations which are, uh, are higher. So Doruk used to get up at 9, at 9 a.m. in the morning and uh, he had to sit in front of the screen and go on with his classes. And this was very challenging for him. And I don't think that this was uh, a just uh, thing to do. And uh, of course, um, he felt uh, sad for not being able to come together with his teachers and uh, hug them and come play with uh, their friends. Uh, one solution that was rolled out by teachers was that they have organized some social gatherings and started on a one-to-one -one communication with their uh, students. So interaction was very limited indeed. So I think that such experiences have been observed all around the world. Thank you very much. So she has uh, two children and uh, her experiences are uh, very valuable for us. So how did COVID-19 affect you? When we first uh, when we first heard the quarantine news, we said we were very much uh, relieved. So four people are uh, at home. Uh, this was uh, what we have gone through, and we have decided to enjoy ourselves. What have we done? Uh, uh, like everyone else, we found ourselves in the kitchen. The girls liked to spend time in the kitchen. Uh, and the, the kitchen for us was uh, an area of experimentation and uh, socializing. Uh, as Leila Hanım has said we have adapted our school. We had uh, built a tent in the balcony and uh, we had a sandbox. Uh, we wanted them to go on playing. So we played a lot. It was a quarantine uh, which during which we enjoyed very much. So from my personal perspective, at least for us, the positive sides were uh, much uh, more. So in your household, uh, your experience was a bit more different. Of course, it's very important not to have financial uh, problems because during this process, unfortunately, many people uh, have had uh, serious problems especially uh, uh, in relation to uh, these uh, sensitive uh, groups. So uh, the fact that your experience is more on the positive side is uh, something very positive. So Turkan Hanım's luck is perhaps stems from the fact that you have two children, which means they could interact with each other. What would you say? Uh, they are siblings uh, who liked one another very much, and it was during this process that they've increased their uh, closeness. So they've always found something to do together. And another chance was that uh, I was a preschool teacher 
and my children were preschool uh, children during that age. If we had an adolescent or a young adult child at home, I might not have known what to do and uh, things would have been more difficult for me, perhaps. Well, thank you. So you were able to make use of your expertise. Uh, one of your children goes to the first grade when uh, the children are learning how to read and write and uh, proper communication with their peers. What did you do during this uh, period? In my doctoral dissertation, I'm working on the areas of forest areas uh, and uh, I did not agree uh, that uh, children could learn things from a monitor, so we did not uh, follow these uh, live courses. If they were uh, to learn things about nature, we brought some natural things and we placed uh, objects around the house. Perhaps this was a risk which could not be uh, overtaken by everyone, uh, like uh, if they would be able to uh, learn how to read and write. Uh, sometimes I'm still concerned, but I believed in this process. Uh, I have a daughter, uh, one in the third grade and the younger in the first grade. And if, uh, well, I sometimes observe my uh, elder daughter, and I don't observe any uh, lags, any uh, areas where she uh, is uh, incompetent, so she can very much compete, uh, catch up with her peers at school. So being a preschool teacher, that was uh, your uh, luck. And another thing I wonder is, uh, as of this critical period, uh, this uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, they might have had some, uh, issues and anxieties. How did you deal with the anxieties of your uh, children? Because uh, our anxiety levels uh, have increased uh, tremendously along with uh, our children. They learn from us. So what did you do in these areas? Uh, were, was there a heightened level of anxiety? Well, uh, we had a number of uh, variable factors uh, which affected our anxiety. The family's perspective to life and their level of resilience. So in every household, we had a different uh, process, I guess. So, uh, we, we opted for not going into a panic uh, immediately. So we see this in children uh, quite very often. And for example, at schools, uh, when we first started, uh, we uh, were concerned and uh, we also uh, loaded our children with uh, some sort of fear. And when one of their uh, friends got uh, COVID, the first question they asked was, uh, is he going to die? And I got COVID and the same question was asked to me by uh, my uh, children. So, uh, and then uh, our perception has evolved into a much less frightening vision. So, uh, well, we don't want you to get uh, the virus, but if that, that happens, it's not something mortal. Uh, and uh, so it, as adults uh, relaxed a bit, the children were uh, also more relaxed. So instead of ignoring what was going on uh, around ourselves, we uh, just need to be open. And uh, because children are very much observant about the uh, reactions of their uh, mothers uh, and fathers. So this really creates a sort of uh, obscurity. It's very valuable for children to uh, have positive uh, modes of behavior uh, from their parents' uh, side. And we are still going uh, through this process. And one of them is the fear of dying and the fear of infecting uh, others, like uh, infecting grandfathers and grandmothers. 
So uh, this creates a great uh, sense of fear. And when uh, this fear is uh, in the maximum, like uh, anxiety disorders, uh, we might have a different uh, issue. So in such uh, cases, we should be alert to the fact that such situations can uh, go on and such crises might happen. Uh, we need to be able to uh, help our students. And if need be, we should be open uh, for receiving support. And families need to be able to read uh, support signals from society very well. In order for us to know more about what the psychological disorder really means, the distortion and distraction of daily routines might help us uh, as an indicator because uh, when uh, people see that uh, the routines in their children's lives start changing, they should be uh, careful. And lastly, as Turkenanum has uh, just said, uh, because uh, she's working as a educator as well. So schools need to have a responsibility as well. Uh, like, uh, I mean, could they deal with it more? Because it was very sudden and we didn't know uh, what we would be doing. And Corona was always related with uh, death. Now we tell them that it could be a, a mild process. So we have different discourses and we said different things to our children. So what can you tell us as a, a professional? So we need flexibility and we should be open for new things. After the pandemic, we have created a forest day. So every two days a week, we spend time in the forest. And when we went to the forest, we uh, have seen uh, children who could not touch the trees and the soil because they were uh, very much concerned about getting the virus. Hans, um, so the schools uh, really need um, great uh, responsibility. They need to take uh, responsibility in these areas. Yes, exactly. You, this is a very good example indeed. Uh, being in contact with nature and using your um, senses without using uh, your uh, sensory uh, input, we try to educate uh, our students, but then every child has a different learning uh, process, going out, touching, uh, smelling. So these are very important uh, things. And it creates, um, a positive environment. Thank you. Anything you would like to add? I think we really had a good uh, time. So if we had another pandemic, I would have a bigger tent in the balcony. I would uh, just urge them to go out more. I mean, I, when I say going out, I mean nature. I are uh, considering social distance as well. Nazanam, let's move on to you. So you have two daughters. Yes. So what is your experience uh, from a different perspective? I think I was a lucky mother as well. Uh, and COVID-19 did not affect our household. Of course, many things have changed. We were uh, very concerned in the beginning and we didn't know what we were going through. And uh, we were able to turn that into an advantage. Since uh, one of my daughters, uh, well, one of them is an adolescent and the other is a pre-adolescent. So suddenly they were left without friends and they could not communicate with them. That was a problem for us. They uh, lacked behind uh, social life. So that was difficult for us. 
but they've learned how to uh, create solutions, how to create alternatives, and they've found out a way, they find a way out, and, and things were not that difficult for them. So you have a pre-adolescent and an adolescent in your house, you two children, and they have uh, different developmental needs, especially in adolescents. We are talking about a speedy developmental uh, process, and this is the time when they are in need of friends uh, most of the time. So in order for that kind of uh, affinity and closeness with their friends, what did you do? Well, the solution we tried to create was that uh, children adapted to digital environments very quickly. So uh, they played, you know, uh, and a silent movie um, with their friends on Zoom. They came together on Zoom applications. They uh, played games and uh, did drawings. So we had new hobbies. So with my younger daughter, uh, I've started to making and uh, producing ceramics, which was a hobby uh, we uh, acquired during the pandemic. So this is how we have tried to fill in the gaps. And for my uh, elder daughter, so they were able to come together on these digital platforms and the time they spent was quality time, productive, uh, drawing, playing games and so on. So I think that was useful and beneficial. So you, you're telling us that uh, you have created new habits uh, and new modes of learning and interaction. Yes, of course, that was uh, another advantage for us. I was able to concentrate on my children and on the process itself, which made things easier for us and as a family. Well, during this period, uh, they are using screens in a much more effective manner. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, our adolescents also had problems in regarding this issue. So what kind of measures were taken in your household so as not to spend too much time in front of the screens? Well, actually, um, uh, students, uh, but that has turned into a sort of uh, advantage. They didn't want to spend too much time in front of the monitor because they were fed up with them but because of the classes which were being held online. So once their online activities were over or a course on online was over, they just uh, closed the screen and went out immediately. And students, uh, children usually uh, spend time in the kitchen, for example, which was uh, something good. And they were really uh, rather bored by the screens. Let me share an anecdote with you. Uh, it was my younger uh, daughter. Uh, so uh, she she she was just. When she was talking to me uh, personally, she said, "For a moment, I thought I forgot to turn on my volume." So that was very interesting for this period, indeed. Uh, uh, experts told us that children should not uh, stay in front of the screen too much. So for some families, as you have said, uh, this was a challenge for uh, and that was the reason why uh, they've opted for uh, screens. But in many uh, schools, students uh, continue to uh, work with uh, screens. So uh, that was, uh, I mean, you, you, that, that makes you a lucky mother indeed. And another point I'd like to uh, highlight is that social isolation and social distancing uh, was a word uh, that we used uh, very often. So this message was uh, interpreted wrongly by some because this was not a message not to socialize, but uh, we needed to change the mode of socializing. 
So you said your children and their friends could come together on digital platforms. Were you able to offer them uh, an opportunity to go out uh, and spend some time in nature, for example? Yes, uh, during the normalization period, uh, I've really encouraged my friends and other children to spend more time uh, in, in parks and in, in nature. Uh, and for the first time, uh, they've looked around themselves. Look, they've looked at the sky. It was not only the shopping malls uh, any longer. Uh, and in Ankara, we do not have much uh, parks, but uh, actually, um, children have learned to use the public spaces because uh, everyone started having small picnics uh, in these parks by grabbing their coffees and teas. And so that was a very good thing to observe. And the, despite the fact that the pandemic was going on, uh, and um, despite the fact that we do not have any uh, limitations and lockdowns, they still opt for uh, parks, you know, and they don't want to stay indoors. So that was a sustainable change in habit. Yes, I think this is very good indeed. So our children used to uh, ask us to go to the shopping malls all the time, but now they opt for nature and they like it better. Uh, if you really uh, want to manage your stress and decrease your levels of stress, as we always uh, tell one another, the nature is the best place. We know that our brain, uh, the plasticity of our brains uh, is uh, in constant uh, development and we have the capacity to change it. How do we have it? By making use of all parts of our brains. And it's very important to uh, manage our uh, reactions and emotions. Now, uh, another question I would like to ask to you, Nasanam, is that during the pandemic, nutrition habits might change and we may find a uh, different diet uh, and staying in front of the screen all the time. Uh, it might cause uh, problems uh, in our uh, bodies. And it's posture uh, disorders and obesity. And uh, due to the stress, we found ourselves in the kitchen so uh, along with all these problems, uh, eating disorder is another problem. So with two uh, adolescents, how were you able to uh, organize uh, this? So before the pandemic, we had a very uh, orderly uh, nutrition. So they uh, had a regular uh, nutrition. But uh, during the pandemic, uh, they were bored and they were sitting all the time. And they were constantly asking me, mother, what am I going to eat? What's there for food? And and I don't, uh, I didn't think that that came from uh, hunger. This is emotional hunger. I, they were not children who felt hungry um, in those short intervals. So I knew that that was something emotional. And what I was trying to do is that uh, I've tried to encourage them to consume healthy uh, foods. So uh, this is all about finding uh, healthy re recipes. We uh, had kitchen sessions to cook the together and we encouraged our children to uh, have a healthy diet. But despite all this, my younger daughter uh, has put on some weight. She has a small belly. Uh, we named it as the COVID uh, belly. But now things are uh, normal now. And uh, with my elder daughter, who is 16 years old, now everyone is eating and we are uh, prone to putting on weight. And I told her, let's uh, turn this into an advantage. Let's uh, eat healthily. And because when you go back to school, uh, some uh, others will put, have put on weight, but then you will be slim. So I motivated her in this manner and we've started doing sports at home. So we have seen that uh, we, we could do sports at home. 
this is not something we normally think, but actually it's an option to do your sports at home, which was a positive uh, impact for all of us. So we uh, do sports at home all together. Thank you. So that was a new contribution. Uh, very good. So you were able to make it part of your uh, lives, which is very good indeed. So increase in obesity and eating disorders. So as um, you have said, the, um, all the points you have made uh, are important issues in relation to adolescence as well. So looking uh, from a general perspective, of course, uh, many people had uh, challenging times and many people uh, are not happy for the weight they've put on, especially adolescents, for uh, it's not something they want for their self-image. Uh, and another thing is that uh, uh, it's the snacks. Uh, so omitting the word uh, snacks is uh, very important. So this is all uh, a, a sum uh, as a whole. Hence, how will our uh, meal times be organized? Most of the time, and uh, they need to know things uh, and learn how to eat healthily. And they need they are uh, they are in need of good role models. So uh, this is both a kind of activity and a learning process for them. So uh, it seems Nas Hanım was able to do that. Nas Hanım, do your children cook? Well, my younger daughter cooks and she really likes it. And it's now a habit. So it, it's sustainable. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. So, Nas Hanım, uh, what kind of a process do you envisage if you come up with something similar? Yes, I feel confident and I was lucky. My children were lucky. And, and then we have eliminated, you know, the you know factor of uncertainty and anxiety. In the beginning, we didn't know what to do. Now we are more aware and more educated. I believe it will be easier. Yeah, familiarity and, you know, reduced uncertainty make things more manageable. Thank you. Thank you for all you said. Yeah, but without asking your last uh, words, I want to just wrap up. Well, our mothers, our panelists, they have combined their professions with motherhood and they found they found out creative solutions to manage the process in a more positive way but then there is another side of the coin when people have the most negative households but then maybe you can be role models for other families you know, uh, being part of this process and that, uh, you know, if people can exercise at home and quality time in the kitchen and they are all good examples. Thank you for sharing. And then I want to emphasize that mothers should be a role model at all times. So what do the mothers or parents do to, you know, manage their own stress? Do they invest in themselves? So it's, you know, that self-regulation is important. Uh, and screen, you know, uh, being a slacker and dependent, uh, you know, a lot of uh, companies limited that. But then we see that, you know, early childhood and 
you know, people are, you know, they are now more addicted. And we have to, you know, limit and we have to put limitations. And we need to share why we are putting these limitations. You know, we need to plan uh, how long they will uh, stay. And and all those, you know, the limiting skin times depends on the age as well. And the trust and confidence, if, if the children feel safe, they can manage their problems better. And pandemic is a time where we feel that, you know, unreliability and and or unsafe and if, if if children don't feel safe at home it's not good so we need to teach them what is the safety can we control it or not and during the pandemic there is hygiene you know uh, distance and mask but then protecting ourselves and increasing our Immunity are also important, and mother and parents should be always accessible, respond to questions, and understand and listen and inform. Because if children are not informed from parents or the school, they may have bad examples. And of course, I must say that, as Hilal said me previously. Mental uh, health literacy is crucial. What should we do to protect our mental health? How do we understand if our mental health is disturbed? We need to invest in ourselves. And as Turkan said, we need to be resilient. These are all very important. And there are a number of studies. So how can we handle such challenges and when we learn how to handle a problem it improves our immunity for the next challenge just like you said if i see a similar something something similar next time i know what to do so i think what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is right and then um we are learning new habits and uh, mothers, you know, also help their children to acquire new skills. And that should be sustainable. And that is not only limited with the parents and the family. You're talking about an extended platform, the school, society, all stakeholders are involved. And public health. Policies are important for sustainability as well. With that... Uh, and also adding that uh, our brain constantly changes and uh, re is reshaped. With that, I want to close this panel and I want to give you one last word. Iram, what is your last remark? I become a mother. I learned how to be a mother. It wasn't easy, but being a mother means being strong. Thank you. Leila. I learned one thing from uh, foreign mothers. You know, in a society, this may sound selfish, but in, in, in this country, families attend themselves. Like in, a, in, a, in an airplane, you first wear your mask. So first we need to attend to ourselves so that we can attend better to our children. Great messages. Thank you, Turkan. When I was an undergraduate student, a, a great professor said, we cannot protect our, our children from life. And that is true. We cannot protect uh, our children from the life itself. And we cannot prepare them or equip them for any and every condition, but we can only train them. That is true for my daughters. For that, That's my motto for the past 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, Turkan. Naz, it was a challenging process 
and I think uh, our common goal was the well-being of our children because you want to raise them as healthy individuals. I listened to Hünkar as well. Education is key. And to do that, we need to be trained so that we can communicate all these things to our children. So that is, and, and I'm so happy for the opportunity to discuss this here together. Thank you very much for your remarks. I want to thank you for joining us. I also want to thank the foundation for the invitation. With that, I give the floor back to Semiha. Thank you, Ece. I hope we this won't happen again, and, and I believe there is a light out uh, in, at the end of the tunnel. Let's stay strong. There is always a way out. Thank you. This concludes our conference. I want to thank everyone for staying online with us throughout this conference. I want to thank Sabri Uka Foundation and uh, our eminent professors and distinguished uh, participants together with the members of the press. Thank you so much for everyone who make it for, for making this happen. Enjoy your day, enjoy your evening, stay safe, healthy, and happy.